Step into the ring. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the final week of EGFC Season 2, Week 8. We have Mississippi State going up against Georgetown University in our first match of the day. We are going to be bringing you the game between Apparatus and Georgie in just a second. First, we got to introduce ourselves. I, as usual, am Matthew Toxic Gerbil Merrick, and I'm joined today by Soy Soros. How's it going, everyone? <laughs> we have got a good game. Apparatus, I believe, a Rob player. And just before we get into the format, we are doing the same normal uh, modified crew battle format. Five teams stock at the end of the game count plus two points for winning a set. I'll explain it a little bit more in depth, but it is it's the same format we've been running. It's week eight. I hope you guys all know by now. And we are getting into game one here. Apparatus for Mississippi State on the Rob and Georgie on this uh, Kirby representing his Georgetown University. Yeah, I actually really like this matchup because it has a lot of aerial presence. You know, both of these guys really like their aerial. Uh, uh, looks like my caster's mic has given up on him for 10 years, so. I, I agree. There's a lot of aerial-based uh, gameplay in this matchup. Kirby, very lacking in the air, despite what you'd expect. Uh, he has a lot of jumps, but his jumps don't take him very far, and his horizontal mobility in the air is very poor. However, we do see his ground game is surprisingly better than you would expect. He has really great tilts, he's got really great short hop aerials as well, and those tilts can clip you under the ledge, especially if you're playing Rod, who does not have that hitbox to cover himself when he's trying to get back to the ledge. So, we see Georgie taking that first stock for himself quite early, and starting to build up a sizable amount of extra credit for himself with it. 54% already racked up onto Apparatus before Apparatus is able to shark out that upgrade to kill. And just like I said, uh, Apparatus really abusing Kirby's poor horizontal mobility. It's so easy to get under him and find that up there if you know what you're doing. It is one of the main weaknesses of this character. He's supposed to be so aerially dominant on paper. Uh, when you don't have the stats to back it up, it makes it a lot harder. And already we see some really solid combos from Apparatus, evening things right back up. Yeah, and uh, if I am back, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to say that uh, Georgie's doing a very good job of catching Rob on landing. You know, we were talking about the aerial presence of both of these characters, and you were mentioning how 
Kirby's aerials aren't all that great, and he knows that too, so he's going, you know, to try and catch Rob on all these landings, but that side B has so many hitboxes and it's so powerful that it's going to take that second stop. Yeah, Rob's uh, down B, actually, one of his biggest red, and, or no, not, that is the side B, yeah, down B is the tire, I'm crazy. The <laughs> side B, uh, one of his biggest red and butter still confirms. Uh, normally we see people combo into a blitz, Apparatus hits it raw. Again, Georgie clipping the ledge, Apparatus grabbed the ledge twice, we didn't have that invulnerability in there. That's the second time I've seen Georgie air dodge in a ledge like that. It looks like he really does know his face and his character, but he's still down 70% despite all that. Yeah, and trapped in the corner against Rob is very tough. I mean, look at all the tools that Rob has. Nearly catches the two frame, and this shield when it gets super low, good grab to get out of the corner. Yeah, Rob's ledge trapping is one of his strongest, most infamous parts of his kit. And you see it on full display here, Georgie doing his best to get around him, finding some really great return percent. Even if he's up against Akron on this Rob, but the mobility from that Rob is just too much. And Akron weaves around Georgie and finds the stock, closes out game one and earns a point for his team. But now that we do have a little bit more downtime, I can rehash the format for uh, what will be the last time for a while. We have f uh, two teams, each team having five representatives. Uh, each team sends in one player to go against one player of the other team in a best of three. Winning a game in that best of three earns your team a point for each stock you have remaining at the end of the game. And if you win the best of three, you earn an additional two points for your team. So, Apparatus taking game one in a one stock victory over Georgie has earned one point for Mississippi State, and the lead is now one to zero. Yeah, and uh, good stuff to both players there. Apparatus uh, able to clutch that one out because of that last air dodge. You, know, you mentioned how many times that Georgie had been air dodging to ledge, and the more you use a move, the slower and slower it gets. And so that air dodge only lasts so many frames, and he becomes you know a little bit uh, less vulnerable. And that uh, the window of that back air hitbox catches him and secures the kill. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of a tier discrepancy when we look at these matchups. I won't lie, it's. It's not looking great if you're a Kirby player in Smash Ultimate. It hasn't looked great since Smash 64 for the Kirby players, honestly. But um, that being said, they do persevere, and we saw Georgie bring out some really great plays. He clipped Apparatus at the ledge multiple times. That's how he got both of his stocks. So I definitely think he's not out of it. We've seen some great gameplay from Georgie, and now that we're going to his counter pick, I expect that it'll be even closer Ready? in game two, and we might even see Georgie take the win here and earn some points back for his team. Yeah, Georgie did look really good. He did a very good job of making all his hits count, I, especially like that you saw in those replays, the B reverse uh, into a, uh, an edge guard attempt. And so, yeah, I was going to say he wants probably a smaller stage to try and kill this Rob a little bit earlier. Could work against him because Kirby is a light character, but I like the game. Yeah, Kirby being a light character, typically we don't want to see light characters want to go to the bigger stages, but the flip side is you can get that extra kill power on your heavier opponent as well, so it definitely cuts both ways, and we'll have to see how it pans out, but I think the main reason Georgie takes Apparatus here is for that tri flat format. Um, Kirby has some really great up air springs he can pull off, uh, and he can carry Apparatus around the stage if given the opportunity. The downside being, these platforms are exactly where Rob wants to be under you, sharking four up airs and up smashes. Yeah, and uh, once again, Rob's ledge trap trapping, the, arguably one of the strongest points of his kit, and uh, it comes to fruition there. And you're absolutely right, the triplats benefit both of these characters, especially if Rob has center stage. Yeah, Rob with stage control is an absolute menace. We see it looks so hard for Georgie to get down from these ledges. There's so many different heights Apparatus can play at that when Georgie is in disadvantage, it feels really difficult to actually touch the ground, especially with how limited Kirby's mobility is. Okay. Good edge guard attempt there. And Apparatus is making uh, use of that up air. We've seen it a couple times. It's so good, especially if he can land the uh, drag down hitbox of it. It's going to be so powerful, especially on these platforms. Yeah, 
there is the up air exactly as we're talking about. Takes the second stock, and now we see Apparatus going for a big combo, looking to make a three stock happen for his team, which would be an absolutely amazing lead for Mississippi to have out the gate. Georgie, of course, doesn't want to let it happen, even if he doesn't think he can win the game in this format where every stock counts. He really wants to make sure he can close out this stock when Apparatus is already at 111, but the pressure is absolutely brutal. That Nair not going to kill him yet. The other problem that Georgie has here is on landing, Kirby cannot cover these platforms. They're too tall for his up smash. Yeah, Kirby is too short to cover, and there it is. A three-stock victory for Apparatus will earn him not only three points, for his team, but he will also gain two more points for winning this set, meaning Mississippi takes an early lead of 6-0, to zero, which is quite sizable. It's not insurmountable. It can definitely be made back in, obviously, just one set by the next player coming in for Georgetown, but 6-0 to zero is not where you want to see. Typically, we see matches start out more in the range of 4 or even 3-0. to zero. Um, yeah, very strong showing from Apparatus there. But this is kind of the performance that we expected from Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. They are one of the top teams in this conference. I believe they're 5-1, and one, if I remember uh, the standings correctly. Whereas Georgetown, this has kind of been the, uh, the struggle of their season so far. They are the one winless team uh, still in this conference trying to go up against this powerhouse mm -hmm. that is uh, Mississippi State. But uh, yeah. it's 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 you know kind of coming to fruition here. Good showing though. I mean, you saw the the flashes of brilliance there from Georgie. Just couldn't mm -hmm. put it all together. Yeah, Mississippi State is currently tied for fourth in the conference with William and Mary. They have a net win loss difference of four right now, uh, out of six possible wins. So five and one is a really impressive showing. DePaul University at number one. Siena and St. Peter at number two. So they are a top, top contender. And Georgetown at zero and six has been feeling very bad. But with how fierce the competition is, some teams just have to be better than the others. And uh, some teams need to be here to practice, need to get their games on. And honestly, this is a really great opportunity for Georgetown University, who is completely eliminated from any playoff contentions, to get some really good experience under the belts. Yeah, and that's also another point was, if you look at this Big East conference mm -hmm. or, uh, that Georgetown is in, it's a tough conference. I mean, DePaul yeah. is ranked first. They're, the, I believe, the only unbeaten team still remaining uh, in the EGF. And so Georgetown has had the, you know, a rough season solely because the, the Big East has been so tightly competitive. Yeah. We see uh, we see teams like University of Connecticut one and six. Meanwhile, on the other end of the Big East, we have DePaul at six and zero. We have uh, St. John's University at four and three. So it's it's a very polarized bracket over there. We are in a state at the end of the season where things are mostly figured out and it's really great to sort of see all these teams who we've been following going up against each other now and uh, solidifying their places in the standing. Yeah, and uh, Mississippi State, one of the independent teams, they've had mm -hmm. such a, a great showing. You know, we talked about uh, some of their key players and apparatus being one of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, important for them to get off to an early start. Yeah, and uh, they are indeed getting off to that early start. We are going to take a short couple minute break while we get the next two players canoe and lukewarm into the lobby, get the next game ready. So stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. We have Canoe and Lukewarm in the lobby. They just finished up their hand warmers and their lag tests. So we're going to be getting straight into things. We have Canoe representing Mississippi State, trying to extend their lead even further. Remember, they started out 6-0 to zero after a commanding victory from Apparatus over Georgie. But up against Canoe, we have Lukewarm for the Georgia Town University trying to shut it down trying to get their points back and even things up we'll have to see what happens as we get straight into it looks like they just need to get back onto the right characters maybe switched off for the hand warmer and we will be on our way yeah, i'm very very curious to see uh which uh characters come out here i'm not sure who yeah. either of these uh, yeah, we heard, we heard Ganon and Wario in the hand warmer, and it looks like it is going to be Ganon being kept, but the Wario is going to be getting switched up on to the Jigglypuff, who is a character we do not see a lot of representation Three, for. Two, yeah, one, and uh, this is a, a strange matchup, because this is the light, you know, floaty character that dies very early against one of the heaviest hitters in the game, so this Jigglypuff has to play very careful. And yeah, the Jigglypuff does have to play very careful, but the offstage game is where we can really, really see the new time. Uh, going offstage, gimping a Ganon to recovery is incredibly powerful. If this Ganon dies off the side blast zone, I expect it to be a very rare occurrence, just like that. We should to go off the side, get the double stare, and just drag Lukewarm to the edge, force him out of recovery range, and get a nice early stock despite Ganon's heavy weight. Yeah, and uh, uh, I really like ooh, good combo here from Jigglypuff. He's really making use of every single hit, but that sing was a little greedy. Good attempt. I respect the attempt, but it definitely did not pay off, and it is quite punchable. But at only 40%, you're not in the actual danger of dying, so the risk reward felt like it was there for him. Yeah, uh, oh, again, that, that Kirby, oh no, yeah. Jigglypuff, another one of these characters that's also pretty good at ledge trapping, and that was Lukewarm, oh, <laughs> nearly <laughs> going for it all. Oh man, Lukewarm not there with the punish, though, perhaps not really knowing the timing. I'm sure he's not very used to seeing a whole lot of Jigglypuff using the sting and being punished for it, so. I don't blame him, but Canoe really starting to open up a very, very big lead here. Almost taking this stock as well means at 135% on Root War, it's a full stock lead still for Canoe, and it could be getting even bigger. This is one of the issues, though, for Drexel, is that he's got to find a way to kill, and really, Jigglypuff's best kill option is something <laughs> like that, trading off stage. There it is, indeed, yeah. That's definitely a kill option. Trading the stocks is pretty good. It's a pretty core part of Jigglypuff gameplay with that rest and we see it coming out in a little bit of a different form there but already can do a big combo racks on 60 70 percent and it continues the air dive chase as well and it might just be new form getting almost zero to death here the well, combo maybe oh no it's a little too low there and uh it's gonna eat his stock for it yeah, really, really well played by Canoe. That entire last stock just felt like Canoe was running down every single escape option Lukewarm wanted to do, and that is the failure of Ganondorf, right? That is what the character is weak at. When he's in disadvantage, he's big, he's slow, and he can't get out of it easily, and Canoe capitalized on it perfectly. He earns two more points for Mississippi State, bringing the lead up to eight to zero and now it starts looking bad if canoe wins this next game i'm pretty sure mississippi state the uh the heavy favorites to be sure will lock it out not completely it would be winnable for georgetown but it would start looking pretty daunting yeah and one of the things about this matchup specifically is that mm -hmm. you know we talked about how hard it is for jigglypuff to kill such a heavy character but I mean, if Ganon is put off stage, that's like a death sentence practically because oh, you know, for sure. it's when you're on stage against Jigglypuff, it's like death by a thousand cuts. He's not going to mm -hmm. hit you with any heavy combos, really. 
uh, even though you saw him kind of get carried across the stage, but that's because of like the specific hitbox that you have to land. It's a very you know close window that you have to land those string those aerials together. But each of those aerials is only worth you know under 10%. It's the fact that uh, Puff was able to string them all together that made it so damaging. Yeah, it's the fact that Puff is able to string them together, and it's the fact that you just get dragged all the way out to the blast zone. Jigglypuff doesn't need a strong hit to kill you, because Jigglypuff can go so far off stage horizontally and make it back. Uh, the fall speed, the aerial drift, bullets just go together perfectly to make it so she can spare you four times and drag you straight into the blast zone. She doesn't need a big launching move to do it. She'll just take you there herself. Especially against a character like Ganon, too, with, you know, very limited options in terms of uh, recovery and disadvantage. You know, th Ganon's basically like Captain Falcon, right? In that you either, you know, burn your jump or use your up B early. And uh, either way, Puff has so much coverage options with the with his, uh, her uh, floating uh, mobility. Her yeah, her lightweight. Um, well, we do go to Kalos. Best counter pick in the game. Uh, if you're gonna lose, lose and stop. <laughs> well, we do see it. Who can do? Absolutely content to camp under the platform. Gets a little bored and needs some damage for it. Getting a little bit lazy and uh, a flawed input is going to mean an SD. I'm sure Kenu did not want to get a, uh, a rest input off stage there. Yeah, I think that was supposed to be a pound, that side yeah. B. That side B actually does a surprising amount of shield pressure, and I'm looking... Oh, great oh, job. He's stringing it good. together. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. You can string pound into a couple different moves. Uh, it, it, in some scenarios, it can lead to a rest. Oh, that was a dangerous forward air. You know, Ganon just hits like a truck, and so any of these forward smashes or up smashes that are coming out uh, are going to kill all of them really early. <laughs> Now, like 52% the up smash hits and the pub almost dies off the top on Kalos. Kalos has the second highest ceiling from the stage of any legal stage. So, uh, killing off the top on Kalos is not easy, but if you're playing Jiggly Puff, it gets a lot easier. Yeah, I think Puff is something like the third lightest character or it's, second lightest uh, character oh in the God. game as well. So, yeah, 80% is kill percent. That forward tilt gonna do it though. Forward tilt takes the stock and it's lukewarm, earning himself the lead back. What EDG percent means he's not feeling comfortable, but Puff doesn't have that kill power. He has it from stuff. He's able to make it back on stage with Yuppie, and now 39 almost 40% on this puff, and Lukewarm is really starting to take things forward, 62% now. The SD, of course, out of his control, but it could be exactly what he needed to get back in the game. Up 63% means basically any smash attack will do it here. Yeah, especially well, with the Black Sons and Kalos, even up smash I'd be scared of if I were a canoe. Oh yeah, I'll be escaping absolutely. When you're 101 as a Jigglypuff against Dan and a light breeze will start killing pretty soon, so you need to be incredibly careful. This has to be the button. No! Oh no! Oh, oh no! Oh, the oh, no. Wait. oh the BM does not pay off. Oh, what am I watching? Well, uh oh, that's called oh, clip oh. hunting. Uh and failing at it as well. But in the end, uh, Lukewarm gonna take the first game for Georgetown. So a rest, or so a sleep misses, but Lukewarm fails to punish and falls asleep. Canoe goes for a rest, but jumps too far. So Lukewarm goes to punish the rest with a Warlock punch, but doesn't turn around. So Canoe goes to punish the mixed, the missed Warlock punch with the rest, but jumps over him again, and finally Lukewarm says, screw it, I'm just charging a smash attack and takes the stock. <laughs> I... Yeah, there's, there's no other way to say it. that that was just, that, that was a mess. I, uh, I, I, mm. You know, I, yeah. I do respect Canoe trying to go for the clip there, because, you know, that is a confirm that you can do that down air into rest, yeah. but uh, 
Rust is one of those moves that you have to commit to it, right? And so... Went to drill Rust, but, uh... Canoe, or not Canoe, uh, Lukewarm fell out and was able to get his shield up in time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a little more respectful. You, the key to that drill rest is you kind of have to be, you can't fade into it very easily. It's more like a you have to come down on them as if you were spiking them. It makes it, makes it way easier, but because he kind of drifted left to right, it allowed uh, Lukewarm to fall out of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. Hey, you have to, like, land on, like, a specific frame of the drill to get the cancel to work. It's hard, especially on Wi-Fi, so... I respect for Canoe can for attempting, but uh, I'm pretty sure there was a more consistent footage in there somewhere. Either way, we have a game where we go to Battlefield, which is an interesting stage. I don't really know what to make of it in this matchup, but the one thing I do know is Ganon will have a really easy time sharking these platforms with snap attacks. Yeah, I think this stage acts as kind of a double-edged sword. It, you know, whoever controls stage kind of controls the matchup because if you're landing on one of those platforms, it's oh so dangerous. Oh, but we see almost a zero to death for Kanuki. He hasn't been touched yet. 105 on Lukewarm with no response. And that's, that's it. Gonna do it. Yeah, the zero. I mean, and look at Kanu's stage control. He had stage control for the majority of that first stock. And, uh, this is, this oh, is why oh, we're saying it feels very no. dull. Oh boy, here we go it's again. Bad. The Nair's oh, gonna do it. Is it? No. Lukewarm, please hit him one. <laughs> yeah, I'm begging you. Lukewarm, I'm begging you. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, oh. And uh, that, my friends, is a JV4. <laughs> I guess it is. Ah, uh, I I'm so sorry, lukewarm. That that that's it, just I'm unfortunate. Sorry. It didn't have to be this way, but you you pressed the you pressed the gray button on your controller. I'm sorry. You had you had more of a thing. I think that's the fastest JV4 I've seen in a while. That was a quick one. The puff JV4 as well is not something you expect to get pulled out. Yeah. Mississippi State message sent and received. You know this is a this is a team to be met, not to be messed with. <laughs> and now with the scoreline of thirteen to one, it would take an absolute miracle run from Georgetown University to make it back. Especially considering the fact that I think Georgetown only has four players, so I'm pretty sure they automatically forfeit six stocks at the end of uh, for game five. I'm pretty sure that's how the format works. I would have to check again. Oh, that sounds right. I need confirmation on that, but I'm pretty sure if you have a player, if you have a player missing from your roster for some reason, it counts as getting double two stocks. I think that's a ruling we made before. So we'll have to see what happens, but uh, Mississippi State, I think if that is the rule, has already guaranteed themselves victory. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, this is kind of the showing that we were kind of expecting from Mississippi State. You know, this, this is a strong team. They've got talent across the board. And uh, the Jigglypuff pick, I mean, I don't think we've, we... We don't really see Jigglypuff in no. this conference a lot. But uh, just a strong showing. And against Ganon, that's a very, like, tilt-heavy type of matchup where it's, it's either heavy one way or the other. So for him to come out and have that you know, strong of a showing is is fantastic for Mississippi State. It certainly was heavy in one way. <laughs> but uh, that being said, we are going to throw it to a quick little break. We have Renegade going up against Kobe coming up next. We need to see if Kobe can reclaim some pride for his school or if Mississippi State can keep just asserting their dominance. And uh, we actually might not have to have a break. These players are loading in ass today. Renegade and Kobe, I'm being informed, are actually both in the ring. We'll have to see if they get their picks and bands done, but uh, I guess we aren't going to have to wait. Do you actually know who either of these players play? I've seen Renegade play before, but the mm -hmm. last time I think I saw him play uh, was against Hawaii, and I think he lost that set. It was very close, though. I believe it was like 2-1 stocks that he yeah. lost. 
I don't remember the character that he plays, but he is a one of the more consistent players on this Mississippi State roster, so uh, a okay. face that comes up more often. Yeah, we. Uh, it looks like he didn't actually play last week. That's why I didn't recognize him. I recognized Apparatus, that Rob player that we saw play, but uh, I did not recognize Renegade because he didn't play last week. I was here last week for the cast, but uh, he wasn't in the lineup, so we'll have to see how he comes out and performs going up against Kobe. Kobe, another player I have not seen anything of as far as I'm aware. Do you know if you have? I have not seen Kobe. So, okay. uh, you know, I I'm hoping for the double random pick. That, that, <laughs> that, that would be fun. <laughs> Looking at looking at our schedule for later, just looking down the road, it looks like we don't have uh, DePaul playing on our screen, which is a shame because assuming that Mississippi goes ahead and wins this match against Georgetown, they would have six wins and one loss, meaning the pressure would be on DePaul to win their matchup against whoever they are up against on stream two, I believe, because uh, at 6-0, currently undefeated, they would need to win to avoid going to a tiebreaker scenario, in which case we would pull up uh, win-loss records against each other and uh, stock count differentials and a whole bunch of other stats. So maybe saving us a little bit of a headache if DePaul is able to pull it out in their match. And Mississippi State, Looking to tie them up in terms of win count is an impressive feat in and of itself. Yeah, for uh, assuming they can clutch this one out, six and one is is like you said, no small feat, and especially in in uh, this league, which you know has had so many teams at the top look so good mm -hmm. for so long. Three, two, one, go. Renegade on the DDD going up against Kobe on the Cena. And I feel like every time DVD is on screen, I just want to talk about how bad of a matchup it is for him. Yeah, uh, oh, I guess... Ooh, that was a dangerous shield there for Renegade. Yeah, uh, DVD, this is a stage that I don't also think benefits him either, because although he can run away and use his projectiles, uh, if Lucina gets in, there's a lot of damage to be done, but speaking of damage, that forward smash. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty bread and butter setup for DPP players going up in order to pressure you know, and force your opponent to get up and then go for that up smash. But every time I see it, it still looks so impressive. And it gives Renegade the first stock, giving it a full stock advantage without laughing over Kobe. This is going to be the struggle for Kobe, is how do you get through this disadvantage, all these projectiles? It's hard for sorties to get out of the corner like that. They typically, you know, do something like swing on shield, and Renegade's starting to get a picture for it. He's starting to read these jumps out of the corner. Yeah, Renegade, really, really great portal coverage, and we need to see Kobe throwing these portals back. You have that distance, you have that sword. You can easily back and out, Renegade, and it'll create some pressure, but you can only do that when you're safe to work out a hitbox, and Renegade is going to punish you, and you see Renegade in Kobe's face too much to have to hit. And the other trouble here is that Renegade at 82%, you would think this, uh, you know, Lucina's got plenty of kill power, but 82 is nowhere close for DDD. DDD has so much survivability, being so heavy and so mobile. Yeah, DDD, oh, for a heavy character, it's gonna be a while before Cody starts going. You've seen the smash backs are all very consistently powered. So you're gonna need to get Renegade. Up to like 130, you're already being lapped, lapped on stock three. A little bit of juice and some sus BI actually does find Kobe the stock, but still Renegade is just so far ahead and Kobe falls too short of the ledge. Two more points in a JP stock going the way of Mississippi State as this lead goes to 15 to 1. Yeah, and uh, Kobe, well, basically got red. I mean, how many times did we yeah. see him jump out of the corner and Renegade just say, okay, forward air, forward air. Yeah. You know, it's, it's almost as if Kobe was the sword character here. <laughs> For sure. No, that was 
Renegade played that so clean. It literally just looked like Kobe had nothing to do. That's the weakness of these sorties, right? When you're playing a sword character, you want to be the one taking space aggressively, forcing your opponent into the corner, making them feel suffocated. But we never, like, once saw Kobe with advantage in that game. It always felt like he was on the back, like, he was the one trying to land, trying to get back to center stage, and Renegade just never, ever let him. Yeah, I said, I said Kobe looked like the sword character. That's because he was. I meant Renegade looked like the sword character. But you are right. Renegade had so much stage control, and Kobe was just trying to find a way in. Kobe was able to work his way out of the corner uh, a couple times. From ledge, he did one option. He rolled and then immediately up-tilted. And I really like that option because Lucina's up-tilt comes out really quickly. And it, on a stage like FD, it gets DDD up into the air. DDD... Uh, any character really on FD does not have an easy way to land. Especially against Lucina. Yeah, that that too. Oh, we do see a character switch come out from Kobe. He's going on to this young Link, a character I think is even better suited for those matchups. These projectiles from the young Link really help stuff Three, out Renegade. Two, DDD one, is not go. a mobile character. He is slow and he is fat, which means it is very, very hard for him to weave around this strong projectile game. The one tool he does have is that stuff that we've already seen come out, and the, the other tool, I guess, is never giving Kobe time to throw projectiles, as we're seeing already immediately if Kobe put in the corner under immense pressure from Renegade. Yeah, in this space. I was going to say the other advantage that Young Link brings is a uh, better recovery because you have more options and the recovery just goes vertically higher. But uh, if you get that misspacing and you fade too far from ledge and land on stage, uh, DD hits like a truck. So uh, that's how that first stock goes away. DDD is one of the strongest characters in the game in terms of just raw kill power. And Young Link, definitely a lighter character than we still have as well. I mean, that forward stack can start killing around 50. Yeah, especially on a stage like this where the blast zones on the sides are so close, a lot of DDD's kills are off the side of the map. So Kobe playing a very dangerous game as he charges the down B. Yeah, he gets the hit. Finds it in style, and now two stock lead. Going to see if he can close out another three stock for the side of Mississippi and with Kobe off stage. It's looking very cool for Renegade. Kobe doesn't have a jump, I'm pretty sure he's dead. And there is going to be the disrespect dunk attempt. You have to respect it, but uh, he helps you find it. A three stock nonetheless means Mississippi State absolutely guaranteed victory 20 to 1 is irrecoverable so i mentioned how uh kobe with this character would have a few more options in terms of getting out of disadvantage you know finding a way to recover back to ledge well it doesn't help if you do the same option every time how many times did kobe burn his jump early to try and get closer and closer to ledge and renegade was there every single time and then on top of that how many times did we see kobe roll from ledge renegade was there to answer that option as well yeah especially on young link who has great tools to get off of ledge like uh drop down jump arrow drop down jump forward air that's a nice lasting multi-hit move you can use to cover your way back on stage just force uh renegade into some option put him in his shield pressure him then you can start looking to just neutral get up and grab you can go for the mix-ups once your opponent doesn't just expect the same thing every time and you just keep giving it to him yeah and uh it just made the matchup look so much more smothering right because once renegade had stage control kobe just kind of seemed you know baffled of like what what do i do to get in on this big penguin yeah for sure but with that being said 20 to 1 is the lead mississippi state very realistically going to end up in a tiebreaker scenario meaning their point differentials their total point counts are going to matter here so they want to get as many as they can and fancy old chap coming up next going against joe tree from georgetown university will be our final set 
of the match between these two teams. So stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes to bring that to you. Hello, quite a short break. These players have been incredibly punctual in terms of getting back into the lobbies, which uh, makes my job a lot easier to say the least. So I very much appreciate it. We have Mississippi State's fancy old chat, a great name. We have some really great names in EGF. Going up against Joe Tree for Georgetown University. We have Joe Tree on the Corin going up against fancy old chat on the Wolf. Fancy old chap's first start for Mississippi State. Okay, yeah. I definitely don't recognize him. I haven't really seen him around, but Wolf is an interesting character. Joe Tree does not want to approach right now. Uh, both players maybe uh, have a little bit of a to kind of No, it's a little bit of an interesting start to the game. And a clean 13% from Joe Tree as he finds a check out. But... As I wanted to say, Wolf is one of those characters where he feels very bread and butter slow starting. It feels like whenever you play against Wolf, it really does feel like you're playing against the character more than the player. Right. right. And uh, the way I kind of think of it is, uh, in other Smash games, you know, Sheik was always that like yeah. bread and butter string combos together. Wolf is like that in this game, except for Wolf hits a whole lot harder than Sheik. Yeah, the difference between Sheik and Wolf is uh, Sheik combos you for like three minutes and deals 70%. Wolf hits you three times and deals 70%. Yeah. And I guess Corrin, this is a very awkward matchup for Corrin because Corrin has a lot of uh, disjointed hitboxes on Wolf, who has one of the better projectiles in this game. Yeah, Wolf has a really, really good projectile. It's slow, so it covers a lot of space out for a long time and makes a hard to approach it, as well as dealing a really insane amount of percent. And we see it paying off just the solid bread and butter. The Smash Taxi Aerials finding their marks for Fancy here as he is up two stocks to one, or three stocks to one, or two stocks to one. It feels like Gyotri is really having uh, trouble finding a way in on Fancy Hill, always approaching with uh, some sort of aerial, or finally he lands you know, a grab, but still just making his attacks, ooh, no, dipped a little too low on that recovery. Yeah, James, not where you want to be. It, even going off stage was because of a really, really punishable neutral B charge attempt. It's just, it's not how you want this game to go. He ended up facing the wrong way after his double jump somehow. I'm not quite sure, but it's it's so rough. But that's how it's going to go. These players from Mississippi State are not here to mess around. They are out to take names and blow up their leads. So you need to be able to step it up or you need to be able to just accept your defeats against them. They're just such a dominant team. Yeah, and uh, one of the things I was going to talk about was for uh, the core in there. Core is a character that has a lot of odd movement options in terms of you know, how they move around on stage. The neutral B, if they're in the air, it actually pushes them away. So does the back air. Whichever way they use the back air, it pushes them 
away from, from that hitbox, so it makes it a little disjointed. And things like the down air send you straight down and make you fast fall. It's very awkward to approach with this character. Yeah, Corrin's definitely a character who wants to force the opponent to approach them, but when Wolf has that laser, that's such a strong tool. It makes it a lot harder to force Wolf to approach you, because he is consent content to just sit on the side to shoot that gun and make you walk over. And when your approach is far so deep and telegraphed as for it, it makes it very hard. Lila, the interesting counter pick as well. These slants are actually, I think, really going to benefit Corrin. You know, we saw Dotri standing, crouching under the lasers like a bunch of those slants from it. When you start getting hit by the bread and butter scenario, these uh, tech reads, these lead traps from the wolf, it starts looking bad, and that up is incredibly comfortable. You cannot just throw that out there. Wolf Down Smash is, I believe, one of the strongest in the game as well. 85 is when it killed, so to give you an indicator of how good, you know, Wolf Smash attacks are. Yeah, Wolf Down Smash is one of the best in the game. It's fast, it covers both sides, but it's great power, it's such a fast angle. We saw the power of it right there. Fancy already ballooning a lead, 73, 82% on him, with 37 on his opponent. He's looking to make that higher as he keeps Dotri flying around with disadvantage, but the pin is a nice reversal, and he's off the path. Yeah, they're so committal, and that's a tough trade. Can you make it back? No, Corrin's recovery is a little too short. Yeah. And now... Fancy at 104 is definitely in kill percent. He could die, especially something like the counter, but Dotri has to be careful of getting double three stops here. And what's that kill percent, too? I mean, on a stage like this, it's hard to kind of kill Fox because the, the last zones on the side are so close that if Fox lives, he's going to probably be able to make it back. But you have to find a way to land a strong hit here. You have confirms that you can go for there it. There it is. Oh, but not, not quite. Yeah, just lacking that kill power. And the down B to clip Joe Tree under the ledge. Oh, Will secure fancy old trap. He double three stock victory. And Georgetown, their lineup only has four players on it. There is not a fifth game to play. Unfortunately for Mays, the remaining player on the lineup of Mississippi State, he's getting snuffed out of playing his match, but I'm sure he's happy. His team is taking home 28 more points to Georgetown's one. Georgetown unable to find themselves their first match victory in UCF here. They are going to go on without a win, unfortunately, but they have developing talent. They probably will be back next season and they will be improved and hopefully looking better. Mississippi State a solid, solid playoff contender. Securing themselves the six and one spot means they are now in contention for first place. And it's in DePaul University's hands to see where Mississippi ends up. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, that Mississippi State, you know, they have come through week after week after week of, you know, showing up in a big way. And Georgetown, it just hasn't come to fruition for them. So, you know, it's kind of back to the drawing board, back to basics, you know, back to fundamentals for them. Yeah, it's you got to get that practice in. You got to practice on the Wi-Fi, get everything solidly lined up. And next season, I expect if they keep up their practice, if they put in the work, they can definitely be some contenders. But Mississippi, moving on and now... We are way ahead of schedule here because we do not have a fifth game to play. So we are going to cut it to a pretty long break as we talk to teams. I'm not sure if we are going to wait until 6 o'clock Eastern time to play out the match between Siena College and University of Connecticut. But it looks like it very well might be the case. So we are going to either throw it to a very long break or turn off the stream and run it back up when it is time for the match to start but keep the tab open you'll hear the sounds when we get things going make sure you're here make sure you're watching because we do have Siena college versus university of connecticut coming up next it's going to be a good match make sure you stay tuned
Well, hello. We have Canoe here from Mississippi State for an interview coming off the back of a 28 to 1 victory over Georgetown University. Canoe himself earning seven of those points, only one less than the maximum possible you can earn from the set. So uh, you must be feeling pretty good about yourself, right? Yeah, everyone in the uh, everyone in the Discord was kind of flaming me because I kind of threw game two. For uh, no I mean, you had the only point loss for your entire team trip. Okay, I, you want to uh, tell me about that last game? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame the second game on the music. I had a song I didn't like on. Uh, okay. Then, you know, turn on some Childish Gambino game three, and I just True. didn't let him hit me. Yeah, you did. You got the uh, you got the JV4. We were we were freaking out. I don't know if you guys I know, that's, my, that's my first JV4 on stream. I yeah. was so hyped. I don't know if you guys keep the stream open or anything, but I would say it like, oh, man, just let it like hit him once. And then he, he air dodged at the ledge. It was mm. brutal to watch. I mean, I, I, I just played really solid that game three. I don't think I missed any of my confirms or my punishes. Yeah, so you guys are now 6-1, and one, which mm. ties you in terms of win count with DePaul University, who are currently playing right now. Uh, if they win, they will take first, and you will be in the race for second. But if DePaul loses, you will tie with them, and it'll go to a win-loss record. So I think... You guys are guaranteed second right now. So how are you, just your team feeling about that? Uh, I think we're kind of upset we aren't in first, honestly. Understandable, yeah. The, the, uh, the, the one match we lost was on voting day, and we had our two best oh. players, Maze and Yosufu, that couldn't make it. So that was just unfortunate, and we couldn't pull out what we wanted to. That is that is really unfortunate. But, but I, yeah. I think if it comes down to it, our team is probably the best in the running, so I don't think we'll have a problem from here on out. Those are bold words. You expect to take it all when playoffs come around, huh? Maybe not take it all, but if we lose more than one match, I'll be disappointed from now. <laughs> I mean, it's playoffs. You can only yeah. lose one match. <laughs> yeah, we'll make, we'll make it to Grands. We'll be fine. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, no, those are, those are big words. I expect to see. I'm excited to see it. Your team has had some of the best explosive matches. I'm very excited to looking forward uh, to playoffs, to seeing you guys. You've walked in a really high seating for yourself, so it's something to be really proud of. And do you have any comments you want to make while you're on stream and have uh, fun? I'm just excited. I think our club has grown a lot in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I think that our top level players are just going to keep pushing and keep getting better. So I'm just excited for what we can do. Did you guys compete in EGF last season? I don't remember. We did not. This is actually oh. our first time doing it. Oh, yeah. Really great debut performance time for you guys. Thank you. But, uh, that is going to be it for Canoe. Any uh, any shout outs you want to make before I send it back to the break or we'll for our next match? Uh, shout out to Maze, who didn't get to play, but he's yeah. been whooping me in the Ganon matchup for like a year and a half. So I think it helped. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Thank you for coming on stream. I haven't gotten to do an interview for Smash in a long time, so it's always great to bring the players in. And uh, yeah, keep an eye on Mississippi State if you are a viewer. They're going to be a top contender going forward, and we're going to throw it back to the break while we wait for the next match to come in. But it was great hearing from you, dude. Oh, y'all too. Keep up the great work.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to match two of the night. We have Siena College going up against the University of Connecticut. UConn has been quite a struggling team as the standings have been going. They are currently sitting at an uncomfortable uh, one and six which is not a standing you want to be at. I'm pretty sure they are locked out of playoffs as this is the final week of the season. Siena College, on the other hand, is sitting at 5-2, and two, meaning they are in very strong playoff contention. Yeah, actually, in terms of the max, Siena is currently the number one team in that conference. And if they get this win over UConn uh, right now, would secure them uh, first place in that mm -hmm. conference, like by a win by any means. You know, a, yeah. a one point victory, at any victory at all, earns them the number one seed. Which means a lot is on the line for Siena here. They need to get that big win to lock in first and feel more comfortable, right? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the MAC, you know, there's those nine teams, and I believe earning the first seed earns you a first round bye. That's so nice. for them to earn that uh, that first round bye would be massive. Yeah, it would be absolutely great. And of course, University of Connecticut is uh, a pretty prideful team. They are they are here to win, and they haven't been winning. But you know, they're not going to be pulling any punches just because they are eliminated. They are going to be fighting the good fight against Siena College, they're going to be making the best attempt they can to keep Siena out of locking in that first place uh, seed here. So we'll have to see if they can do it. And first up, we have Waffle coming in for Siena College, going up against University of Connecticut's LK. Yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, either of these players. I'm not sure what characters they play, but I do know that in a situation like this, I'm kind of looking for a little bit of obscurity. You know, throw something mm -hmm. at the wall, see if it works. Uh, especially for UConn, who's had you know kind of a rougher go of it this season. You know, this is your your chance to kind of experiment right before the end of the, the <clears throat> excuse me season. Yeah, and remember, it is UConn's first season. The Big East only got added to EGF for this season. So Siena was a college that was here last year. They have more experience in the format with these teams going up against teams as opposed to individual play as uh, players from UConn might be more used to. So we'll have to see if in the future they are able to bring out a better showing. But right now it is waffle and lk making some sounds in the background here trying to get everything sorted out and get into game one i mean not only was sienna here last year they are the defending champs of the of the egf yeah. right now especially of the mac i mean that that was a very fun mac tournament last year sienna was you know one of the top contenders uh they had a, a shulk player who uh was very consistent in their roster i don't remember if, uh, his tag, mm -hmm. but I believe he's in the lineup for tonight. I'm pretty so we'll sure see we'll him see later. him. But that being said, we are getting into We have LK on Zelda going up against Waffle on this Sonic, on this FT variant we don't get to see too much of, but it is a nice looking stage. Yeah, uh, I actually like this. Now, one of the things that uh, I'm kind of looking for in this matchup is, you know, we talk a lot about how Sonics like to camp and like to rack up and uh, get combos, but I'm looking for how Waffle tries to set up into kills because one of the things that... Sonic has a lot of kill power, but it seems that in this league, a lot of Sonics find their kills off of raw reads and things of that nature instead of finding kill setups. So I'm looking for how does Waffle find those kill setups? I mean, yeah, that is tech typically how Sonics end up finding their kills. They have a couple things like uh, up throw, up the up air to set things up, but it's not super reliable, not super consistent. A lot of times you have to rely on finding some sort of hard beat or ledge trap to close out stocks on your opponent. And so far, we haven't seen that much incredible bread and butter Sonic play from Waffle. Both stocks are completely even here. And uh, immediately you can kind of see uh, LK of, of uh, Sienna up being the stage 
quite frequently. Not the safest option, but that up B has a very deceptive hitbox, but the strong back air hit from Waffle takes stock one. The uh, uh, back air does take it, and that up B is surprisingly hard to punish, especially on Wi-Fi conditions. There's a lot less lag at the end of it than you expect there to be. So you have to be on guard, you have to look out for it. And with an early lead, this is where Sonic certainly thrives. He is so good at playing safe and racking on easy, cheap percent that when Sonic pulls ahead, he gets that stop lead, he can really just run away with it. Yeah. And uh, you're seeing, ooh, there you go. That up B can kill. It's It has to be at a higher percent in order to do so, but it does have plenty of knockback. And one of the adaptations that we saw... It, it was one of the adaptations that we saw Waffle go for uh, early was he parried uh, one of the back to center stage. So if he can, it's hard to parry in these conditions, but if he can consistently get those down, it's going to be a really rough day for Elf. Yeah, <laughs> parrying against Zelda, who has such telegraph moves like that up the is very important, but that air dodge, not too telegraph, a great hard read from Waffle to catch out the movement of the F smash, gives him a full stop lead here as he racks up a lot of extra percent immediately. Yeah, and this is one of the challenges for LK. Ooh, nice uh, lightning kick there, but Zelda is a character that really plays better with the lead, is not a very comeback type of character. You know, mm -hmm. they have a lot of uh, moves that are laggy and cause Zelda really to be in place and be vulnerable, but also, on the other hand, it keeps characters like Sonic away fairly well. Yeah, the zoning kick keeps Sonic away. That down is a powerful tool, but it's just not enough when you're going up against a waffle on both Sonic. The second raw F smash connecting, clipping the movement from LK means it's going to be a two-stock victory for Waffle, and he's going to get the first points of the match. Stuff from Waffle, and honestly, I think the difference maker here was he really caught on to that tendency of recovering the center stage, and not every up B is safe. It feels like up B for Zelda is a very safe move, as you see in the replay there. It, it gets uh, that first kill on the Waffle, but Again, it's the, the tendencies, right? If you continue to do an option, eventually you're going to get punished for it. For sure. No, you have to have to be careful with how you're spending options like that. And we just, we see some great reads coming out from Waffle. He takes it. And now if you're LK here, you're probably pretty scared. You probably want to take Waffle to somewhere with a little more platforms maybe something like a tri-flat or town and city just somewhere where you have more space because it felt like every time waffle could just go to one side of the stage and start charging a spin dash it feels so hard for zelda being so slow to get away from it yeah uh one of the players that i used to play against when i played for the canisius roster last year was a zelda player and he really liked smashville so i wonder if he'll go to a stage like Smashville. Smashville's got uh, fairly large blast zones off the sides, I believe, and that one platform kind of mitigates Sonic's ability to really camp out, and it would allow Zelda enough space to throw out all the projectiles that she has. It definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, it definitely I, makes I flipped my blast zones. I flipped my blast zones there. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's tall and narrow, but yeah. Zelda, not a character who kills off the top all that often. It's typically going to be those lightning kicks going off the side or uh, something like a down smash clipping at a bad angle. So it is a very good stage for the character. It makes it very nice to have that one platform you can shark on. It gives Zelda that ceiling in very hard limits where your opponent can approach you from. So I can definitely see it being a constriction. I can also see it being banned out. Right, this is a format where you do have stage bans, so if you know a stage is very good for the other player, you can always just get rid of it. Uh, yeah, also very true. And I also considered, you know, maybe town and city, but I also know that Sonics tend to like that stage a lot because of the way those uh, triplats are angled. The triplats are positioned, uh, I should say. Yeah, the platforms on town and city, the positionings being at those really. 
few weird angles. It is something that allows Sonic to have access to better than most other characters, right? Sonic is so mobile, he's so fast that just because the platforms are in those really weird, awkward spots, you can still get to them just fine. Uh, and that, that really helps. So seeing uh, Smashville is open, it's where I would expect the counter pick to be for LK. We'll have to see if he's thinking on the same wavelengths as the Zelda player that you are friends with. As it looks like we have picked Lila as the stage. Very interesting. Yeah, I, uh, here's the thing. We saw Lila in the last set kind of be uh, I use this term a lot, this double-edged sword, especially in terms of sharking from underneath, you know, that recovery. Uh, and I feel like this actually benefits the Sonic a little bit more because even though Zelda is able to cover those platforms a little bit better, Sonic still has a lot of uh, agency and mobility on stage and Lilat's stage is very small, right? So Zelda's not gonna have a lot of time to throw out all her proje uh, projectiles. Yeah, Lila is a weird stage. I feel like when you go to Lila, you want to abuse these low platforms and the uh, slants, right? And I feel like Zelda doesn't really do either particularly well. And I feel like Sonic can use both well. So I don't quite understand the stage pick. I think it might just be something that the player is comfortable on and it might not be for the matchup, if I had to guess. Yeah. That is, yeah, that is also true. The, uh, you know, the small... <laughs> my, my bad, but yeah, the, uh... So Zelda is a character who likes having platforms on her head, which is something we talked about when we over why she likes Smashville so much. And it is still true on this stage, but I don't see why you go here when you could go to Smashville. The other thing, too, is that if you think about how Sonic recovers, he doesn't have a hitbox when he recovers, which we saw in the last set end up being, uh, ooh, good catch with the side be that. But we saw that was kind of the reason why uh, the Corrin player struggled is the hitbox, it can clip through that, uh, you know, the edge of the stage. But if Sonic doesn't have that hitbox, you throw out something, you might be able to clip uh, Sonic instead. Yeah, that is something the ledges do. It makes anything that goes flat actually hit under the ledge and below the stage. And Zelda isn't really a character who can use it, but her down tilt can find some value against Sonic, whose up is so easy to cover if you hardly that he is going to ledge, not trying to cover high onto the stage or anything. That was an awkward scenario at ledge. Uh, the, the ledge trump came through, and then Zelda actually got the drag down there, so good reaction by Waffles to quickly up be back to stage. Yeah, very, very important. He had his jump, so I think he would have been fine if he dropped lower, but wasting any time in a panic scenario off stage like that can be very costly. And now, 106, 122 on the Zelda, she is not that heavy of a character, and 42% on the Sonic is already good extra credit, and it keeps yeah. getting higher. Yeah, and Waffle is doing a really good job of utilizing the space. I mean, the LK is, you know, trying to zone out and occasionally goes in for kills like that, but you see Waffle really maneuvering around and uh, racking up percent, but this is the problem. There you go. Finds the down smash. How is Sonic going to land the kill move? You do see these platforms paying off for LK. We saw Waffle getting a lot of value before from approaching from the hub, and now that is not an option that's off the table. It is a lot easier for LK to play a defensive game. Ooh, first down air we've seen from Sonic. Down air not, you know, a very good tool unless, of course, you're approaching from above, and it's also very committal, right? It makes you fast fall right into typically the face of your opponent. So it's one of those moves you have to only really throw out if you know it's going to land. And it did not land there. It was, in fact, punished. And now, in full stock lead, in a reversal of the game one, which ended in a two stock, it is now LK, who is up two stocks to one, who's lapping their opponent in the first seven and looking very good in the game. That's the other tool for LK that uh, I'd like to see more of. That neutral B comes out so fast and actually covers a surprising amount of space that 
it's so hard for characters to get in on. Also, it's, it's pointed and has a lot of priority, which means it can stuff out spin dash approaches very easily. I think LK wanted to use that knight to pressure off stage, but ended up turning it the wrong way, so he just kind of gave up that ledge trap. Very unfortunate, but at 112, he's in a little bit of danger. The follow up isn't there for Waffle, however, and he needs to close out this cross path because every single stock in this format matters, and the difference between a two stock and a one stock can be very big sometimes. And you can kind of tell now, Waffle's, you know, throwing out a handful of smash attacks. He's hunting for that kill. He's definitely playing a lot more patient than he was before. He's trying to find the big opening that he needs. Okay, giving up Sage there, but Waffle not able to capitalize on it. Sonic is not a character who can actively fight for stage control aggressively. That's how this character does. But he is able to catch the movement, find an up smash. Now, stocks are even, but are almost 100% still separate from the players. Yeah, and uh, again, that platform, you know, being low enough to, to be caught by that up smash is so pivotal. And in a format where we said every stock matters, and now, okay, trying to get at a disadvantage, the up B gonna do it. Yeah, I think Waffle thought that that up B was going to ledge. I don't think he thought. He is going to clip him, but it will be a one sock win for LK in game two here, reversing things a little bit and taking us to a game three. Yeah, and uh, the Lilac counter pick works. You know, Waffle, despite his ability to maneuver around and kind of weave in, get some hits here and there. And at the end of the day, Zelda uh, also has plenty of kill power. Now, a lot of her moves, you have to get the strong hitbox of it for it to really you know, pack a punch, but that still means, you know, Zelda has all the, you know, kill power in the world to do so. Yeah, Zelda, great projectiles, the up air, the uh, forward and back air, all really great kill, throws, kill tools. The up B there, as you see, also has a very, very strong hitbox on it. So Zelda's not lacking kill power. Also, surprisingly, Zelda not lacking in survivability. She is one of the lightest characters in the game, but I guess there is some, like, aluminum foil, some metal <laughs> foil in that dress of Zelda's, because she is very solidly a midweight character when she changes her clothes out. Yeah, and uh, it's a very awkwardly uh, built character, too, because you have all these projectiles, and then... All the boxing tools that, that we've talked about in the past, Zelda doesn't really have those, and yet she still hits like a truck. Yeah. The main problem is that all of her kill tools are very specific, right? You have these like really, really strong sweet spots on her aerials, but if you miss the sweet spot, they're, they're really weak moves, right? You have this up B that is very strong if it connects, but it's very committal, it's very telegraphed, and it's very punishable, right? So everything Zelda does is very situational, so it can kill, but you very rarely see any individual thing be the option that closes things out because of how narrow their use cases are. Yeah, and you could also kind of make that argument for Sonic 2 where it's like, he has kill moves like up smash, forward smash, down smash, all of those are very good, but it's a case of, you know, actually finding the opportunity to land those, because typically you throw out a smash attack on a shield, or on something like a shield, you're just gonna get punished for it. Mm -hmm. You definitely have to be very, very careful. Sonic, a little bit less punchable, he's got some awesome fast moves, as it turns out, but they are definitely punchable if you hit back and find the new players do like to take their sweet time with these picks and bans, but in the end, it looks like we are going to be going to Pokemon Stadium 2 for our third and final game of the first set. Yeah, I... We talked about how Pokemon Stadium 2, we make the joke about how it's like a neutral stadium, but honestly, in this type of matchup, I really think this is neutral stadium. I don't think this stadium really gives their player an advantage. Yeah, I think both of these characters 
do very similar things. They both like to play with a lot of space. They both like to run back to the edge of the stage and charge up some zoning move against their opponents. First time it is the Nash. For Zelda, it is that Phantom, it is that Jin's Fire. So the stage really benefits and detracts from both players in very similar ways. The one thing it doesn't have is those platforms acting as ceilings. The platforms on this stage are relatively high up, and they're pretty thin, so Zelda has a much harder time just standing under them and limiting Waffle to make sure. But, that being said, LK playing really, really great in its first stock finds a lead very early. That was such a clean read on the jump from ledge, and you know, Zelda's aerials, we talked about how punishing they are, it, especially if you get the strong hit of that move, it is so powerful. Sonic, a very light character, uh, definitely in the bottom third of the cast, but can afford to go deep on edge guards just like that. Yeah, Sonic, really great hovery, a high jump and an up speed gives him a vertical distance, so he can go deep on that area, move that just fine, even things up, and now it's awful taking the lead once again, but a great lightning kick. That lightning kick did something like 25%. Yeah, it, it is, is so dangerous when you land the strong hitbox. For sure, but both players really just finding all bits of chip damage on the second shot. Both finally take all those or break out for themselves. A couple spin back hits, just a couple phantom hits traded it back and forth, and it's a small 20% lead in Waffle's favor. Nobody's blowing anything out of the water quite yet. Waffle's trying to catch Chon to LK's recovery, but LK is doing a little bit better job of mixing it up. You know, we saw he still likes to recover to center stage, but he's starting to, you know, go for ledge a little bit more and then just kind of thaw out there and see what uh, option Waffle's going for. Yeah, Waffle did when he sees the he's coming through. He gets hit by so many when, like, either you are going to get hit, you get punished for it, or you aren't, and then you have plenty of time to react. Like, you're a Sonic. You can run over and punish the Zelda who misses up to you, but if you get hit, you need to be ready. Good catch there on the forward tilt, and here's one of the things for Sonic's ledge trap ability. Waffle hasn't had a whole lot of success with it, and uh, once again, LK able to find a way out of the corner. Yeah, LK able to make it out, but it's looking pretty scary for him. He needs to find this kill. This back throw needs to kill, but Zelda relatively heavy in that back throw from center stage, not even close. And this 10% on Waffle doesn't mean a lot now, but if he can't close out this stock, it's just going to keep getting worse for him. He can't find the kill move. You can see he's hunting for it too now. He's looking for any kind of opening, trying to read the movement of LK. And LK is just kind of playing reactionary to it, saying, okay, you think I'm going to be here? Nope, this is actually my option. Yeah, and that's what we talked about at the start, right? Sonic is a character who needs to find these kills off of pretty hard reads. He has a really easy time racking up percent, but once your opponent is in this 150, 160 range, your throw combos aren't going to work, and it's going to need to be a raw hit that you just completely call out your opponent with, or else you're not going to find it. Yeah, something I'm looking for here, we really haven't seen Waffle go for a lot of grabs. Now, out of Spin Dash, you can't grab, so that makes sense, and that's been Waffle's main approach option. But I would like to see him, you know, go for a grab, you know, instead of something, you know, where he uses it as a ledge trap. Go for it in neutral. Go for something like a Tomahawk. Yeah, you need to find some opening. I will say, the one thing in Waffle's favor is, while he hasn't been able to find this kill on LK, he has not taken very much damage himself, and I guess it's a little bit of a caster's case. He has not taken a little bit of, of much of damage himself. He was sitting at 20% while he racked 100% onto LK. Now, at only 48, things are relatively even, but ooh, a big reversal string from Waffle puts a dangerous amount of percent on the LK, and LK is looking poised to actually bring Yukon the lead out the gate. And that's the thing too, is that LK got this advantage off of two stray hits. Waffle mm -hmm. overextended twice, and now he's down a full 120%. Absolutely. It is such a punishing matchup when you find your strengths, when you find your combos, and there is that Nairu's love stuffing out the undisjointed approaches that Sonic is forced to use. 
Ooh, ooh this could be I big. Think he he goes jump. for it all. Can he even make it back to stage? I think he can. Oh, man. Maybe Nintendo what won't, though. Disconnect. Oh, contest. man. Oh, That was such man. a huge edge guard. Oh, what do we that's even tragic. do? Wait, that could have actually gone either way. Um, uh, Do we replay one stock? Do we replay the game? I'm so confused. Like, I can't call that for either player. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll see what the result was after the match. Oh, no. Oh, Waffle DC'd, I see. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh. I, I mean, I guess Waffle DC'd, so we are going to be giving the win over to Yukon's LK. I think we're going to count that as a one-stock victory because his opponent lost connection. So we're going to get a rules clarification. I think we're going to throw it to a quick break while we look for some rules clarifications. We'll be back in just a few minutes and we'll keep you posted.
Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. After some careful review, we have decided to award the one point victory over to LK. Uh, the main deciding factor being that it was Waffle who disconnected. LK had such a huge advantage and it was his opponent who disconnected means that it couldn't have been anything scummy going on with like closing out your router from some disadvantaged position so it, it felt pretty safe to give it over to lk and now that does leave us at one to one or uh, a double one stock for lk and a two stock for waffle meaning lk will take the set uh four points to two giving university of connecticut a two point lead out the gate which is very impressive considering how strong Sienna's performances have been and how weak UConn's have been, it's really, really important for them to come out with an early lead in this matchup, even if it is only two points. Yeah, and uh, I mean, unfortunate way to end the first set. I mean, there's no other way to go about it. No one likes when someone disconnects. It's, it's mm -hmm. tragic. But results are as they are. And so for UConn, this is a big, you know, first game for them to take this early lead against, you know, we talked about it, a Siena team that's really been consistent week in and week out. Yes, yeah, Siena has been really good, but Waffle has not really been the care. We've seen X-Roy, Knight, and Pango putting in a lot of the work for the team, especially X-Roy. He has been absolutely insane uh, recently. He's been popping off for the team, so we'll have to see what happens moving forward. And uh, we need to get the next round of players in the lobby, but I'm going to be honest, I feel kind of scummy sending it to a break all of a sudden. I feel like we just ended, but I actually do have word the players are in the lobby, so we should be getting into it pretty soon. So looks like we are going to sit around Bivers, I feel like I see Bivers play every week, and I never remember who he plays. Yeah, Bivers is one of the more consistent players of uh, of this lineup, and uh, I believe he also played last year. This isn't the Shulk player, but uh, is he? if I remember correctly, I think Unless Knight it, plays Shulk, right? Uh, yeah, I think Knight is the Shulk player. But sure. Bivers, uh, you know, one of the consistent faces of this team. I believe he's typically like worth two points at, at least a, a set mm -hmm. for them. So. Uh, this is another, you know, heavy hitter, and UConn, we'll see what they bring up. Do you remember who Bivers plays? No, but I don't. Uh, I'm trying We're to both go afflicted. through... We see him, like, every week. He's, like, always I... playing. He's this literally is played every week. Sienna, but, yeah, I, I, I played... In... I played against him last year, I'm pretty sure. Uh -huh. And I'm pretty sure he destroyed me. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm bad at the game. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, this Sienna team, it, it, there's no shortage of talent, and Bivers oh, is, for sure. is, you know, I, I keep harping on the point, mm -hmm. but, I mean, when there's no shortage of talent on the team, like, you can't go wrong, right? Yeah, and uh, Wukong, for the side of the University of Connecticut, uh, I would be happy, I would be amused if he were to play Donkey Kong, or Diddy Kong. <laughs> However, I'm not positive. Well, regardless, uh, we did mention before the uh, this game is important in terms of standings. You know, Sienna to fall behind early, off to a rough start. But I mean, this is an important game for them. They win this game, they lock up that number one seed in the MAC conference. UConn, if they get this win here, they dodge that that Big East bullet of DePaul. Mm -hmm. So this is a big game. It is indeed. We need to see what comes of it. We have some bands on screen coming out from the two teams. We see Smashville, Town and City, and Final Destination are the bands so far. We'll have to see where we end up going for the game itself. And it looks like the pick is going to be Battlefield here. Yeah. Uh... You know, classic triplat. Uh, can't go wrong with Battlefield, in my opinion. Uh, you know, this char this stage often helps characters that have a lot of combo ability that love to you know abuse jumps and catch landings. But uh, we'll we'll just have to see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, we will indeed have to see how it goes. As we hear that ready in the background, the players are getting into game here, and we have Falco. That's what it was. Oh my god. I can't believe I can remember that. 
Bivers playing Falco going up against Wukong on the Bowser. Not quite Donkey Kong, but he is still that big, heavy hitter. Yeah, uh, this is a very strange matchup. Uh, I've played a little bit of Falco, and the one thing about Falco is that his multi-hits make this character very obnoxious, but Bowser, you know, being that tanky heavy, can survive long enough uh, against, even against all these multi-hits. So even though the percents, uh, the percents are going to be a little misleading. Wukong is going to be down for most of the game, but this is the por part of the game that's going to be important. Can Bivers connect moves like that up tilt going to be... Uh, you know, like you said, super clean. Up tilt going to be super important in this matchup. Wukong, when he is down, that's going to be his time to really shine, you know, when Falco stops connecting moves. Bivers is just playing this so well. We haven't seen Wukong find any big openings. He's only really gotten percent off stray hits, and this is the battlefield combos that Falco can do. Wukong probably not doing his scouting against Bivers if he left Triplats open. You have to, have to ban those against a Falco player. He can do some absolutely insane things. And now we see Bivers already up two stocks to one in this matchup where the Bowser is probably pretty uh, unfavored. These lasers make neutral so hard. Yeah, it's hard for Bowser to find a way in, but if he does, Falco's a pretty light character, definitely in the bottom third of the cast in terms of weight. Uh, so finding a good strong hit somewhere at this percent will probably close it out, likely from anywhere. Yeah, those, uh, yeah, those hollow do bones it. do not help Falco with that gravity. But that being said, it is still a very good lead for Bivers here, and he has such great tools in the matchup. The forward air will trade with almost anything due to Bowser not having disjoints. The back air is one of the few moves in the game that really can reliably kill a Bowser. So there's so many things Falco has going for him, aside from just the lasers that make playing neutral feel so much better against this big, heavy character who wants to just approach you and eat them to the face over and over again. Yeah, but here's the other thing. The tough guy armor of Bowser, mm -hmm. you know, really coming in clutch there. A couple times you see him throw out that smash attack and just armor through the multi-hits. He'll take a little bit of percent for it, but it's absolutely worth it if he connects the smash attack. It is absolutely worth it. And now, 84% on Bowser being so heavy means he, Wukong is still sitting pretty decently out of kill range unless a double down air comes through for Bivers. Oh my god. Falco's down air, I swear, is the most satisfying move to hit. It's Just so listen good. to the sound of it. Bam, oh, and then drop down. Oh, the drop zone dare is just so satisfying. And, uh, I mean, great stuff to Bivers. That, that looked Absolutely. very commanding. And that's such a huge momentum swing, too, to finish the set in a fashion like that. It certainly is. And not just that stock, every stock that Bivers took looked so good, carrying Wukong all the way off stage, catching his jump, not letting him make it back. And then this stock, this first, the first stock was just really great with a uh, up tilt to back air confirm, incredibly clean by Bivers, incredibly well played. It was looking like it was going to be a three stock for a while there, but it was Wukong able to even up the stock count not quite. Yeah. Hey, um, where do you think he's going to take this Falco as Bowser? I... Hmm. I don't know. I think that... Uh, he would probably want to go to a, a stage like... Let's see, if, if Smashville and Yoshi's story are banned, he's probably looking at either Town or uh, PS2, I, I think. I wouldn't go to an FD or a Lilat just because uh, they're kind of... Well, not mm -hmm. FD as much. Lilat, I feel like the Blast Zones are too close. Bowser's going to have much more survivability there than Falco. D... Uh, Landing on either of these characters is is bad news. I feel like that's too much of a double-edged sword. Kalos could be good. Uh, 
especially since Falco gets wall jumps, so he might like that stage. It would also give him space to throw out more and more lasers. Yeah, the, the Bowser is uh, kind of anything. Oh, right. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> my, I I completely uh, mi mixed up my my team yeah. there. Yeah, uh, no. Well, I like this ban on Yoshi's. That's very important. We can't yes. go back to Battlefield because of DSR, so banning out Yoshi's is very, very important. And then the other ban being on Smashville, I think is also pretty good. It makes it hard to approach Falco from above, as well as that platform being omnipresent to extend combos. And we see the pick being Battlefield. You take away any platforms from the Falco. He can't get those insane up air strings on you. The other side of it being he is enabled to throw even more lasers. But if you just walk and shield for a little bit, it's hard for the Falco to stop that on FD against the Bowser. So as long as you play it smart, I think it is a good stage where you can really maintain a lot of stage control as Wukong on the Bowser. And on top of that, this is the type of stage that kind of forces Falco to come to you, right? There's only so many places you can go on FD. Mm, exactly. So if he just, you know, forces Falco to approach him, that's exactly the type of playstyle that Bowser's love, right? They just love to camp and shield and up be out of it. And that, I mean, it racks up so much percent. And against Falco, you know, if you take away all the space that he has to work with outside of lasers, he really doesn't have any other options than to approach. Now, Falco has tools to get in with, but mm -hmm. against Bowser, it's so scary to utilize them. Yeah, Falco is really a boxer. He doesn't have amazing ways to get in, but once he is in, he absolutely excels in this medium range combat as we see straight out the gate, 69% being put onto Wukong put a great flame breath, instantly even things back up. Yeah, it's going to be very volatile. Ooh, oh he wanted God. the down so air. Good. Really, really great attempt from Wukong. We see the great boxer game and Bivers feeling himself a little bit too hard, going for some really ambitious down airs, throwing away some of his stage positioning and eating an off stage fair means it's actually Wukong with that rage getting the early lead, but immediately answered back by Bivers. I like the adaptation by Wukong to throw out more forward airs. Bowser's forward air is so good, it covers so much space. It's practically like Ganon forward air in terms of how much space it covers. It just it hits a little weaker. But, you know, if you use it sparingly in edge guard situations, it's so powerful. Bivers really has to, it's too predictable. Wukong is really adapted. He's going for those early uppies every time, and we have to see if maybe next time Bivers just stands on stage and charges an F smash. Yeah, Bivers uh, has to be very careful with his recoveries because Bowser has so many tools, and he's starting to catch on too with these recoveries. I mean, both of these characters in disadvantage have fairly predictable recoveries, so it's pretty easy to read, and it's going to be such a bait and punish game. Oh, that's such a huge fire breath. Bivers didn't get the roll through, and he got clipped for so much percent off of it. And with the rage, the up tilt off the parry will even up the, or will not even up the stock, and give Wukong the lead. And now this counter pick is paying off so well for him, as he has a good chance of extra credit, but Bivers answers back immediately once again. Yeah, those conversions off of up tilt are so important to Falco players. I mean, it, it just racks up so much damage. It's it's his bread and butter. You have to have it down if you're going to play Falco. Absolutely. And now Bivers with a percent lead, but we've seen time and time again in this matchup, the percent lead has not mattered. It's only been about who finds that first stock kill on this stage. And it's been Wukong both times. But in disadvantage, oh, he wanted the drag down. That would have been the stock if he got it, but Wukong back in disadvantage. Ooh, good early up B to get out of there. Yeah, Wukong's just completely adapted and Bivers is not counter adapting. He keeps going for these drop zone aerials and he keeps getting punished for it over and over again. Now the percent back to even. Rage and weight favoring Wukong on the Bowser. It's looking good for him. The back air isn't going to kill, it's Bowser, he's too heavy, but at 98, the back air from the Bowser certainly would. Bowser without a jump, this is dangerous. Good lasers, this is the stock, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, as soon as those lasers connected, you knew exactly where, ba where Bowser was going to end up. 
absolutely great lasers from Bivers, realizing his opponent doesn't have the jump. There's no other way for Wukong to get back to stage. It's an absolutely free runoff down air at that point. Bivers does find it. He makes it happen. And now he takes the lead for Sienna. He brings them back into the point advantage. He earns five more points for his team, putting them at seven to four and having a three point lead. And the momentum starts to swing back the other way. You know, UConn, they took game one, but Sienna able to answer right back. It's a very, you know, back and forth through two games. This is a pivotal game three. It is an absolutely pivotal game three, and we have X-Roy coming in for it as well. One of the hard hitters from the Sienna lineup going up against Jimbo from University of Connecticut means that it is a pivotal point in the match, and Sienna is not messing around. They are putting in the big guns to try and close it out. Yeah, uh, and it should be good stuff. I mean, you know, we talked about how this lineup is filled with talent uh yukon you know they, it's the same way for them they they've got players that can play well but it's about bringing it all on the same day at this time so absolutely you know we'll just have to see how it goes and that being said we will have to see after a quick break while we get the players in and set up so we'll be back in just a few minutes stay tuned because this is a very important game for me coming up
Hello and welcome back, everybody. We are bringing you Game 3 between Siena College's Pango going up against Jimbo for the University of Connecticut. And Pango, the team captain, always a hard hitter whenever he comes in. Yeah, uh, and an important uh, point, uh, excuse me, point in the series because mm -hmm. this is a pivotal Game 3. If Siena gets this win here... Uh, this lead looks a whole lot more dangerous, and this is the chance for UConn to come back in the set. So, PS2 is the stage, and uh, I think we're ready to go. It is indeed that way. We are ready to go. We are going to be going to PS2, and we have Pango on the game and watch that he has put in so much work on going up against Jimbo on this Ridley that we've seen a pretty surprising amount of over the course of time in EGF. Yeah, this is a, another kind of strange matchup because it feels like, you know, Ridley should be a heavier character, but he's actually fairly light. Mm -hmm. And Game & Watch, a very light character, also can hit like a truck. So this is a very, you know, awkward matchup for both oh, with the dead. down smash. That's his yeah. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Pango, off to a quick start. Yeah, really quick start. Oh, no. Jimbo. Oh, the pain train. You can't make it back, can he? Oh, so, drift. so close. Him. Great drift from Jimbo. Really good to not up straight to the ledge, or he would have gotten clipped by that down smash. Well played, but despite all that, it was still for survival. He is still so far down and yet to find any actual openings for himself yeah and pango making every hit count you know connecting everything and it's so hard to approach mr game and watch and look at all the coverage pango's throwing out yeah it's absolutely smothering pressure from pango these bombs these aerials we've only seen stray hits from jimbo punishing maybe a laggy startup on an option we haven't seen any confirms any combos from Jimbo. His aggression has only ever been in response to something Pango has done, and we need to see him take the pace in his own hands. Ooh, and Jimbo's got to be very careful here. Not only is he up on uh, near death on his stock, there we go. Forward tilt gonna kill from the ledge there, but I was gonna say, both of these guys at kill percent, one good strong hit anywhere would Ooh. do it. And the down air connecting right before Me. the up he comes out, that was huge. Pango is playing so well here, a full stock ahead, finding the first combo of this stock matchup as well means he is going to start lapping his opponent and building up some really, really insane extra credit, looking poised to even go for a two stock here as he gets a stage spike, this could be a big ledge trap. Connects the Nair, finds the up there, but ooh, <gasps> dangerous, up B, back to stage, Jimbo playing this one. Uh, on a nice Pango's edge. goes feeling it. He just wants the clip right now. He is farming for nines. I don't know if it's going to come as Jimbo is getting really high in percent. Ooh. And the stage spike is almost going to do it. The key misses, which gives Jimbo an extra try at life. But at 121, he needs to close out this stock and save the point for his team. Yeah, this is a big stock for Jimbo if he can hold on to it. Ooh, nearly able to space around that down smash with his own. Yeah, but not quite. Now 157. The rage is actually built up enough that the up B will kill from center stage. And Panko really needs to close this out. And he does. Okay, it was no oh, he doesn't. It's it's looking scary with one max rage on Jimbo, on Ridley. When you're playing Game and Watch, it could be just a few more stray hits with Pango finally finds the up smash, secures the one stock victory, and earns another point for his team, extending their league and lead and taking Jimbo to game two, where it's going to be pretty do or die. That was such a huge win for Peg. I mean, Jimbo was at such a high percent, but for Jimbo to take that second stock and, you know, mitigate the damage was massive because really Absolutely. Jimbo was trapped in the corner that whole set for so... For him to keep it that close uh, keeps them alive in this, despite taking the loss. Yeah, very, very good showing from Jimbo. And on his counterpick, it's looking really good for him. I think 
if he goes to a stage that really favors him, we might see Jimbo take this next game. He was able to survive for so long on that last stock, and if he's just adapts to the matchup, keeps playing like that going forward, he could definitely make the run back happen and get uh get the set for himself. The issue that Jimbo kind of runs into in this matchup is that once he, you know, he really has plenty of kill power, mm -hmm. especially on a light character like Game & Watch, but he's going to get comboed for days. So even if he survives, he has to play so careful. It forces him to go in on Mr. Game & Watch, and Mr. Game & Watch has so many defensive options that at the end of that first, you know, game, you saw by the time it was back to a one-stock game, Jimbo's at 150% and he has to approach, which is not the situation you want to be in at all. Yeah, and the disadvantage is just so rough for Ridley in this matchup. Ridley has no good landing tools, and Game & Watch is one of the best characters in the game at sharking landings. The super disjointed neutral air, the up air is a projectile that sends you back up into the air to continue the string. He's got the up to chase you high. He just, he does so many things that make it so hard to land. And when Ridley already has a difficult time to land, it just makes it so much worse. Yeah, and I mean, on top of that, you think of how Ridley got his kills. It was off of, a, I believe, a forward smash and then the upbeat armoring through uh, Game & Watch projectiles. Yeah, the bacon. So it's, it's not easy for Ridley to get in at all on this character, but that's the difficulty of this matchup. That's the challenge that he has to overcome here. It is, and we'll have to see if Jimbo is able to make it happen or if Pango can clean things up because he started that game off incredibly clean. And if he's able to play like that more often, it could be a two stock coming up, maybe even a three if he really, really pulls it out on Jimbo. But that was only at the start. Toward the end, Jimbo was looking a lot better. It definitely looked like he was a little bit phased by the matchup and needed time to figure things out for himself. Right, and on top of that, we did see uh, Pango go get a little greedy, go for a couple nine hammers, yeah. didn't, didn't come to anything. But, I mean, for Jimbo to just survive that long after getting zero to death in the first stock, it was a huge adjustment for him. And it looks like we have word in from Jimbo. It looks like Kalos is going to be the pick for the Ridley, which makes some sense. I feel like it doesn't help you land, which is the biggest problem with the matchup. But what it does do is it gives you those close side blast zones. And we see a character switch from Pango. This is uh, interesting. We don't typically see a Diddy Kong on stream, so this will be interesting no. to see. Uh, I think this is the first Diddy Kong uh, in the EGF. Yeah, I don't think we've seen any. We'll have to see if it's clean. I don't think I've seen Pango play anything besides that Game & Watch so far, but we'll have to see if this Diddy Kong is practiced or if he's disrespecting his opponent a little bit because he was playing pretty disrespectful at the end of that first game. Now the other thing here, uh, there's two big important notes for Pango here. One, Diddy Kong gets wall jumps so he has an easier time recovering. Two, that banana toss, the initial toss when you press the input, that banana toss covers the upper platform. So yeah. it's not going to be easy for Jimbo to get out of disadvantage, okay. which is already a struggle for Ridley. Okay, but Pango is schmoovin' right now. Yeah. Diddy Kong is an incredibly mobile character, and Pango is using it perfectly. He is absolutely running circles around Jimbo. The side B movement, the wave lands even on the platform, Pango is playing so on point here. It's so hard to track, you know, characters like Diddy Kong who have so many movement options, even if you're, especially for a character Great like Ridley, who's so Jimbo. big, but yeah, I, that's the second stock that Jimbo's been able to take off these stray upbeats. I mean, that wasn't even stray. He like comboed into that upbeat. I've like never seen that. That was crazy. It's a, it's a move that's got some power behind it, but you don't think of it as like a type of kill option, right? Because it feels unsafe to use. Yeah, it's very laggy. It's very telegraphed, but... 
when your opponent's in the air like that and doesn't have any good option to get out of it, it can be very powerful. And I think Jimbo grabbed the banana there. Is that what happened? Maybe the side piece so. just too short, but either way, he does barely make it back. Good survive there on the uh, up smash. It's, it's you know, that high ceiling of Kalos. Oh, they're playing a dangerous oh, game. Man. The shield dance is on right now. It's definitely on. And at 151, Jimbo has to feel in danger. But with that rage on his side and 64% racked up on the pango, a solid hit could actually put Jimbo into the lead. And we'll have to see if he's able to find it or if pango can close things out. Whoa. Oh, that was there such a good read. Typically, I mean, this is a, a Ridley classic. The side B into a mash out into jab. A good uh, job cleaning up that stock there. But Jimbo on the read doesn't go for the jab. Instead, waits for Pango to do a defensive option mm -hmm. and uh, forward smashes. And Ridley's forward smash is one of the best in the game. It's really, really good. Pango, though, does clean it up immediately and gets the percent lead back in his favor. But... When Jimbo has hard reads like that in his repertoire, Pango cannot be comfortable. He cannot get loose and lazy. He needs to keep playing clean or else another forward smash like that could give the point back to Yukon. Ooh, good catch on the up smash now. How's he going to get out? Oh, he was oh, so punishable. greedy. Only a forward smash as a punish won't kill, which means you only need the percent for it, but... Ridley, relatively light, stuck at 122%, 130 now against this Donkey Kong means he can't be comfortable, but he's got the rage and we just saw what Ridley can do with that maxed out rage. It's going to be a tense last hit here. Ooh, this is, yeah, absolutely close. One back air, I think, from either of them will do it. Yeah, one smash, one solid aerial, the side beat even from Diddy Kong, almost killing. He doesn't, he hits the banana, but the trip follow-up isn't there. And it's Jimbo with a down smash who takes the stock and evens things up one to one in an absolutely insane game too. It was such a clutch moment from Jimbo to get out of the corner, survive the hit from the banana, the worst time to roll in. He hasn't rolled in all set. And yeah. Jimbo just says, okay, I got to cover as much space as possible. Down smash. <laughs> Absolutely. It pays off well for Jimbo, though, as uh, he takes the game. And now, do you think we're going to see Pango stick to this uh, Diddy Kong or go back to the game and watch? I, I, it's hard to say. I really liked watching the Diddy Kong, but uh -huh. I think you have to go with what works here and switch back to the game and watch. I agree. I think this game is too important to be pulling out your weird secondaries. And this, this secondary looks very practiced. Pango looks like he definitely really knew what he was doing on the Diddy Kong, but I would go back to the tried and true uh, game plan for him as well. And, I mean, the Diddy Kong, like, as practice as it looked, it was so close. That was just the thing, was he could not find a kill confirm. There was a moment there where it seemed like he was going to get the clip. Uh, he threw the banana, and then after throwing the banana, uh, Diddy Kongs will typically go for a down tilt, and it will either, you know, catch them and uh, reset them in that, uh, I forget what the, the state is knock called down. when they're just on, yeah, knockdown. Uh or, it, in that scenario, it would have sent him off the ledge in perfect position for a, dr a uh, drop zone dare. But mm -hmm. the timing is so key on that. A Wi-Fi, it's a, it's a lot harder. And at that percent, it was the, the window of opportunity was so mm -hmm. small. So I respect what he was going for. It's clearly a practice character, as you said, but unable to connect it. Yeah, we saw Pango at the very end actually hit the banana, but he read that uh, the jump would come out to dodge the banana from Jimbo. So he tried to cover that with a back air, but instead the banana connected and he wasn't there on the ground to punish it. So it's very, very unfortunate for Pango how that last final interaction played out for him. And right now we are just chilling, waiting as Jimbo thinks hard about his bands. 
and uh, I don't blame him. This is such an important match. If University of Connecticut wins this, they will at minimum tie things back up for themselves going in to the final two games of the set. They are a team that only has one win under their belt. And if they're able to get a win on the number two team in the league, that would be absolutely huge for them. Yeah, a loss here for Siena would open the door to so many teams for that number one seed, especially in the MAC. The MAC is a very uh, top-heavy division where mm -hmm. or a conference where the top teams are are stacked at the top, and then the the bottom has you know only a handful of wins. So everyone outside of first place is just you know next door neighbors. Absolutely, and it's going to be town and city as the pick for Pango here. The counter pick. I think that means we're going to see the Game & Watch come back out. The up B can allow them to cover a lot of platforms. The Nair height as well means that a lot of the stage transformations are very beneficial for that game and watch here. Yeah, I I wouldn't be shocked to see, Ooh. okay, well, uh, hey. how about a third character instead? I guess so, yeah. We see Pokemon Trainer come out for Pango going against this Ridley. And he's just digging deep into his pockets. He doesn't want to go with what's tried and true. He wants to win and he wants to win on his own terms, playing what he wants to. As we get into game three. So I've seen this type of matchup plenty of times, and I feel like it's always different, not just because, you know, Pokemon trainers have so much variety, but I feel like I've seen it go both ways where the Pokemon trainer just absolutely destroys Ridley or Ridley just three stocks Pokemon trainers. And so I'm kind of curious to see how this one plays out. I think that the Pokemon Trainer should definitely be advantage. I feel like at the low percent, Squirtle has so much more mobility than Ridley. At the mid percent, the disjoints from Ivysaur are incredibly powerful. And at high percent, uh, Charizard just has that extra survivability he needs just like that against the Ridley. So I feel like it is a good matchup for the Pokemon Trainer, and the onus is on Jimbo to play it properly. But Pango, I mean, how warmed up on three different characters can you be coming off of playing Game & Watch and then uh, Diddy Kong, and now he has to play a character who's three different characters in one? It feels like it's very hard, and even the first stock only comes off of Jimbo going too low and not Pango finding an aggressive play. Oh, he nearly got the stop. I was gonna say, here's something that Pango's doing now that's absolutely oh clutch, is God. Pango's use of back air. We did not see either of these players use back air in game two, and Pango's connected four or five, including <gasps> gonna take the stock, and he wanted the clip so Pango badly. Is really just playing the farm clips right now. Oh my god. We saw him go for a dare at 0% earlier as well, and he missed that, and the back throw to Flare Blitz is not going to connect either, but Jimbo getting dragged off stage by the Squirtle going to a Pango SDs gives another stock over. He is absolutely confident in his team, in the rest of his lineup, to clutch it out. He knows that Sienna is a top, top team, and UConn has been struggling, but he does take it finally in a one stock, earning four more points in total for his team, but losing one over to Jimbo. He increases his team's lead by three. The scoreline now being, what is it, 11 to five, I believe, as we prepare for game four, and it's University of Connecticut really on the back foot. Yeah. Uh, really good stuff there at the end. Pango, you know, really showing how practice he is, how versatile of a player he is to have all these characters and all these matchups down again. And the other thing, too, that I wanted to mention here was that uh, Pango's adaptation throughout the set. You know, Jimbo really, he adapted well throughout games one and two to make the set closer and closer. So for Pango to come back and you know, make the adjustments himself. 
is is really clutch. Yeah, and it's it's so hard to adjust to that Pokemon trainer because there's so much variety inherent to the character. So it it does make it really hard. But props to Jimbo for keeping it that close. A really great performance from him. Earning a point back is incredibly important. It keeps their team much more strongly in the running. And uh, we're going to throw it to another very short break as we wait for the players to get in and get everything set up. We'll be back in just a few moments.
Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. We are getting into this absolutely pivotal game four between Xeroy on this banjo who he has been playing and putting some great showings on up against MC on the Rob. Yeah, and uh, we've seen this matchup a couple times before, and it's uh, a strange one to say the least. Both of these characters love their pro use of uh, projectiles, but both of them also have a few boxing tools as well. Yeah, uh, Banjo is an incredibly well-rounded character. He's got very strong tools for that mid-range boxing fight. He's got the Wonder Wing, he's got the back air, the forward air, all of his aerials are just really, really great for that, but he can play this longer range projectile zoning game with those uh, pellets and that grenade. Rob as well, the gyro, the laser, and then just the incredible aerials, the solid fire disjoints make him very solid at very similar things to what Banjo does. The one key difference being in recoveries, Rob's recovery is much, much better. It has many more mix-ups to it than Banjo's, who's is fairly restricted in linear. Yeah, Zeroy and Disadvantage is going to be in a world of trouble. Like you said, his, uh, his recovery options are very limited, but Wonder Wing always important to watch out for and it takes the first stock yeah really really great wondering from zeroy tanks a hit with that armor it has and keeps going finds the first stock and now a big opportunity for extra credit we'll have to see if he's able to make any use of it the wonder Wing gets him back to stage but under that platform that up throw will certainly even up the stock out now only 28 percent as a lead is very insignificant it's already only down to 10. yeah and uh good stuff there uh knowing <clears throat> excuse me that off a grab uh or that a grab at that percent will kill rob rob's grabs are so powerful but it's so hard for him to really go in and get them so look for his uses that forward smash was dangerous that was very very close to being the stock gone right there unfortunately x-ray just barely mistimes it but 50 percent in the lead he has to be feeling comfortable but a great punish on the wonder wing will even things up a little bit here you saw Rob got a grab, but instead went for the uh, up throw mix up right there. You typically you'll see Rob's go for down throw once they get it because it grounds you and it's so easy to combo off of that. But I do kind of like the mix up. It's uh, making Zoroy think a little more. Yeah, the one problem is it might be scaling that up throw a little bit. We saw MCC go for another one right there as well. And when it is a kill tool, it's how we saw him get that first stock off of Zoroy. It's important to keep it looking fresh. But here is the confirm off the down throw. Reading the mash timing and finding the up smash. That is not guaranteed. You have to make that as a read. Oh no, the second air dodge. He wanted to uh, air dodge and, and then up be out of it. But the lag of, of that move ends up taking that second stock. But an important third stock here. Very, very important third stock here. Yukon really, really needs MCC to win this to keep them in. In fact, I think if MCC loses by basically any margin, Yukon will be eliminated. And even now, the down B getting the kill screen, but not actually killing. MCC, though, really, really clean, clean keeping this ledge trap going, building a 100% lead over x and still in disadvantage. Yeah, this is really tough. This is what we were talking about. Banjo's recovery options. You're either going straight sideways or straight up. And uh, either way, it's easy for Rob to punish. It is very, very easy. Now, 179 on Banjo. I'm surprised he hasn't died yet, honestly. Is Rob has really great kill power in his aerials. But either way, the up smash sharking the movement closes it out. And MCC... Earns a point back for his team and looks to put himself on set point. And if he wins this set, Yukon could look to make a big upset happen. Yeah, I mean, this was such an important 
set for UConn as we as we talked about. But really, the telltale sign here was what we talked about from the beginning: is once Banjo was in disadvantage, what could Zeroy do? Uh, Rob has. Cer- True. I mean, we talked about uh, the last time Rob was on stream was his ledge trap capability is one of his best tools. And if Banjo only can recover one of two ways, it's pretty easy to predict uh, predict which way he's going to go. Yeah, Banjo, a very poor recovery, and Rob's ledge trapping being probably the best in the game. We even saw one of the stocks that MCC lost was off of an SD, so just really cleanly played. It looked like X-Roy could not find his footing at almost any point in that game except that first stock where he did have an early advantage and now the pressure is going to be on x-roy to make the counter pick happen and to keep his team in the set to keep their lead and alleviate some pressure from knight's shoulders who will be the last player for the seattle lineup yeah and for x-roy it it seemed that really the key for him uh in this matchup if he's going to really struggle and disadvantage he has to win neutral and winning neutral against rob isn't the hardest thing to do but because banjo has all the tools that he needs when there's so much space given between the two of them it can be you know kind of a struggle it definitely can be and we didn't see that much zoning game going on from either of the players. I think there were some points where Exeroy tried to set up some solid projectiles. Uh, He tried to put out some grenades and throw them, but uh, MC was just not having any of it. He kept approaching, he kept the pressure on, and made it really, really hard for Exeroy to keep him out. Yeah, and in theory, Rob wins the, the projectile war, right? The grenade goes away, the gyro stays on stage, the laser can cut through most of uh, Banjo's projectiles. So it's kind of hard for Banjo to really space out and win that battle. So he has to find a way to go in. He has to, but he can't. We saw it time and time again, every time x was trying to approach It was MCC stuffing it out a lot of the time, and then he turned stuffing it out into sending him off stage and being off stage into a ledge trap, and then just snowballed from there. And that last stock, he built like a 150% lead before taking it and closing out the game. And now we're going to be going to Smashville, which is a stage that might not solve too many of the problems. That one central platform might honestly make it even harder to approach. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious, too. We also didn't really see x go for any grabs. I, I can't mm-hmm. think of any time that Banjo really got a grab. And he has the same similar uh, grab setups as Rob, right? The down throw grounds you, and you can connect it to an up air or an up smash. He's got a uh, back throw that can kill at higher percents. And uh, his up throw is That's isn't... a big character switch, though. Oh, yeah. No, that... Yeah, and... Uh... I don't know about this one because this like it. just seems like it. It, it, it does it does make sense in terms of survivability and uh, in terms of uh, you know racking up damage. But I feel like Rob has all the tools that he needs to really you know put Bowser away in disadvantage. I agree, but I don't feel like there's that much that Banjo does that Bowser doesn't do in this matchup. And I feel like the things that both characters do well, Bowser will do better. The one difference being not having that wonder wing might make getting through the wall out from Rob that much harder. And on top of that, on a uh, on a stage like this where the the platform is much smaller, it's gonna force more you know uh, up close interactions. Where Bowser is definitely more uh, fit for that style of play, whereas Banjo has you know the projectiles to use. Yeah, I agree, but. At 150, this Bowser with max rage might honestly just be looking to kill MCC. He He's up 70%, but he still has to be so scared at the ledge because anything like a forward smash or even a good forward air could take the stock, but the rage is now off the table as MCC finds the up air that he needs to even things up, or not even things up, to give himself the lead. And he has a lot of time to start working on extra credit, but 
a clean Nair back air will deny that opportunity. That's such a nice confirm too, right? The, the multi-hit of Nair just sets you up perfectly for that back air. And now Zeroy on the chase down. Yeah, Zeroy really, really looking for it. Not able to find too much, but having the percent lead as Bowser feels great. You expect to take a lot of hits and fall behind in percent, but be the one to close out the stock first. So if you keep the stocks even or even have a lead, it feels so amazing on this Bowser pick. And the percent's being pretty even here too. This uh, is going to be tough for MC to get out of the corner. It is, yeah. When we saw last game was all about uh, Zeroy being stuck in the corner, and now I feel like more often it's MCC being stuck at the ledge, being scared to come back on stage. And a great Bowser bomb is going to give the lead to Saroy, and that big heavy weight will keep him alive from that back air as well. The other thing we talked about between character, or we should mention between character switches, Bowser's kill setups are far easier than Banjo's. Banjo, you Absolutely. need to grab or you need to land a read. Bowser has so many more moves that you can just kind of throw out, and if they land, they've got so much power behind them, they can clean up stocks. I completely agree, like that back air, looking very scary for MCC, 44%, he really, really needs to take the stock soon, or else this extra credit is going to be insurmountable. Bowser's just so heavy, it's so hard to kill him that if this next stock, if third stock for Zeroy goes to 190 as well, I don't see MC winning. That, that was, uh, I like the mix up there for MC to try and recover, but uh, Zoro Zoroy just kind of read it and said, okay, you have to land using something, right? And uh, was able to parry it. Ooh, good spacing on the back air, though. Back air critical. Finally closing out the stock. 92% already racked up onto MCC, though. Means it's going to be so, so hard. You need to get 150 onto this Bowser before you're really threatening to kill him. It's such a long road of playing nearly perfect for MCC, but it starts like this. Bowser still has his jump by five. Oh, oh my it. goodness! Oh my god. MCC, I didn't even see that he sharked the jump away from x ray but he had to have. That up he wouldn't have made it back to stage. He saved him only to kill him right after an MCC cleans up a clean one stock victory in the end there with a great gimp. And now 11 to nine is Sienna's advantage over University of Connecticut. Two points separate the two teams, which means it all comes down to Knight versus Almorax. We came into this thinking it would be one-sided, thinking Senna's number two. They're trying for number one. University of Connecticut so far down, they don't stand a chance, but their lineup has absolutely impressed me so far. And it all comes down to game five. And remember, if Sienna loses, it's so bad with how densely packed the top of this league is. Yeah, it's absolutely massive if Sienna were uh, to fall here. And great stuff to MC to keep them alive. Just awareness to realize that Bowser's out of options and he has to up B early and to go back you know he's burned his up B right so that up B is is very hard to utilize properly right you have to kind of space it out and maneuver around with it using other moves mm -hmm. and so the awareness to immediately jump back up with it and use side B again knowing that would clean up the stock was so clean by MC absolutely and we'll have to see if Almorex coming in last for Yukon can clean it up, can take home the victory for them. Knight going to try and make sure that can't happen in just a few moments as we come back from break for this pivotal game five. Stay tuned, you cannot miss it.
Hello everyone and welcome back to game five between Siena College, the hard favorites going into the matchup, going against University of Connecticut. We have night for Siena going up against Almorax and we're going to be getting into game in just a second here. Remember, two points separate the two teams, which means it's all going to come down to these last two players. It's almost guaranteed that whoever wins this set right here will take home the victory for their team. And out the gate, it is Almorax on this Bowser going up against Shulk in what has to be a favorable matchup for the Sienna player. Yeah, Knight uh, Shulk is infamous here on stream. It is one of the most consistent performers of the Sienna lineup, and Shulk's sword just covers so much space, and it's going to be absolutely, you know, uh, it's so oh, hard for Bowser to get in. Look at, yeah, the speed is going to work here. We saw an early lead for Almorex, but Knight trying to clean up with the speed not Actually great evasive gameplay from Almorex though. Keeping the losses, the damage to a minimum. And now both these players relatively even percent great spot dodge from Almorex. He's playing it so well. And I think a Knight is getting a little bit too antsy trying to approach when he doesn't have to. He can just make Almorex on this Bowser approach him through this giant sword hitbox when it's so difficult, but he keeps going in, getting punished, and the up tilt gives Almorex the early lead, and uh, at only 92%, it's funny to say, Bowser's not really near kill percent. Yeah, I mean, even with Smash Monado, you might be able to land a good strong hit and take this stock, but it's already gone, and Almorex, caught in disadvantage, has to find a way to out of this corner. Yeah, that's going to be the biggest thing on the matchup, is that trying to get out of disadvantage on Bowser against Shulk with that drop zone fair, with the amazing ledge trapping, is going to be incredibly difficult. But that being said, Almorex has been making it work so far, but Knight really cleaning up his gameplay, finding these great retreating fairs, baiting Almorex in. Almorex has to be very careful of utilizing his jumps because Knight... You know, any Shulk player loves to space their aerials. They're constantly jumping. So for Almorex, any jump, him getting caught out is super dangerous. Mm -hmm. This Boston Monado was potentially huge, but Almorex actually finding three great hits right at the end of the timer is going to bring percent back to even now. Smash Monado with rage is something you have to be very scared of as Almorex, and there it is, Knight takes the lead here, two stocks to one, but it's answered back immediately by the up tail, and now it's zero to zero, last stock game one. This is huge stuff. Almorex, he's been trying to play so carefully and weave around Knight and his aerials, but you know, if he gets put in disadvantage once, it's just so difficult for him to get out of it. Good forward smash out of two. the corner. A second oh one! Oh my god, two Buster Monado forward smashes puts Knight at 71. It's a disaster for the Shulk as he's sent off stage. He needs to get back on past this Bowser, but Almorax getting too antsy with the forward smashes can't find it. The Bowser bomb almost breaks the shield, and there no it is! No way! Oh, but he still alive! And that shield armor is going to be huge. Immediately switching off into speed, though, he needs yeah. to rack up some percent here. He needs to rack up percent. He needs to find the kill. 122 on Smash with Rage means it's going to be a next big hit in the drop zone fair with Jump Monado in an absolutely crazy game one. Goes just barely in Knight's favor. The lead 13 to 9. Almorax needs to win the next two games to clutch it out for UConn. And even because that one point went the way of Sienna. Oh, sorry, 12 tonight. Oh my God. Yeah, it's it's completely on Almrex. Whoever wins this set wins the game and Knight is one game away. That was such a fast paced set too. Like I feel like a minute didn't even go by. But that's just kind of the nature of this specific type of matchup on FD, where, you know, they're forced to go into each other. These are two characters that love to be in each other's face, and Knight just did a very good job of cleaning up edge guards. That's one of the things that Shulk players, you have to do 
is when you have a character off stage, especially a character like Bowser, whose recovery is abysmal, you have to be able to clean up stocks. And you see the instant recognition at the end of the set to instantly switch to jump art, knowing that it's going to give him that little bit of extra distance to go out there and swing that forward air to secure the final stock of the game. Yeah, Shulk players love their drop zone fares. It's such an incredibly powerful tool on that character, and we see why right there. And now, looking to the future, looking to the picks and the bands, I think Almorax on this Bowser wants to take Knight to the smallest stage possible. We saw Knight get so much value out of retreating fares and retreating nares. You want to limit the space he can run away to as much as possible. Yeah, spacing going to be huge, uh, as you've mentioned. I would be interested to see if... Uh... He'll probably avoid triplats though, because the the swords is just going to cover too much space. Even though the platform would give him, you know, a, a different recovery option possibly if he wants to try and recover high. That's not really Bowser's strength. Yeah. This this matchup is very much spacing oriented. You saw mm -hmm. the second that Knight missed space to move, Almorax was already over it. Yeah, and it's going to be Lilat as the pick, which I really like. It's a relatively small claustrophobic space that doesn't give Shulk a lot of space to run around. The fire on the stage is really, really powerful, and these platforms are low enough that Bowser can always cover them with basically anything he wants to do. On top of that, recovering underneath the stage using that like slant to throw a hitbox up top is going to be so pivotal because both characters can do it. Absolutely, and already it's an early lead going Almorex's way. We saw some bust hits come through, but it wasn't enough to even things up. And this speed bonato feels great, but there's just there's not a lot of space to run through to really get full value out of it on a stage like Lila. Yeah, great job too by Almorex to uh, burn most of Knight's smash art mm -hmm. there using that fire break. Yeah, really great. And importantly, we saw Almorax go under the drop zone there. Really great awareness. And now, finding that Bowser bomber, as long as he can wait out this Smash Monado, at 94%, Bowser's going to have 30, 40 more percent in the bag bank, where he's not in danger of dying. And all of that percent is going to be time to build your lead overnight. Yeah, Almorax getting, ooh, good stuff there by Knight to go out there and secure that forward air stock. But Almorax getting a little greedy going for a down B. That down B is not going to be easy to land because of the positioning of these platforms. Yeah, I agree. And ooh, Shulk in disadvantage with Buster. Not where you want to be. He's able to make it. Oh my god, that fire. Could have dealt so much damage to Buster Rado. Knight switches off knowing this is not his time. And the oh. armor from the forward smash gives a full stock lead to Almorax when he needs it most. That tough guy armor is disgusting. It feels like it shouldn't be this good, but it is so pivotal. And now there's so little percent on this Bowser. There's so much time to rack up extra credit onto Knight, and Knight knows it. He goes for the greedy air, but finds nothing. Almer Rex trying to find his way out of the corner gets grabbed for it. Ooh, yeah, Knight is really trying to secure the stock early because he knows any percent now is just going to be so massive. Yeah, but he keeps getting punished for it. Only 46%. It could be much worse. Great, oh, the tech great tech. tech by Almerax. He's back on stage, and now it's a huge lead trap scenario. The getup attack saves Knight, though. But once again, we're back here. 60% already on tonight's last stock, and he's still not finding the kill. I'm actually surprised that forward smash did not kill, but Bowser... Oh, oh he's in this smash! Is big. There it is. Smash Monado. Remember, Schultz Monados go both ways, and Almorax seals out a two stock victory with that Bowser bomb grab. And now it all comes down to game three. It is game set point. It is match point for the two teams. And I could not have expected it to come to this when we first started out the match. Yeah, this is absolutely massive if Almorex can uh, clean this up. It would be such a huge upset for the conference overall. But I just want to talk about 
Almerex didn't use side B for most of that set, and even when he did, it was just kind of a whiffed grab, right? So it really was inconsequential. So for him to get that kill in in this set, right? I mean, is it two, that was a two stock, right? That was, yeah, that was a massive stock, swing. Yeah. It was absolutely gigantic. I mean, even game one was absolutely down to the wire. And now Almerex coming out with a two stock on his counter pick, mind you. We are going to be going to Knight's counter pick here, but it still looks very, very good for Almerex as we are going to be going to Smashville, which ha it feels like it has a very similar dynamic to Lila in that it's a very claustrophobic small stage with low platforms. So I think Almerax is pretty happy about where his opponent is taking him. Yeah, I I tend to agree, but I also think that this is the type of stage where uh, the rich get richer, right? As soon as one of them's in disadvantage, it's gonna be hard to get out of either way. Absolutely, but like, look at how small this stage is. Like, what do you do with speed Milano on Smash Bros? Two forward airs and your opponent's already back off stage. You can't keep chasing them down, but a great little buster string is gonna put 65% on Almorax, and it's a very nice early lead for Knight despite maybe not the greatest stage choice. Knight's spacing on that ledge trap was so pivotal. You saw him space out those forward airs, those grabs, and oh, one flame breath and grab is gonna even it up? This is insane. Yeah, and the Smash for now coming out a little early, but the drop zone there barely clips, and now this is a huge, huge lead for Knight, 76% means even the up smash won't kill yet and Almerex needs to find this stock or else there's going to be a buster running him down and putting him at 70. He got all that, that damage. Just like that. Oh yeah, and the, look at this buster go to work and now the smash art, this is so dangerous. Oh, One no. well spaced back air. If you were any closer to center stage, he was dead. It's going to have to be a huge comeback from Almerex. It's so tense. The forward smash not quite killing, but a full stock lead lapping in percent for Knight. Finally, Almerex finds the kill, but he's already down so much. This Smash Renato is so, so terrifying. If you lose this stock here, you are in dire straits. It would need to be an amazing comeback. Yeah, Almerex really struggling to find a way out of this corner. That's a couple times now he's done neutral get up, and I think Knight's starting to catch on to it. Ooh, good up B though, and shield are already getting him out of disadvantage. Everything is so tense right now. Knight faking out a drop zone there. And in the Smash Renato, Bowser at 146, you have to imagine any smash attack will kill. The Nair of all things is what does it. And now, once again, low percent on this Shulk. Almorax at zero, but a full stock behind means that Knight can throw out the Buster Monado with no fear of retaliation. Ooh, it's a big thing that he's in shield art for that because that is worth a lot of percent and stage control. So now back into neutral, goes into buster, and oh, that up smash was a little greedy and he's going to eat 48% for it. Yeah, the buster Monado bread and butter is just so hard, especially when Shulk is ahead and he feels like even if he takes extra percent in buster, he doesn't care that much. It's like full reward with very minimal risk. And 81% already on this Bowser. Almerex looking so bad Knight, turning it up exactly when he needs it to, exactly on match point to close it out for his team. He's looking to make it happen. Good backslash. He hasn't really used that recovery option. He used it once in game one, but <laughs> ever since then, he's just kind of dropped it. This is a big edge guard, but on Almerex finding a way back. Backslash Another actually backslash. hits him in the back. The ledge trap situation, he goes for the dunk instead of just waiting. And now the percent, the stops are going catch. to be even, but 133% with smash and jump. Monado means the drop zone fair is so easy. It's night closing it out, taking it in the closest match we've had in a long time. Final score. 14 to or 15 to 11 it all came down to game three last game of the match but knight closes it out for sienna and at the end of the day it was Knight's spacing that was so pivotal right he's got that big sword and he just abused it on bowser who has to come in and it's just so hard look at all the replays of how hard it is for almorex to get inside shulk's zone it's 
Honestly, when you look back at it, it's kind of crazy that it was that close for Amarek in the first place. Because at the end of game three, Knight was playing so clean over Almarax, but it took a long time for him to make the adaptations he needed. It was in Almarax's favor for quite a while, and uh, narrowly does Knight carry his team. Narrowly do they avoid the upset and keep themselves in contention for second place. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be the end of the match between Sienna and Yukon. We're going to bring you Canisius and Niagara in just a few moments. I'm sure the players are waiting, ready to get into the lobby, but we are going to have to throw it to a quick break while we make our final preparations.
Hello and welcome back, everybody. We're coming off the back of an insane match, but the action is still coming as we have Canisius College's KC going up against Niagara University's M. Brock to start out the match between these two teams and Canisius, a very strong team that you are uh, well versed with. Yeah, uh, I graduated from Canisius last year, so I know yeah. uh, uh, for the players on this roster. And Casey, mm -hmm. the captain, starting off the day in uh, a... By the way, this is a college rivalry. This is the Battle of the Bridge. These are two uh -huh. in-conference rival schools, so always a fun matchup to watch. For sure. Casey, of course, a really, really good Pikachu player. We saw last week absolutely dominate. I believe it was a Bowser in the matchup it was really an impressive showing and going up against Embrock here i expect uh, some big clips from casey it's definitely an uphill battle for Embrock, but i think he can do it if he plays it right yeah uh casey's pikachu is one of the most consistent players not only on kanisha's lineup but in the egf he is you know always the go-to guy for this team and so for him to start off the day uh, I think the plan is for Canisius, you know, send in Casey and build up that momentum. You know, get the rest of the team psyched and ready to go. Uh, I'm not sure who Embrock plays, but uh, he has a tall task ahead of him. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, but uh, given that it's EGF, it's probably either Ness or Robin. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to take a guess, I, I those know... are going to be the highest probability ones. I do know that uh, one of Niagara's top players does play Dark Hat. Robin, but I am... Oh, it's Dark, Dark Hat, Hat plays Ness, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Dark Hat plays Ness. I might be wrong, they, they do have a Ness and a Robin who are very consistent on this lineup. I just am mm -hmm. blanking on the names right now for who they are. But uh, regardless, it, it should be good. <laughs> yeah, we should be getting into things pretty soon. I was given work the players were uh, in the lobby and ready, but it looks like there's some last-minute changes that need to be made. Uh, yeah, I'm curious to see, uh, where they'll go. I mean, this is, this is the last week of the EGF, and for Canisius, if you look at the standings, actually, in terms of the MAC, this is a big game for both of these teams. If Canisius mm -hmm. wins, Canisius cannot get the number one seed in the MAC, but they can still get second through some odd tiebreakers and things like that. It is still possible. Uh, Niagara, they have two wins on the season. If they can get this win here uh, against Canisius, they can avoid one of those upper bracket bullets uh, mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. You know, teams like the Siena, St. Peter's, who have been highlight real machines. So uh, if they get that third win, it will be massive. And it looks like Pikachu versus Game & Watch is our first matchup of the That's set. a very interesting matchup. I feel like I've like honestly literally never seen it before. Yeah. Uh, this tends to be Game & Watch favored, mostly because Pikachu loves to go in on characters and Game & Watch has so many defensive options. The thing is, Casey does have experience in this matchup because A-Fly is another key player for uh, Canisius who mains Game & Watch. Yeah, but it looks like that experience is not coming in for him just yet as a 100% lead goes M. Brock's favor. And uh, I do agree, I think this matchup is pretty poor. Pikachu is a character that really likes to prey on big heavyweights who are very comboable because of how long Pikachu can extend those multi-hit drag down combos for. And Game & Watch, a light character, does not fall prey to that as we're going to have to throw it to a quick break as we wait for this game to close out. The players are still connected. Unfortunately for us, we cannot spectate it for you. So we'll be back in just a few moments.
Hello and welcome back everybody. Sorry about that interruption. Unfortunately, we cannot really help disconnecting. Obviously, we did not choose to, but we did see M. Brock win game one in a one stock victory over KC. Just a reminder, M. Brock was on the Game & Watch and it was KC on Pikachu. Yeah, and uh, big early victory there for Niagara. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned, you know, this is a big game for the Battle of, Battle of the Bridge. Niagara trying to get out of that bottom half of the conference, trying to prove that, you know, they've got a shot here in the MAC. And Kanisha's trying to do the same thing. So getting off to an early start, taking the first game, good stuff to Embra. Really, really good stuff to Embrock. You did say it was a pretty bad matchup for the Pikachu, and if it's only a one stock, when we go to Casey's counter pick, it could definitely swing the other way. We could see Casey start to run it back, earn some points for Kinesis in response. We'll have to see yeah. what happens. Yeah, and uh, in cases like this, I don't think this would help him. Casey does have other characters that he likes mm -hmm. to play, so. I would not be surprised to see a character switch if he really did not like the, the Pikachu Game & Watch matchup. Yeah, we do see the bands come out onto Lila and Kalos. Both are very, very popular Pikachu stages. I know why those are banned. Uh, the slants <laughs> on Pikachu very much help his movement. He can do quick attack cancels on them. It's very, very strong. And then Kalos, Pikachu has the wall hop. He can really make great use of that flat stage. He makes good use of those platforms covering the ledge. It gives him great recovery mix-ups. It's just a great stage for him overall. I expect us to go to somewhere like a triplat or even what's most probable is going to be um, Smashville, I think. Either a tripod or smash is where we're going to end up going. Pikachu has those combos that he really likes extending further and further to the maximum limit with those up airs, those forward airs. He can chase his opponents all around. The one downside of a tripod is it makes your thunder confirms a lot harder because those platforms can get in the way. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. You know, I, I think Smashville is one of the stages that I think Casey does very well at, you know, and that's part of it is the character you know like you said the chase downs on pikachu are so good he's such a quick character uh, one of the things that uh we didn't really get to talk about because of the disconnect was both these characters are very small you know the small hitboxes of each of these characters makes them really hard to track down but mm -hmm. the speed of both of them really comes into play yeah pikachu especially suffers from fighting against small opponents a lot of his moves prey on large lingering hitboxes that clip the opponent's movement and take up a lot of space. And when your opponent is small and can weave around it, it definitely hurts. As we see, we actually end up going to Pokemon Stadium 2 here. Uh, an understandable pick, obviously. A relatively neutral space stage. It gives the Pikachu a lot of room to run around and abuse his superior mobility. And one of the things you'll see, uh, Casey will do this mix up uh, a couple times is he will use that central pole of Pokemon Stadium uh, underneath the stage to try and recover because he can wall jump off that and Pikachu's up B just covers so much space that he's able to use that as a mix up. So look for that maybe later in the match if he uh, is struggling to recover. Yeah, Pikachu is a character with an absolutely insane off stage game, which is another reason he kind of struggles against Game & Watch, because Game & Watch's recovery is an active hitbox the entire time. It's incredibly fast and it goes very far, right? It's very hard to contest a Game & Watch off stage. And when, Game and, or when Pikachu excels so much at being that offstage villain, at sharking his opponent's recoveries, it definitely hurts. But that being said, great forward smash punishes the risky ledge off from the Embrock Chosen. Now it's Casey with a lead. Yeah, well spaced forward smash there, reading the uh, uh, get up attack and knowing that he, you know, that, that forward smash. Look at the range on it. It covers an entire another Pikachu body. That's how much distance it has. And oh no, M Brock, an unfortunate SD, gives Casey a two stock lead. Unfortunate indeed, but Casey, that's exactly what he needs right now. He is losing the set. And oh my God, if M Brock had just let that rip a couple frames earlier, would have connected onto Casey, but 
not quite having the timing. And Casey, when we're playing for stocks, when we're playing for points, having this big lead really, really matters. There it was. You saw, you mentioned it earlier. He loves going for that thunder spike and mm -hmm. right there tried to get one down early. But one of the things we really haven't seen, and it's partially because Casey hasn't been throwing out projectiles, is that bucket. The bucket will actually uh, catch thunder or some of those uh, jolts that Pichu throws out. But Casey's been trying to be in the face of Embrock for most of the set, and that down air going to punch it for it. Yeah, down air making it so hard to combo Game & Watch. This character is incredibly light, but he's deceptively hard to kill because of how strong his defensive tools are. Look at how they both trying and uh, find a way to break neutral. They're both trying to find a way to get in with their combo moves, but they're also both playing oh. so cautious that oh great spacing on that down beat but great stuff by embrock to make sure that snap to ledge gets there in time yeah really really great i said it's just game and watches up beat is so fast and hard to punish even when you have the read you know where he's going you just can't get it out in time unfortunately now casey still a full stock ahead with the percent lead as well just needs to find the last hit to close out this stock but it's very difficult this down smash not going to be it a relatively weak move all things considered but if he can secure this extra point for his team not let embrock even up the stock out it would be very very big Big back what? air there, as you said, taking that stock. I want to mention that, okay, well, it doesn't even matter if he's just going to run up up smash. <laughs> oh, that was a dash attack. That was an up smash. Or dash attack. My, my yeah. bad. <laughs> even crazier, Pikachu's dash attack is a surprisingly strong kill tool. It'll kill a lot of characters starting around 130, but on a game and watch at 140, it's going to for sure send you to that blast zone. Just a great read or a reaction on that roll closes it out a one stock victory for kc but remember embrock had a pretty pretty bad sd this game meaning that that one stock lead the point counts right but if that sd didn't happen you have to imagine that probably could have gone embrock's favor and now going into a game three i'm certainly favoring embrock to win the set yeah it's been really back and forth and one of the things that i've noticed about this set in particular is when Embrock is in disadvantage, Casey is going for a lot of air dodge reads, and Embrock is just not doing it. He's not air dodging, he's not falling for it. And so it's kind of a wasted opportunity because he's going for reads by throwing out forward smashes, which is a laggy move, and it allows Embrock the chance to kind of recover and regain some ground. I completely agree. We need to see some more discipline and some more reactionary gameplay from KC. Pikachu is a very fast character with fast options, so he can always get to where his opponent is going if the player is on point enough. You don't have to go for those crazy leads all the time, and KC can just slow it down a little bit and clean things up. But that being said, Embrock is the one really determining the tempo of the game. He's the one pacing the match, and he's the one having the lead most of the time. So it's really on Embrock to make a big mistake and give Casey a way to come back. Yeah, and like we said, pivotal game three. This is a big moment for both of these teams, getting off to an early start in these types of sets. So important, and the run back to PS2. Yeah, very interesting choice to go back to PS2, but I think Embrock just wants a little bit of revenge after how Game 2 went. Both of them playing very cautious off the start of this match, you know, just trying to space out, not being too committal. Ooh, but an opening for Casey. Can he get the Nair Loops? Not, uh, not able to get yeah, that final hit really to hard drag it back down. Game Watch He's so going, light. But, yeah. Already falling out at 43, Casey. It's just against a character like Game Watch, it's so hard. And these Thunder Jolts, Casey has to be very careful. The bucket is two out of three. And if that bucket comes online, the oil spill is such a strong tool for Embrock that Casey needs to avoid giving over. And you would think it would be a weak tool because it's only catching Thunder Jolts, but three Thunder Jolts stacked is actually a lot of percent. So it is it very is. dangerous. 
even if it doesn't have the kill power you want it to, just racking up percent from it is incredibly strong. Ooh, that was all caught great hard read. By and he's gonna get punished for it. Yeah. Great read, but both players just standing in shield in front of each other at a hundred on both players at low percent. Neither wants to be the first one to die, but they're so light that a big hit like a down smash or a forward smash from either player might just do it. The chair, the forward tilt is going to be what takes the first stock. I answered immediately by a Thunderbolt up smash from Casey, and now things are back to dead even. And I think Casey on that first stock initially wanted to uh, do a dash attack to try and clean up the stock, but forward mm -hmm. tilt just comes out so fast for Game & Watch that it's hard to punish, and it has so much knockback too at that percent on light characters, it was gonna clean up the stock, but good jo uh, job immediately answering with a uh, jolt up smash. Yeah, we saw Casey there going for a ledge trap, but it's so hard to ledge trap the game and watch that it immediately got reversed and KC ended up taking 30 or 40 percent just for trying. And you can see, just look at how hard it is for Pikachu to get in. So many defensive options for Embrock. He just throws out moves and Pikachu really doesn't have a whole lot of answers for it because he has to get in. He has to be in Game & Watch's face and that's exactly where Game & Watch wants you to be. It is indeed only 10% separating the two players, both of them posturing around each other, throwing out hitboxes, but barely finding anything. Just a grab goes Mbrock's way, and neither player can make anything happen, but the chip damage keeps going in favor of Mbrock time and time again as these stray hits keep landing. Well, here's the thing. Pikachu's trying to string together these hits, and a lot of his hits are strung together via aerials. So he's trying uh -huh. to approach with all these aerials, and if you continue to do that, you're just attacking a shield, right? So he's going to get chip damaged away like this because all of Pikachu's hits have to be through the air. He's got no way to really get him up in the air initially unless he goes for a grab, but it's so hard to convert off it. See, even there, he gets the forward throw, and uh, it, he just falls out of the way. There's no... Uh, conversion off of it. Yeah, using back throw there for stage positioning, it's still so hard to beat the Game & Watch off stage. We find Casey managed to get the ledge shot there, but how many times has that failed compared to how many times it's worked just due to the nature of the characters? No throw for Pikachu is incredibly reliable in the matchup and great Thunder Jolt to let Casey get back on the stage. With this lead, he's going to try and build extra credit. And you can see now he's trying to play a little bit more campy because he knows one strong hit and with the bucket online that this Pikachu could die to any, any strong hit. Absolutely, but with that bucket online, he has no way to beat these Thunder Jolts. He can't just bucket them. He can't reflect them back, so he needs to play smart and shield and get that stock with the chair instead. And now... We have Bucket online for Embrock. Last stock on both players. This Bucket is going to come out now. You can't get rid of it by killing him. That was a big, big uh, way for Embrock to get out of the corner. Ooh, good Thunder gets some damage. Can he get anything off it though? No, reset back into neutral. And here we go again, weaving back and forth. Who will find the first opening? It's going to be Embrock, but it's so hard to keep Pikachu in disadvantage. This character is so evasive with that quick attack to get down from the air. And once again, both players, very similar percent, great dodge on the oil spill by Casey. That threat is offline now and you can play a lot more confidently. Good dash attack catching a landing, but Game Watch still has his jump and so much maneuverability in the air means he's going to find a way back to stage. This is dangerous for both of them. Ooh, good down air and reset once again. Yeah, we're reset back to neutral. An ambitious smash attack charge and the bacon's going to go into a down smash, which seals out the game. Embrock takes it. Four points to one and puts Niagara University out to a nice early lead. That was so huge too, because you don't really know what angle the bacon's going to go at. You can somewhat angle it, I believe, mm -hmm. and, and push it either out or up. So it's hard to really judge where it's gonna be. So it was such a clean catch by Embrock to, you know, 
catch Casey out by the ledge and immediately dash forward and down smash. That down Absolutely. smash of Game & Watch, uh, we didn't really see it in Game 2 a whole lot. We saw him throw it out a couple times, but it never really landed. So for him to catch Pikachu on the ledge like that was absolutely massive. <laughs> very, very big. And that early lead, when these two teams look like they're going to be slated to be so similar in power to each other, is going to be so important. Even just three points, as we literally just saw can determine the outcome of a match one way or the other. So it's incredibly important, and we'll have to see how set two plays out between Kinesis and Niagara in just a few moments as we throw it to a quick break to make sure we have everything set up properly.
Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. We have game two in the Canisius College versus Niagara University matchup. We have Daku Sky going up against Mushroom. Daku, representing Canisius College, he is a Zelda player, going up against Mushroom for Niagara University. And we're going we're gonna to be heading straight to Battlefield for game one. Yeah, should be interesting. Deku Sky, uh, he is a Zelda player, and he is uh, he does a lot of things very interestingly as Zelda. And you'll see him go for a lot of lightning kicks, and he makes very good use of that neutral B that we talked about in terms of uh, you know pushing people away, right? Because that's one of its best uses. Is as soon as you think someone's going to dash attack you or go in on you for a grab, that neutral B comes out so quickly. He loves to use that move. Olimar, though, a very interesting choice. I think this is the first Olimar we've seen on the stream. I think it is. Olimar was a character that started out incredibly popular, but has been nerfed multiple times over the course of this game's lifespan. So it's very, very interesting to see what will end up happening with his character now that he's in a much more balanced state than he used to be. Yeah, and I... Hmm. I, I'm trying to think who this stage really benefits here because uh, Daku Sky, ooh, good ooh, catch on great. the down B. One of the things that uh, Deku, Daku Sky has really done over the uh, over his time in the EGF, he's done a oh. much better job at ledge trapping. Setting up those knights to you know get those edge guards uh, is something that he didn't really used to do a lot, but he's gotten much better at positioning and thinking about it. Very interesting. It definitely shows now that he's up a solid lead, only 81% on him, while he's already looking to snowball his lead even further over Mushroom. And honestly, it's kind of crazy that we see the Zelda win the camping game, but against Olimar, those Pikmin just die instantly to that neutral B from Zelda. It's so hard to really play that camping game against Zelda, you have to be willing to approach it. And it looks like Daku Sky is definitely aware of that fact. Yeah, Ol Olimar does not have an easy way in with that uh, reflector, with the knight being on point. Zelda has all the tools to really box out Olimar, and it's going to be tough for Olimar too, especially uh, even once you, you get in on Zelda, Zelda is comboable, but if you think about Olimar's combos, he doesn't have a whole lot that strings together. No, Olimar is definitely a character who's mostly defined by like two hit combos and stray hits. He doesn't carry you across the stage, he doesn't build up all his percent at once, which means making a comeback happen as Olimar is incredibly difficult, and already we see him so far behind. He's getting two stock. And his character has such a hard time in the matchup. His character isn't good at making comebacks happen. It's looking very dire for Mushroom. And the catch, okay, there you go. I was gonna say, one of the things you're gonna have to watch for in this matchup is Mushroom's use of the Pikmin. He's gotta be very aware of which Pikmin he has in play because they all have different effects and especially watch for those purple Pikmin, but it doesn't even matter if you keep falling into oh these side beams. What was that, three in a row that connected or something? That was absolutely crazy. And that's going to be a two-stock victory going in Daku Sky's favor, bringing the point total back up to three to four. Kanisha's only barely behind now. And Mushroom, I know it's a rough matchup, but he really has to figure something out if he wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Daku Sky here. Yeah, we were talking about in an earlier set the uh, how the disadvantage state was so harsh. For Olimar, think about the disadvantage state here, because look at how many projectiles Daku Sky threw out, and Olimar's up B leaves him vulnerable. It's not a hitbox. He can still throw out some Pikmin, uh, but it still leaves him in that vulnerable state, and so just weaving around all these projectiles is so hard to do. It gets easier with the more Pikmin that you throw, but it's when there's so much agency off stage. I mean, Doctor Sky just has to kind of sit there on ledge and he just kind of gets to mash the B button in any direction and there's nothing really for Mushroom to do about it. It is absolutely brutal. And uh, the biggest part of Pikmin's or uh, of Alamar's <laughs> game plan is throwing those Pikmin out, right? But when you just have Neru's love to reflect the Pikmin back, it 
feels really, really hard to actually use the core mechanic of your character. You need to just go for blue and purples, right? And go for those stronger hits and those stronger grabs if you want to make anything happen. But that's not really what Olimar is all about. Yeah, and on top of that, uh, think about the stage control. Daku Sky had all the stage control in the world there. Mushroom was always trying to find a way to, to fight his way out of the corner. And it's just not easy to do. And that's one of the things that Daku Sky has really worked on is... The, the use of that knight and side B and when to use them and using them to regain that stage presence has really been a, a huge shift in play for him. Yeah, it has. And we see some of the bans coming out. It is going to be uh, Daku Sky banning Lilat and Yoshi's, not wanting to go back to a tribe lot, even though he just won on there. And then uh, Lilat is obviously just a stage a lot of people just like playing on and we actually saw earlier that it served Zelda pretty well, so I'm surprised that Doku Sky is opting to ban it out, but maybe the player just really does not like it. And yeah, we'll have to see I, what Mushroom goes to. From what I know, he's not a, a fan of, of Lilac, mm -hmm. but I think it's also because he doesn't like those uh, those smaller blast zones, especially. And Yo yeah, think about it this way too: Yoshi's and Lilat are some of the yeah. most compact stages, so he really wants that that space to work with. That makes a lot of sense. We'll have to see what the pick is from Mushroom on this Olimar. I don't really know where you'd want to take the Zelda here, but I feel like my instincts are telling me uh, Pokemon Stadium 2. Yeah, PS2 would be a really solid pick here. Uh, you could take the gamble and say something like FD because that would allow you to... Uh, you know, go in and try and punish those uh, laggy ranged abilities a bit more. Uh, but it would still be, you know, like we said, kind of a risk to yeah, take. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure Mushroom is stream sniping because uh, the second I said go PS2, we see him in the captain channel. I'm going PS2, so <laughs> I, I, I'm a prophet, I guess. But that You're is, that's where we're going to be going. I'm a done genius. It. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> So we are going to be going to Pokemon Stadium 2. It's a much larger stage. The platform layout means that it's a lot harder for Zelda con to control all the space with those phantasms. Uh, you can just go on the platforms and jump over them. It's not like FD or Kalos where they would cover the entirety of the stage. While also, Zelda doesn't have that roof over her head to protect her from approaches from above. And the extra space can definitely help when you're playing Greninja, I guess. Yeah, the character switch to Greninja, I, I think like this pick a lot more. Yeah, this, he, despite the reflector still being in, in play for Daku Sky, at least this way, it's way easier to get in. You have more, you have more speed, more mobility, you have way more agency, and the time that it takes for Daku Sky to get out of those ranged attacks uh, is way more prevalent in this matchup. I think Zelda like really invalidates what Olimar wants to do as a character. So I think switching off of it is just a fundamentally good decision here. And going on to the Greninja could be very, very good. But out the gate, this Greninja from Mushroom doesn't look too clean. It looks like he's still a little bit uncomfortable trying to adjust to playing a very different character than he was previously. Yeah, yeah. these are absolutely two different styles of character. Uh, Olimar, another very defensive type of character, kind of like Game & Watch in a way, but Greninja, this is a character that's rushed down, in your face type of playstyle, and already struggling to find a way in on this Zelda. He is having a very hard time getting in in what should be a much easier character to get in on the Zelda on, right? You have these approaching fairs, approaching nares, which have a lot of lag in the air, but if you land with them, you can pressure your opponent into shielding and then find a grab. You can even empty hop tomahawk into grab and then you get up throw, up air, up throw, back air, a whole bunch of really great combos for this character, but we don't see any of them coming out. We don't see the spacings, the proper jump heights coming out from Mushroom, and therefore he's falling very far behind to Daku Sky on the Zelda. And it feels like Mushroom is kind of one... It's hard to say one step behind the play, but he's kind of attacking where Daku Sky is when he throws out an attack, 
But Daku Sky is immediately rolling after almost every ranged ability he throws out. So he's got to read that roll eventually because Daku Sky's rolling a lot. Like, oh, okay, good grab there. But you could kind of sense that was a position where Daku Sky typically rolls. You have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to make those reads. That's why the players are competing at that level. And if you can't keep up with that, if you can't make those reads for yourself, you're going to fall behind just like Mushroom is right now. Two st or one stock to three here. A two stock advantage for Daku Sky as he keeps on the pressure and looks to go for a three stock. Yeah, and Zelda, as we mentioned, has plenty of kill power. Ooh, if that lightning kick had connected, that would have been plenty of damage. If if the percents scary. were switched, yeah, it, it, it would have been a... It, like, that lightning kick kills actually surprisingly early, especially on Greninja, another lighter character. Like, 90% is where that move will kill. Ooh, he really wanted that uh, move to kill. He needs to close out this stock. He needs to keep the stock difference close for his team at the very least. If Daku Sky is able to close out this high percent stock without losing it, it would be so, so crucial for the Kinesis lineup. Yeah, this is very dangerous and Mushroom's just trying to go in, trying to find an opening. Oh, oh there but it the is. the Knight's gonna do it and the three stock comes through for Daku Sky. Very, very good showing from Daku Sky. Earning seven total points for his team, I believe. One less than the maximum possible that you can earn means the score is now going to be eight to four in Kanisha's College's favor as we get ready to go into game three. And if the next Kanisha's representative is able to pull out another win, it's going to put Niagara University in a very, very bad position. You never want to have to make these huge comebacks happen. So the pressure is definitely starting to mount. Yeah, and uh, it's like we said, right? The you know game one was so pivotal because it felt like the momentum started to swing Niagara's way. But when you get seven out of possible eight points, it's so massive, and the momentum has just fully swung right back into Kanishis's favor. It feels like absolutely, the momentum is in their favor. The points are in their favor, and honestly, the lineup is looking really good for them too. A Fly, a really strong player. MKL Rising, very strong as well. I know Fiction and Dark Hat also have put up some really good showings, but we'll have to see if this Niagara University lineup is ready to make a comeback happen, if they're ready to take the lead back for themselves in Game 3. And we're going to have to find out in just a few minutes as we cut to another break here.
Okay. Welcome back, everybody. We have game three between Canisius College and Universe in Niagara University prepped and ready here. We've got a fly on the uh, Game & Watch, I believe, going up against Dark Hat, who I'm pretty sure is a Nest player, but I might be wrong. Yeah, uh, another big match here. Uh, as we said, you know, game three, always a pivotal one, gives all the momentum to one team uh, or the other. But Dark Samus, actually. Yeah, Dark Samus, that's yeah. Interesting. We don't see a whole lot of Samus players here in the AGF. And uh, against a Game & Watch, this could be very rough. Yeah, the bucket is a terrifying tool when you are a Dark Samus player. But even before that comes out, this pressure from a fly has been insane. And the roll up gets caught by the down smash. Dark Krat had all the time in the world to think about the spacing and still went up into it. Unfortunately, the pressure getting to him and now it's going to be a... Yeah, a, a full stock. And I mean... There's just so much agency, too. We talked about how defensive Game & Watch plays, and, uh... Oh, good stuff there, getting out of neutral. But, you know, this is just the type of matchup where Dark Samus doesn't have a lot of, uh... You know, ways in. Because they're a ranged character, that bucket is just so prevalent. It actually reflects the missile and catches the neutral weave, but that is going to be key. If, uh... I'm blanking on the Dark Samus' name here, but Dark if he can Dark catch, Dark. if he can catch the Game and Watch in the air, that's going to be massive. Yeah, it's where you need to catch him. Game and Watch's grounded game is so strong, and the thing I've liked the most from a fly is these approaching buckets. It just it covers so many options from Dark Hat on the Samus. It just guarantees that you're going to be safe covering that space and approaching. And then once you're actually in range to fight, you stop doing it and you go for your better boxing tools, but it just lets a fly kind of go wherever he wants with very little threat. And it keeps reminding uh, Dark Hat of that threat of the bucket always being there. A which is online right now, by the way. Yeah, um, well, burned it. But A Flight <laughs> is also, he's done a very good job. This. 40% all started off of uh, one clean conversion. The bread and butter dragged down there, and there you see it goes for it again and converts it into an up tilt. And he's done a very good job all season of converting those drag down nares into, you know, things like up tilts, making all those hits connect and count. Yeah, really, really clean bread and butter game to watch gameplay. And there's honestly just something to be said about consistency, you know? where you're just doing it that well every time. A full stock lead rage on this game and watch makes him incredibly scary. 97% on that Samus means the down smash takes it and another two stock victory going Kanisha's favor. I know Game & Watch's down smash is good, but what was that angle? I've never like, seen... Like, straight up? <laughs> never seen yeah. Game & Watch angle go straight up. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's either supposed to ground you or send you like a chic forward air from melee to the side where it's just like at that disgusting straight horizontal angle. I've never seen it like send straight up like that. That's so weird, but that is going to be a two stock going in a fly's favor 10 to 4 is now the difference and Dark Hat stuck in a rough matchup against a good, good player means they need to really step it up and find something big in game two or else Canisius' college's lead is going to get nearly insurmountable. Yeah, and I think the stage choice didn't benefit him either, right? Because no. if you think about, you know, any platform here would have helped Dark Hat because there's just nowhere to go. You can see in all these replays, where do you go if a fly is just, you know, kind of maneuvering around you taking away your landing options. There's there's nowhere for him to fully charge up that uh, neutral B. And even if he does, he's scared to use it because of the bucket. Yeah, it's just... Game & Watch is so good at sharking landings, and Samus has such bad landing options. You really, really need those platforms to help yourself get out. I think if we were on something like a town and city, that could have been a very different game when you have those platforms at those weird heights that you can play around. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I wouldn't be shocked to see a character switch here, too. But it looks like he's going to try and ride out that Dark Samus. So go to a stage with some platforms or with some extra space here. I think that is the go-to move. I definitely think so as well. We see bands onto Lilat, which is probably not a stage we would have gone to anyway. And some, uh, Yoshi's story, which is definitely a contender. There's the wall for the wall jump, but because the stage is so short, we don't often see that come into play. There's the triplat layout. I expect something like Battlefield or Pokemon Stadium 2 is going to end up being the pick. It looks like the stage selection they actually went for is Smashville. So Interesting. opting, yeah, opting for those, uh, you know, still opting for close engagements, but maybe trying to get those earlier kills, knowing that he has to make every hit count. Game of Watch is a very light character, and I did mm -hmm. mention that if you can catch a fly in the air, take his jump. Samus has good edge guarding tools and a well, character uh... switch coming through here for a fly. I've never seen a fly switch off Steve. This is very interesting switch. Going on to... Or never seen him switch off Game Watch. Going on to Steve. I think he's just playing to have fun. I think he got the two stock and he's just feeling it up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a good setup. He actually like knows what he's doing on Steve. That's like... That's that, like that the was wall huge. setup. Yeah. That mitigates so many projectiles. The, just two blocks mitigate so mm -hmm. many projectiles from Samus. Yeah, I actually think a fly has definitely been putting in a lot of practice on this Steve. It looks like he really does know what he's doing here. I was going to call it, like, you know, a four fun pick, but it looks like he's been in the lab trying to make this character work. I mean, this character does have plenty of good tools. Oh, it's There's really the good. glide into forward smash. There it is. I mean, that glide is so dangerous. We removed it from Brawl for a reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's... It's such a good tool, and Steve in this game is a really good character. We just don't see a lot of him yet because he's so different and he's so weird. It takes people a lot of time to figure out, but a fly so far, that's a shield break setup. A fly barely misspaced it, but the minecart, such a powerful move, takes the stock, and now a diamond in a fly's inventory means the next stock is going to be even stronger than this one. It's only downhill for Dark Hat from here, and a fly is already building up extra credit. Yeah, uh, Dark Hat has to find a way to take this stock soon, but it's just so difficult because there's so much that you have to watch out for when you're playing against Steve. There's so many tools that he has, and that inventory is constantly changing too if he keeps using it and then mining afterwards. And oh, the force smash would have oh killed my God. saved him! Uh, I mean, oh, that's insane. I, I don't know if that was planned. That's that's like no a way. rocket league spam calculated in yeah. chat. Like uh -huh. that's yeah. <laughs> okay, but now he respawns. He immediately gets diamond tools, and the second stock from Steve is so much stronger than the first. This character snowballs a lead so hard with these diamond tools. Look at how safe and scared Dark Hat has to play right now, but because of these blocks, a fly can try and force Dark Hat to approach, which is not what the Dark Samus wants to do. But an incredibly unfortunate SD not only takes the stock, it also gets rid of the diamond and leaves a fly with only gold tools right now. Yeah, I think that uh, up B was a misinput. And oh, for ooh. sure. Interesting setup there, using the blocks to build up to a, an awkward angle on the minecart and then converting it into an aerial. Oh, that's oh a God. disgusting setup. I'm sorry, that's just... That's crazy. When you have, like, you, you have, like, Mega Man's jab, essentially, and you can set it up into that many aerials, I mean, it's it did 70% there. I mean, it wasn't all from that or one not, level, yeah, not yeah, it feels all, a but... lot. And now he has the percent lead, but he's running low on resources. He's very smart, trying to mine more here. He has the diamond. He's going to immediately go craft that. There's no use saving it for anything. He needs a charge shot for it, but that's certainly going to be worth it for the extra kill power he now has and the damage in his repertoire. Yeah, and uh, the forward air is big. How does he get back? Good minecart there. A fly spending a lot of time mining. He keeps eating punishes for it. He's low on resources, but it's not worth it at this point. You're too far behind, and the forward smash catches him off the ledge. 
And I think we might uh, we might want to play it safe. I think a fly is going to go back to the game watch for game three. Probably. I, right at the end there, you saw he tried to set up those two blocks like he did at the beginning of the game to snuff out those projectiles. The issue is, look at his placement. No He's placed them. It. Yeah, there's no there's nowhere for him to be, and he ends up going to ledge and the forward smash going through it. You can see here. He tries to get up. I believe that's jump from ledge, trying to put him uh -huh. between the two blocks. And uh, Dark Hat able to read that that get up option and yeah. uh, secure the set or game. A really, really say. unfortunate SD, by the way, from a fly did end up costing him that game as well. So we'll have to see if he keeps confidence in his Steve or if he goes back to the game and watch for this very critical game three in set three. Winner of this is going to get a lot of momentum back for their team looking forward toward the uh, set for it. Yeah, a, a, a pivotal game three. You know, if, if Niagara gets this one, you know, you're back in striking distance. It's back to a basically an even match. That game two where uh, Daku Sky took seven points was absolutely massive. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, We've hyped it up. Game three is, is all important now. It is so, so critical as we wait for the picks and the bands to come through. The bands are going to be Final Destination and Kalos, and we'll have to see what the pick is for Dark Hat. Now remember, there are two characters shown for a fly that both do well on different stages, so it's going to be hard to consider which stage you want to pick if you are Dark Hat here, but I'd have to imagine it's probably going to end up being either a Triplat or PS2. Yeah, I, I'm i thinking similarly. Triplat or PS2 is probably the go-to stage here. On the other hand, if you are Dark Hat, if you have a pocket pick, because Dark Samus seems to struggle against both of these characters. At least to, to Samus. To some, yeah, <laughs> at least to some... <laughs> To some degree, have a have a little bit of a, a backup plan. This might be the time to throw it out. The swap to Samus. Honestly, that'd be a funny mix-up. That would be. <laughs> it's just a strict downgrade. Samus's roll is two frames worse. <laughs> Your jabs don't even link. It's just. <laughs> uh, yeah. Scotch, and there it is. The Pokemon Stadium two pick comes out for uh, Kanisha's here. It's where we're going to be going, and I just have to wonder what the character pick for a fly is going to end up being. If I was him, I would probably run it back onto my tried and true game and watch. But these players have been bold, so I would not be surprised if he believes in his Steve to do it and he wants to get the good practice in. And there it is, Steve running it back on Pokemon Stadium 2 here. Let's see if a fly can make it happen this time. Now remember, not only did uh, A-Fly a did SD last game, but he also should have died to a forward smash and saved himself with a stray block. True. So it's, it could have gone either way, and Dark Hat was able to clutch it out last time. So we'll see what the adaptation is here in Game 3, but already catching him in the air, and I like the extension with the upbeat. Yeah, really, really great combo. Some solid fundamentals from Dark Hat. Still 0% on him as a fly keeps getting caught over and over again, trying to mine resources at unsafe times. I think he thinks that this Dark Samus just wants to try and camp him out, but uh, uh, Dark Hat has really shown willingness to approach here. Yeah, and Samus and Dark Samus have tools to kind of get into mm -hmm. another character's face and do some damage. That forward air, that multi hit is so good. It strings together so much percent and it's so good at edge guarding but in neutral it just also covers so much space look at there's nowhere to go for a fly when he jumps over you with a forward air yeah it's so rough you can go under it though and that's what we've seen a fly to multiple times with that mine cart especially he's gotten so much value out of it and he's gonna get saved by the blocks once again but it's ephemeral as the back air finds a fly and importantly he lost his first stock without finding a diamond which means his cycle is going to be reset and he won't have that extra power for the second stock dark hat has a lot of more breathing room to work with now because of that yeah and on top of that too i mean 
you look at the mobility. Oh, that was a clean catch. That was an awkward. It looked very awkward because of the cart there. But good job reading the uh, drift outside of the cart and catching it with the up smash. Absolutely, but still a fly with the great read still behind and still unable to find this kill dark hat building his lead further and further as <laughs> the gold sword is enough to do it and now there is a diamond in a fly's inventory and we'll see if he chooses to craft it or stick with this set of gold tools that he has for himself well he still has a gold tool now and it's evened up the percents pretty well <laughs> But he does go for the craft on the diamonds, barely able to make it back to stage. Oh my god, a fly knowing his spacing there. Almost evening things up as he now completely evens the percent with the positional advantage. Looks to take the percent lead. There he does do it. And it's Dark Hat who's getting it completely run back on him. Another diamond in a fly's inventory. He's ready for the last stock as well. And now things are looking so much better for Kinesis. I like the attempt there on the up uh, up throw, but the ceiling just too high on PS2. I'm not Look at how exactly low on blocks sure. the fly is, though. Yeah, this is yeah, dangerous. I'm not sure what uh, Steve's weight is, but a fly has done a fairly good job of surviving Ooh. until directly diving into the neutral B. Uh, yeah, you could have hit the broadside of a barn with that. It was just so yeah. massive. <laughs> it definitely looks like without blocks, Steve has a very difficult time getting off of the ledge and dark how is able to punish it at completely 120 percent on it means he will die to most things especially because we have these diamond tools online but look a fly is forced to drop iron just as a protective block finally the minecart takes it and he gets a chance to mine some more but his inventory still not even felt full down 83 percent and a fly maybe we're getting the sea pick right now yeah, 98% uh, and trying to get back to stage. This is one of the tools that Samus has. Samus' ledge trap and that up B, I'm actually surprised it didn't kill. I believe it does a lot more knockback than it looks like, but oh, mm. here's another grab. An up throw, not, not going to do quite it quite yet. yet. Oh, 163 on a fly. He can't make it back to the ground. The forward air catches him out and it's going to be Dark Hat completing the run back getting a two stock there i believe right or a one stock a one that stock was, that was a one stock but yeah. still congrats to dark hat for, for clutching sure. that set out a one stock victory for him earning four more points he gave two over at the start but still net two point swing in niagara's favor brings the total to 10 to 8 and things are starting to look very very close once again as we go into set four between these two teams. Yeah, and A-Fly has been one of the more consistent hitters on this yeah. uh, Kinesius roster. So for him to fall is actually massive and it makes this point differential so close after three sets. Honestly, perhaps a little bit uh, disrespectful of him to stay on the Steve there, I feel like. Yeah, on one hand, you want to get the practice in, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, this league is too close, right? We talked about how top-heavy and uh, you know this conference is, and with Niagara being towards the bottom, every win counts, right? This was Kine this is Kinesius's shot at being you know inside those those top few teams. Because remember, mm -hmm. in a top-heavy conference, the bottom half of this conference is mostly at you know one win. Niagara's at two wins. So if you can you know set yourself up for a good run in the playoffs. Why wouldn't you? And so Absolutely. it's really tough to, you know, you're still, you still have the lead. This is, this set's mm -hmm. not, not over by any means, but oh, for sure. to keep it this close and not give yourself that edge for the postseason is, is kind of baffling, right? I completely agree. And we'll have to see if Kinesius' MKL Rising and Flapjack can make it happen. If they can find the victory or if Niagara will complete the upset. We almost saw it just last match with UConn nearly completing their upset, so we'll need to see if Niagara can make it happen for themselves this time in just a few moments when we come back from break.
step into the ring. Okay, hello everybody. We are bringing you game four between MKL Rising and Tev on stream. The score is 10 to 8, and we are going to be getting into it on, I believe, Final Destination was the pick. And now you've played with MKL Rising. He is a uh, who again? He mostly plays Ness. He is the, the consistent Ness player of this roster. Uh, he is also another player who has really stepped up for this Kanisha's team, especially in the wake of uh, a few of the seniors from last year's team graduating. MKL has really stepped up in a big way, and so uh, an interesting Ness versus Lucas match. Yeah, I, uh, I do like this matchup. I definitely think that in the matchup, um, I would consider Ness to be favored just because i think ness has better close range tools than the lucas does yeah the other thing that i would also consider though is that uh i think lucas has a lot more kill or a, a lot easier way of killing he has a lot more hits that do a lot more knockback mm -hmm. i think so it's going to be very interesting to see how i think the real key here is spacing between these two because Absolutely. if you can outspace your opponent it, it's it's basically a ditto right so it's if you can outspace similar, yeah. your opponent it's it's yeah uh it's like we said it, in terms of projectiles was... it's basically a ditto but in terms of uh normals right in terms of like a button moves these two characters are actually very very different from each other right uh even the PK fires are very different. Ness's has a lot more combo potential, but doesn't cover that insane amount of horizontal distance that Lucas's does. However, in this matchup, that can almost be a bad thing because of the PSI magnet or the PK mag magnet, uh, making right. having less control over the space you're covering with your PK fires punish you. And Lucas's combos are a lot tighter and a lot harder to do, but oh, That's the edge guard! The mm -hmm. Yeah, we were. I was about to mention that when in disadvantage, getting control of that upbeat. Ooh, is Tev dead? No, he's able to make it back. Yeah, but that side magnet is going to be so prevalent whenever someone's in disadvantage because you can just snipe someone's recovery out of the air. Yeah, both players can do it to each other, but it is easier to pull off as the Lucas because your side magnet is a little bit in front of you 
as opposed to Nessus, who is on top of him. Ooh, and so sick. far, we're not really seeing any great follow-ups from uh, Daku, not Taku Sky, from MKL Rising. We do see a little bit more here, but it's mostly just in stray hits coming in for MKL Rising. Yeah, that side B racked up a lot of damage, but again, here's going to be the challenge, is finding the kill move for both of these guys. They don't have the easiest setups, but they are there, and... So it's going to be, I feel like, off of a, a trap, basically. Try and set it up in the first place to try and land a grab or something like this upbeat. Almost clanked there for a moment, but yeah. good job by Ted to get out of the corner. Yeah, but MKL rising up so much percent here. One more hit and a back throw by the ledge will certainly take the stock. Meanwhile, it's a long, not even one more hit, just the back row from center stage will do it. Meanwhile, 58% on MKL Rising means that Tab has such a long way to go before the game is even even again. MKL Rising can build such a big lead for himself right now. Yeah, yeah but ooh, that was a big forward air. You could see Tab was lining up the down air spike, but that forward air coming through, getting the hitbox off just in time, and that was an interesting trade there. Yeah, honestly, the Psy Magnet might have actually saved MKL Rising, get, getting that healing right before taking the big sweet spot hit. And only 25% is the extra credit so far. Tev is keeping it very reasonable, but he needs to end this stock soon. Yeah, he's got to find a way in. You can see he's just kind of poking at the shield of Ness. He's got to find a grab. He definitely has to. 44 is a reasonable disadvantage, but you need to close it out very soon. And the down smash at the ledge will take it. And now Tev, the game's looking a little behind, but relatively even not after that, though. 81% lead for MKL Rising is very big. Yeah, clean string there off of one conversion. And now 15% is a start, but... Again, it's a lot of stray hits between these two. They haven't really been able to combo anything together. Yeah, and being behind to a Ness is so scary because he's a character with inevitability, right? If you get to 150, you're going to get back run, right? There's a hard cap on how long you can hold on to a stock for. And that's something that is not unique to Ness, but that a lot of other characters don't have that make him so scary to be behind against but that being said tev is very effectively running it back so far he has barely been hit for the last 45 seconds Ooh, that was a good catch oh he got greedy with that oh, up smash that and kill, the back yeah. throw is not going to kill yet but this is a dangerous edge guard Ooh, can he make it back yep bounces off the stage and oh and i love uh, these I'm... low recoveries from tev it doesn't matter because he gets caught out by the up smash, but I do like the low recoveries, not giving MKL Rising a chance to drop down Psy Magnet, but in the end it doesn't matter as he isn't able to get off the ledge effectively here. The first F smash Mitch's, but again, MKL Rising just runs under and up smashes a second time, closes out the stock and earns one point for his team. Kanisha's College's lead getting a little bit bigger and now MKL Rising putting Tev on set point is very important because if he wins this, the lead will be very, very large going into game match five. Yeah, MKL Rising, they're able to clean up the set just by uh, throwing up that anti-air, the, the up smash. But, I mean, it just was so back and forth, right? It, it felt like even though uh, MKL Rising had the advantage, Tev still had his opportunities to try and close this set back out, try and make it more even, but... MKL was just able to, you know, string together more hits at the end of the day. Yeah, it's really, really interesting how this dynamic has played out between the two players. It was a close game. It looked very one-sided for MKL Rising for just a little bit there, but a great run back from Tev nearly secured things. And on Tev's counterpick, I can see it going his way in the future. I fully expect this to go to game three yeah and i mean part of that is the matchup right because these mm -hmm. characters do a lot of things uh similarly but they also have very distinct differences that we talked about earlier so it's all about now the adjustments how do you adapt between games one and two you need to adapt by just getting hit by less 
PK fires. You need to Psy Magnet more if you're Tev. How many fires did we see MKL Rising successfully eat with that Magnet? Versus, I don't think we saw a single one get eaten by Tev, right? Right, and, and I don't remember how much percent it actually recovers, but anything... It's not even about recovering in, percent. It's right. Like, if you eat the fire, you don't eat the second fire, which leads into a forward air, which leads into a forward air. So, like, instead of healing for, like, four or five, you're taking, like, 35. It's really bad if you don't, if you get hit. And that's the other thing, too, is that that's kind of what gave MKL Rising the advantage in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Is the ability to string together more hits. I mean, how many stray hits... I mean, we talked about how many stray hits there were in this yeah. matchup, but eventually, you know, that's the thing about Lucas versus Ness. Lucas has a lot harder time in this type of matchup stringing together those hits. He can find those openings, but they're a lot tighter windows. We're going to Kalos, which is a diet FD here. I expect <laughs> to see a pretty similar game. These ledges don't really impact either character's recovery. Both players are going to be going low to recover and just snapping the ledge, so... Honestly, very little of a change in terms of the stage here. It's all going to come down to playstyle adaptations from Tev if he wants to make the run back happen. It, and if you think about the way that these characters kill too, a lot of them kill Rising's kills aim off the top. So I do like the adaptation to give yourself a, a higher ceiling. Mm -hmm. But both these characters also have pretty good kill potential off the sides. So really edge guarding i think is the name of the game here especially you know post neutral absolutely if either player is able to get a side magnet gimp on the other's recovery it's going to completely swing the tides of the game you can kind of see neutral is just you know spacing out between the two of them, the, the, between the side magnets the side bees they're just kind of it's a proverbial jab, right? It's, it's not yeah. an actual jab in game, but it's just kind of, you know, filling out still because both of them know this first stock is so important. Mm -hmm. And neither player able to find any really solid opening, but Tev is out to the early percent lead, dodges out, mashes out of that PK fire, gets away from the forward air. Now at 140, MKL Rising has to be very careful. Something like an up air an up smash, even like a down smash from this Lucas will be killing, so you need to be smart and try and use this rage to close out the stock just like that, and now MKL Rising feels a lot more comfortable. He's in the lead, immediately gets evened up, but it went from a bad situation to a neutral situation for MKL Rising, so it feels great. And all it took was one opening, one side B is all he needed to convert that into an up smash and then right off platform that's one of the things that you'll notice about uh college players watch the way that they play after they've taken a stock right what do they do afterwards do they put themselves into a corner like tev did and then get grabbed for it or do they find a way to weave around that invincibility yeah, weaving around the invincibility can be so hard though, but you do need to try in this match still as even as can be only 10% separating the two players right now as these PK fires have been putting in a lot of work for Ted this match. Uh, MKL Rising leaning off of that down B button a little bit more in game two here. Yeah, and I feel like he wants to kind of press the attack a little bit more, but it's it's so difficult, right? We mentioned, ooh, that was another good catch there on the side mm -hmm. B, but uh, one of the adaptations we mentioned was Tev's use of side magnet, and he still has not been able to catch some of these side Bs, and it's, that's how he's eaten, you know, half of his percent here. Yeah, like, the difference between Lucas and uh, Ness in terms of PK fire is... Oh, that's a bad angle. Unfortunately, Tev got the bounce off the side of the stage. Not what you want to see, but the difference between Lucas and Ness's PK fire is like, when Lucas hits you with the PK fire, you're annoyed, right? You're knocked back. You take like 9%. It's annoying. When Ness hits you with PK fire, this happens, right? You take 34. Yeah, it's it's a huge difference because it's, it's such an easier setup, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's, it's just so difficult now if you're Tev to really try and close this out because Ness, I mean, he's a light character, but he's still not at kill percent. No, he's not. Unless it would be something like a oh, half charge up smash, it would have to be what does it. Now at 117, he looks a little better, but 
The air dodge might be the end of MK Rising stock. It is clean by Tev to close it out, but still down 46%. Means he still has to do a little bit of work to make things even, but he's feeling a lot better after MK Rising kind of gave him that stock. Yeah, I, I mean, and that was a good catch too by Tev. He needed that one to stay alive in this in this set, but 80% down is a hard task. Oh my goodness! It reflects and multiplies power. Oh my god. I forgot Ness's baseball bat as a reflector. There's a thousand ways I could have pictured this set ending, and I was not expecting reflected PK fire to kill. Yeah, uh, that that was that's the one in a million option, and uh, yeah. I oh that's just <gasps> that is essentially oh a bullet god. through the heart for Tev. Like Absolutely. that that one hurts. <laughs> but it be your own homies sometimes. <laughs> I mean. Because it was so back and forth. We were talking about the agency of both mm -hmm. PK Fires just a moment ago. Yeah. And it's the one thing that we hadn't mentioned all set was that both char both characters have that option. Both mm -hmm. uh, forward smashes can reflect projectiles. They never use it. They were so used to using side Magnet. The one mix-up came through in the clutch for MK Rising. Yeah, absolutely. Look, he even charged it, but the awareness wasn't there from Tev and he eats the punish that's going to be three more points going away of Kanisha's College now at 14 to 8 point not only would Fiction need to win his set to get a win for himself he would need to win big right now it's possible for Fiction to get a two stock and then a one stock with Flapjack earning no points and Niagara would still lose. A double two stock would tie for Fiction and we'd have to play a tiebreaker. That means if Fiction wants to win, he needs at least a three stock and then a two stock in addition to guarantee a victory for Niagara. It is that down to the wire, that far ahead for Kinesis. It's technically possible for Niagara, but it's such a tall order. Yeah, and against Flapjack, who's been one of the most consistent players ever since last season, uh, he's... It is so tough sometimes, and this is the type of guy that Kanish just loves to leave in situations like this. You know, the closer, the anchor, the guy that, you know, the one of the more dependable guys on this roster. <laughs> it's It's... Certainly, like you said, a mountain to climb. Yeah, that, that's not what you want to hear if you are Niagara University's fiction right now. You do not want to hear, oh yeah, Flapjack, he's the old reliable. He's the consistent <laughs> player. When you need to three-stock and two-stock him to get a victory, you don't want to hear, this is the guy who, like, he gets, though, even when he loses, it's only by one stock. Like, you need big wins from fiction to close it out. We have only ever had one other set in the entire two-year history of EGF have a team win three of the five sets and lose the match. And we might have it happen for the second time ever here. If Fiction wins this set, but does not win convincingly enough, strongly enough, his team will still lose. And this goes back to the, the format, right? That's mm -hmm. why game two was so important. Mm -hmm. uh, Daku Sky taking seven of a possible eight points gave them this lead. And so now Fiction has to replicate that. And yeah. that is so tough. It's why having depth on your roster is so important. If you want it in perspective, da da Daku Sky has earned literally half of his team's points. Yeah. Because of how strong his victory was. Yeah, and that was that was massive. And it's really, you know, kind of the turning point in the set. I mean, Niagara in game three came back, right? That mm -hmm. that that victory over A Fly was was huge to keep them alive in the set. But yes. then right here in game four, I mean 
that was another pivotal moment. And that's why the Mac is so fun, right? Even though you mm-hmm. feel like sometimes it's very topsided, you get matches like these where all of a sudden, not so, you know, distinct anymore. Yeah, it's it's very close to an upset. And I would definitely consider it even an upset if Fiction is able to pull it out over Flapjack here with all the cards stacked against him. But just the fact that we're here talking about the possibility of it happening is a testament in and of itself as we get in to game five the where it all lies critically important for fiction an incredibly clean uh falco player but going up against flapjack's crom is so difficult yeah and uh flapjack he is also very much improved between this season and last season one of the things you'll notice uh is he'll sometimes do the uh Kind of the melee Marth side B to stall out and wave bounce himself, you know, as another mix up, as another movement option, makes him harder to track down. And that's one of the things that Falco's really gonna have to struggle with is both these characters can move pretty fast, but outside of the projectile that Falco has, how is he gonna keep up with the fast sortie that Krom is? It's, it's rough. Krom moves so fast. The sword is in your face. Falco does not have good disjoints of his own to fight back against it, but he does have that reflector, which is more than just a reflector, right? It covers so much space on the safe. If your opponent is just running in your face, it can absolutely stuff them out if you use it properly. And so far, we've seen Fiction do a really good job holding off Flapjack's pressure, right? He yeah. gets the first stock, he only has 85% on him, and now he's looking to rack up even more extra credit. That's the one, one of the things too, uh, Krom's disadvantage, especially in the air here, is gonna be big. Finding a way back down for Krom is gonna be huge because Falco is all about keeping you in the air, and look at the damage being racked up. It's so brutal, in just one or two combo strings, Fiction has already lapped Flapjack in percent. And remember, we said Flapjack was good and reliable, but right now he's getting run over. Fiction needs a two stock and a three stock right now, and he's on pace for at least earning himself the two stock that he needs in this game. Yeah, if he can secure this next, or if he can survive this stock, a three stock is exactly what he needs. So this is massive too. too. And we need to see the ledge trap from Flapjack. He stands so far away it's at center stage on Krom. The reason you're playing this character is for that ledge trapping prowess. And if you're not going to use it, you really need to clean up the rest of your game. But we don't see it from Flapjack. 142. Flapjack needs to take this stock so bad, but Fiction does not want to let it happen. Ooh, oh, that's there huge. it is. He has not used back air almost mm-hmm. all set and finally throws it out. And now ooh, that laser is actually going to be so good because it, it can catch Krom out of his upbeat and set up for a down air. Yeah. It almost doesn't even matter though. The damage is done for Flapjack. All Flapjack needs is one more stock either right now or in next game, and he'll guarantee a tie at worst. And it would not be the first time that Canisius would be in a tie. They were in a tie against Quinnipiac uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, tiebreaker scenarios, uh, we, we're no stranger to them. Canisius, no stranger to these tight games. But It might not even have to happen, though, as Flapjack is really running this stock back. He hasn't been hit for a solid long time. The up, the side be barely clipping him, but there's no follow-up. And now with Rage on this Krom, the Light Falco could just lose his stock very soon. That side B will kill if he yeah. catches it by a ledge. Uh, no back air. Oh, this is dangerous. Oh, the dash, dash attack. attack. Not going to do it yet. Can Flapjack he find a way back to so stage? so bad. If he can get this stock right here, it's so huge. But the side B sent air all the way across dangerous. the stage. It doesn't kill. Great oh. stage spike. Flapjack guarantees a tie at worst. But he is finding more hits. He's looking for blood right now as he's trying to complete the reverse three stock at 161%. Gets the parry, uh-oh, okay. in disadvantage. I, mm, oh, down tilt's gonna do it though, tilt. yeah. Catches yeah, the pressure dropping shield. The pressure on shield. One of the things that 
Flapjack is not afraid to do is go off stage and go for that up B spike. So the Absolutely. second he got that forward tilt to knock Falco off stage, mm -hmm. I, or the down tilt, I should say, right there, I thought he's going to run off an up B because that up B, yeah. it spikes and it kills your opponent first. It's it's not it like in inside. So, uh, you know, great stuff there by Fiction to eventually close that set out. But the damage, as we said, is already done. Now it's going to take a near perfect game to send this to overtime yeah it would have to be a three stock victory from F fiction just in order to tie things up and honestly that game looked like it had a lot of three stock potential but then flatjack just got two stocks back to back with really really clean play and if he keeps that momentum going forward into game two, I think he'll be able to seal it out. And I've mentioned it before, right? You know, uh, Falco was up, you know, two stocks, three to one. Mm -hmm. And then he starts hunting for that kill move because he sees Krom at such a high percent. But Flapjack's survivability, his ability to just, you know, space out at those high percents is so important. Because, you know, you think of Krom as this character that, oh, if I just send him off stage, his recovery is not that great. I, you know, I can probably just secure the stock by getting him off stage. But the spacing and the ability to get around those moves that just are thrown out willy-nilly. Think of how many side Bs Falco threw out just trying to mm -hmm. connect a stray hit into something, right? And Flapjack was able to space around that and just outlive two full stocks of Falco. Yeah. At some point, Falco starts to experience a little bit of trouble killing his he relies on a lot of confirm, like up throw back air, up tilt back air, and side B back air to find kills. And once his opponent gets too high of a percent for those to be guaranteed combos, it becomes a lot harder. You need to get a raw read on something like an F smash or an up smash, and that's not where Falco wants to be. So honestly, getting to a high percent was almost a boon after some percentage point for uh, Flapjack in that game, and now we are getting into it, the final game. F Fiction has to three stock Flapjack in order to win right now. Yeah, uh, and another thing that I'm curious to see, we didn't see almost any grabs that game from either no. opponent or from either player. So mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see if either of them try and mix up and go for grabs because both of them have grab combos. They just didn't go for them. And oh my goodness, the damage from Fiction. Really big combo from Fiction. Luckily for Flapjack, he is able to break out and then find some hits of his own to even things up. And a great jab back air guarantees victory for Kanisha's Flapjack must feel so relieved and he's playing so much cleaner in this game too than he was at the start of game one yeah and he taunts because he knows too he knows that's all he needed and that's also something that flapjack has worked on is that uh that is a confirm the jab to back air especially at ledge so powerful yes. Uh, and it's a tricky skill to pull off. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's something you have to be able to do, especially at this level, if you want to be a top tier player. And there's another Flapjack's big looking side three stock fiction. That Absolutely side B is insane. deceptively strong. Uh, it's it, crazy. It, 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 you don't think because it's got so many hits to it, and there's the catch on the up smash yeah. to to answer back. But that side B's just got so many hits that in the first three it does so much damage. Oh, he wanted the drop zone dare right there. You could yeah. see it in his eyes. He had he saw the bird and was like, "You're going down." The ledge trapping from Flapjack on this crom is really really clean. He almost had it there. We saw the jab. Uh, Jab back air earlier, take a stock, and now only one stock remaining on Fiction Slapjack. Already won it for his team, but looking to just add some insult to injury here. Yeah, Ooh, caught by the laser. Not again, though. And uh, he's able to find his way out of the corner. The relief for Flapjack that he must be feeling as he completes a two-stock victory. Earns even some extra points for his team. He's going to take it to a game three saying, you know what, like, I heard you guys. I heard you guys telling me to just not lose too hard. I'm going to win. <laughs> well, 
I mean, look at the conversion here. That's such uh -huh. a clean pickup off the mist tech, right? He's got to read the mist tech first and then get the yep. jab to back air. And that's one of the things that Flapjack does really well is you see him charge at forward stage. He's, you know, praying for that roll in, but you see his awareness to pick up on that mist tech and then the uh, back air off of that. It's a hard conversion to do because you have to turn your character around to do it. Right? Yeah, you gotta get so, that uh, RAR in. Yeah, the RAR, that's the term I was looking for, thank you. But yeah, the RAR back air is something that, you know, between Krom and Roy, you have to be able to do it. Oh, it's so important. Especially on Roy, who's even more reliant on the ledge traps and those sweet spots to set himself up. Not only do you need the RAR, you need the correct spacing. It's just, it's so pivotal on these two uh, Echo characters. Yeah, and for Fiction there, he had his moments, but it was just, you know, one small opportunity here or there. I mean, look at Fiction. He's trying to hunt for an opening, you know, trying to get out of disadvantage. But these stray side Bs, it's, it feels like it should be a safe move, right? You think of all the other games where you fal you side B as Falco or Fox and you cover so much distance, you're, you're yeah. going so quickly, you probably cross up a shield while doing it. But in this game, that doesn't work out so well because, you know, the moves get laggier and laggier and it's just not safe. It's not at all. And for game three, we're playing for pride here. Flapjack trying to assert some dominance over uh, fiction. We are going to be going to Pokemon Stadium 2. And it looks like we might be seeing a character switch coming out. No, just... Lock on the stage. All right. I, I would have loved to see it. I was gonna say Flapjack has a pocket Kirby that I would have that, that I would have so not good. been shocked to to see come out. Now that knowing that so Kinesis good. has the the set in, in in hand, but I think he wants the points. I think he wants the point differential. He knows that yeah. you know Kinesis with the win here, they have a chance of getting a higher seed, and that point mm -hmm. differential is the tiebreaker. They you know any extra credit here. Uh, is massive and for Niagara too even despite the loss of a second team gets to that two win marker uh, Niagara trying to uphold that that point differential as well. So big yeah, game three sure. here When we're this close to playoffs these point differentials certainly matter not quite able to find the jab back at that time But already a nice early 50% lead for flapjacks eclipse with the up and actually Follows the drift to get the backer as well incredibly clean by flapjack yeah, and you see the movement afterwards too. Yeah, great job following the fade. And oh, he wanted the. I thought he was going in for a, a forward tilt there afterwards. But yeah, he is just determined to keep this bird off stage. Yeah, the ledge traps have been so clean by Fiction. Fiction, honestly, perhaps playing a little tilted. These side Bs are very punishable, being consistently punished for them. Down so much percent, a full stock and down percent is not where Fiction wants to be. And I, I think he knows it's over. I think he's sort of autopiloting a little bit. He played his heart out in game one and two, but it just didn't end up mattering enough. Well, on top of that, it's so easy as, you know, characters like Fox and Falco, mm -hmm. good job uh, spacing around that control. dash attack to get that down tilt, but it's so easy to be lazy with your recovery, right? Because side B is just so convenient. You get there quickly, you snap the ledge, but it's, again, you know, if you keep throwing it out, it's about reading tendencies, right? And Flapjack is all over these side Bs now. Yeah, he has absolutely covered it. Still up an entire stock, even percent as well. It means he is looking to close things out in style pretty soon. Good grab. Oh, he really wanted close. the... He knew, he knew the tech was coming through, but he could not get the forward smash off of it. Not quite able to, but Fiction stuck at the ledge once again, able to get out of the pressure, but not many more times in the bank of being able to survive that. 105, 125, some rage onto this Krom as Falco is pretty light and in range of something like a jab back air killing or just a raw F smash. Or dash attack will do it too, and that's going to be it. Another two stock going Flapjack's favor brings the final score to 20 to 9. Yeah, 
and that's a solid win for Canisius. You know, that's exactly the type of win that they need to head into postseason with because that gives them, you know, a decent point differential. Mm -hmm. It gives them a shot at a higher seed. And, uh, you know, they're just now kind of waiting to see how the rest of the MAC plays out. Absolutely. Congratulations to Canisius for placing so high, getting the win. Flapjack really clutching it for his team in the end when it mattered. Very impressive showing from all these players, especially uh, Daku Sky earning um, uh, over a third of all of the points for Canisius in this match. A really great showing from both teams, but it is Canisius who comes out on top in the end here. Yeah, Niagara has had these moments of brilliance, right? They, mm -hmm. they, you saw Fiction in game one looked so clean, but again, it's about, you know, the, the minute things. You see there the dash attack being spaced around the laser was so clean, and, you know, Flapjack's spacing throughout that set really allowed him to keep battling and stay alive and continue to just grind out that set, and... If you're Niagara, you know, it's not necessarily back to the drawing board, but there's just a few things that, you know, gave Canisius the edge here. And if they work on those few things, this is right back to an even game. Absolutely. But that being said, we can only talk about Canisius for so long. Coming up next, we have Quinnipiac University going up against Marist College. These are two heavy heavy hitters both teams at five wins marist one loss and quinnipiac at two losses means both these teams are going to be at the top end and fairly equally matched so make sure you stay tuned we're going to go to a break get all the players and get everything set up and uh it's going to be an absolutely insane match coming up to next Okay, hello everybody. We just got off of a insane, insane match between Niagara University and Canisius College. A grudge match, a rivalry, barely going Canisius College's way. It was down to the wire, down to game five. But now we have 
Quinnipiac University and Marist College duking it out for probably third place standing once all the dust settles and tiebreakers are decided. This is going to be an incredibly important matchup between these two teams, and we'll have to see how it ends up panning out. First up, we have Riley for Quinnipiac going up against Rograt from Marist. Yeah, uh, both of these guys, very consistent players for their lineup. So a very important game one. And as you said, you know, these standings are very important. You know, winner of this probably gets third seed, uh, depending on also how St. Peter's does uh, on the second stream. So, you know, both of these teams need this victory here. Important to note, it looks like Marist is running somebody I've never seen in their lineup before. I've seen a lot of Marist games, and I do not recognize recognize the name Sniffles. Uh, I think Zucchini usually plays. Sniffles played last week and did not do amazing, but uh, normally I'm used to seeing Zucchini in this final slot. Raga, Anagram, Randomane, Abso, and Zucchini. So we'll have to see if Sniffles is able to step up to the plate because Zucchini is typically one of the hard hitters for the Marist lineup. Yeah, I believe Zucchini is the uh, typically captain. the captain of this Marist team. So uh, an, an interesting substitution. But you know, both of these schools, I believe, working from from home basically, as you mm -hmm. know, they're starting to both. You know, it's college, it's semester is starting to come to a yeah it's coming to that that point where finals are right around the corner so uh this is a busy week for them and so you know this is this is big stuff for them yeah it's it's really really big maris another one of the teams that went very far in the bracket last year i believe I think they made finals. They were yeah, they, they made lost finals, yeah. They lost uh they they were they were the number 4 seed I believe. Mm -hmm. Upset the number 1 Canisius seed uh and then lost in a close one to Siena. I literally cast finals. finals. Why do you know more than me about this? <laughs> it was <laughs> oh, I guess it's all just a blur now. It's all just like slurred together. It was, it, it was, uh, it feels like a forever ago. <laughs> it, it really does. Everything feels like forever ago. Let me tell you what. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Quinnipiac was also in the league last year, but last year, I mean, this is a, a huge improvement for the, uh, the Quinnipiac lineup is completely different. Yeah. yeah. They last year were seventh seed out of nine. Yeah, they were uh, they not were, great, but uh, uh, they they fell behind early and could not pick themselves back up. But this year, complete turnaround, battling for this third seed, I, and we talked about it too. You know, this is uh, if you're in the top three, mm -hmm. you get one of the bottom three seeds uh, yeah. in your first round. So this is you know about making your your path easier for a championship. And both of these teams, a win here makes that path a whole lot easier. Because right now, you lose this matchup, you're probably going up against that Canisius team that uh, just beat Niagara. So, oh yeah, no, this is very, very important for both teams to pull out the win. And uh, Quinnipiac, one of their big players is Baco, who is a kick player I have played against a lot. He goes to the same locals that I used to. And uh, I don't know how the seating worked out like this, but I swear to God, I got him round one every single time I went to a local <laughs> that he was there. And let me tell you what, every game was like last hit, last stock, and I never won. He's, <laughs> well, at some point he's just he's toying a pretty with clutch you, right? player, yeah. He's a pretty clutch <laughs> player. He definitely pulls out the wins. He plays Shulk, and God, that character is just absolutely disgusting. He has been playing Shulk since Smash 4, when that mm. character was a lot worse than he is now. So he gets to, it's great. He gets to play the high tier while also telling you he's not playing it because it's high tier. He just gets yeah. the best of both worlds. It's crazy. It, but I that mean, being said, we are going to get into it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious to see, right, Rograt is the Greninja and Riley going Mario. Yeah, Riley uh, has been playing Mario with this skin the whole time. That's not a, yeah. that's not a new development, but... Uh, I, just, I never remember what Riley plays, so every time I see right. Mario, it always feels so weird. 
Right, and both of these characters, this is going to be, I feel like, a very fun match, because both of these characters I think love so to just be in each other's face. Oh, for sure. Both these characters really love playing that mid-range boxing game. Uh, Greninja plays a lot more vertical. He likes to abuse his high jump height and uh, auto-cancel aerials to abuse fast falling from out of range and a hit and run playstyle to bait around your shield. Whereas Mario likes to weave around you and apply pressure just by being in your space. But out the gate, Rograt is pulling ahead with an early lead. Yeah, and uh, oh, but now here's the, the uh, disadvantage. Rograt in disadvantage against Riley. If Riley plays very defensive, this gets a whole lot tougher for Rograt. Yeah, uh, Greninja's landing tools are not incredible. You mostly have to rely on fast falling and auto cancelable aerial and trying to catch your opponent slipping or maneuver around their shield. If you're feeling really bold, you can try and land with a tomahawk, but most of the time, your opponent can kind of just sit there and shield and react to whatever you do. Yeah, tom tomahawking is so dangerous because you're approaching with nothing, right? You're, you're yeah. showing that your hand's kind of empty. So... Ooh, that four or sorry, that's that Mario up smash is also one of the best in the game, and I am surprised he didn't throw it out there. I'm a little surprised, but uh, Riley looks a little bit uncomfortable in the matchup so far. Down 69, 75 percent on the second stock, still unable to take Rograt's first. Both players go for the grab, but Rograt's comes out faster, and already it's a three stock to one advantage in Rogat's favor, and the kill doesn't look like it's coming soon for Riley, which is not where he wants to be. This extra credit is feeling very, very brutal. Rogat's spacing right now is fantastic. Ooh, that was a little suspect, but gets out of it and finds a way out of the corner. Yeah, but we need to see Riley finding a hit. 43% misses the jab confirm. Very important. Rograt does not find the jab lock, but at 156, this stock has to go. Back throw probably doesn't here, though. Oh, not quite. Great DI to survive it. Oh, he fast fell. That's... Oh, that, so what happens there is he's trying to grab the ledge. He's trying to fast fall down to grab the ledge, but if you're going by the ledge and holding down, you actually don't grab it. And so he expects to grab the ledge and instead just falls right past it. Very, very unfortunate. The great jab locks out into another drag down jab lock with the forward smash isn't there in time. I think that would have taken the stock. Rograt, nonetheless, up a ton of percent, up a full stock still, jumps over the forward air, finds the counter, and now it's Riley stuck at the ledge, getting ledge trapped in the forward air, closes it out a two stock, for Rockrat is a comfortable lead for uh, Marist, saying they're going to keep snowballing this lead unless Riley cleans things up a lot. That was one of the more commanding two stocks we've seen because yeah. even though you know it, it feels like oh it's only a two stock right that's mm -hmm. still massive in terms of points and. It just felt like Rograt, you know, his positioning, his spacing was so much better. It felt like Riley was kind of, uh, not necessarily swinging for the fences, but you could tell he was just kind of trying to find an opening with a with a kill move rather than with a confirm of some sort. Yeah, even the one death that Rograt did have was an SD, and it was an SD at very high percent, don't get me wrong, right? Like, that stock, that stock was gonna go at some point, but... He, like, even when Rograt lost a stock, they lost it to themselves instead of to the opponent, which is, it's not how you want the game to be playing out. You want to be the one setting the pace. You want to be the one forcing your opponent into bad positions and taking stocks yourself, and Riley hasn't been able to do that so far. And thank you once again, uh, Replay, for that that replay of the last stock. You actually noticed he outspaced the, uh, or outtimed the, uh, What's that? Spot dodge that from mm -hmm. ledge. That, that's such a... Feels like you know a safe option, right? And you see Riley's just trying to play defensive. He's back, gets up, yeah. neutral gets up, and then there's the spot dodge, and the timing really of it great timing, yeah. is, is so perfect for Rograt. And getting the edge of that forward uh, forward air makes it you know so much more powerful, right? It, 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 it's the full extension of it. And so there's just great spacing from Rograt in that set. Mm-hmm. Looking toward game two, 
I need to see more clean boxing. I need to see more of Rograth's approaches punished. Um, out of shield up smashes are an incredibly powerful tool that we didn't really see any of. And Greninja is a character who loves to play around the opponent's shield. You have those fast canceling forward air and neutral airs, so you can try and space things properly on the opponent's shield, but Mario has the tools to punish it, and we don't quite see it paying off for yeah. Riley. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you saw Rograt went all in on just diving in on this shield, going for grabs, going for side beasts, things like that. You know, he never, I don't, I mean, he threw out maybe two or three neutral bees, but ooh, the switching characters to Piranha Plant. This also works uh, in terms of playstyle and what Riley needs to adapt to, but uh, we'll see how this works. You know, Rograt was going all in and Plants is another character where he can kind of stay still and punish that type of playstyle. He definitely can. They actually did a very good job of giving Piranha Plant the stationary plant feeling. He's pretty slow, he's pretty immobile, but he has so many great tools out of shield with that up smash. He has so many great, uh, the neutral B as well, to really punish the opponent trying to go in on him unsafely. So far though, we don't see Riley really utilizing it as it's a 7 to 51 lead for Rograt. Yeah, and uh, it's so difficult too, because you, you think that, you know, going in on this character is safe, right? But Riley's tools, th here's the issue. Rograt's spacing right now is that he's very cautious about when he goes in. You see, he's trying to space around things like these down B that, that Riley's throwing out, and he gets the jab lock for it, but almost able to clean up the stock. Yeah, I think the biggest thing about this product plant pick is it doesn't exert active pressure nearly as much as Mario. Rograt feels a lot more content to just throw shurikens and force Riley to feel the need to walk up. Whereas when Riley was playing Mario, if you try and do that, Mario's a lot faster. He can be in your face, punish those shurikens. He can even reflect them back at you. And that's just something Riley cannot do on this Piranha Plant. Yeah, and you can tell Riley, he's trying to throw it. Ooh, that was a big miss on the up smash. Just misspaced it. Great and the armor, armor coming through. Yeah, that was huge. But you can tell Riley's just kind of trying to throw out ranged options like down B and neutral B to try and, you know, throw Rograt's positioning off guard, but Rograt's, you know, just saying, okay, well, if you're going to throw this out, I don't really have to move to avoid this. I can just plan my next move while this is happening. And there's a shuriken. Well, once again, I was talking about it, right? Like, there's not a really good tool for Riley on Piranha Plant to deal with this shuriken that just gets charged up at range and then released to apply passive pressure. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, at 120, Greninja's pretty light. He'll die to a strong hit, but for Piranha Plant to try and go in to Riley try and land. Yeah, that is that is the issue here, is how do you find the strong hit? It's so hard, especially when Raga is playing so evasive. Great grab. And the spacing Ooh, of it, it too. Good. Oh, oh, okay, that was actually smart. If he connects that counter, that's mm -hmm. actually the stock. It's a kill. Mm -hmm. Expecting Riley to mash out a disadvantage, doesn't find it. Great spike ball evens up the stock count, but the percents are still so heavily favoring Rograt right now. And Piranha Plant is not a character we think of as having really crazy comeback potential, right? Maybe if you get like a grab inside the smoke cloud, you can make something happen. But other than that, it's very rough. And with that shadow sneak taking the stock lead back in Rograt's favor, it looks quite bad for Riley. And that's the first real shadow sneak we've seen from Rograt, too, a, a mix-up of an option. You feel like Greninja's throw out more, but Rograt using it very sparingly, and it's worked out. Yeah, it has. It's something that's pretty telegraphed and punishable when you're doing it a lot, but when you don't use it, it's something your opponent has to always be thinking about, right? Because of that animation where you just stand still. I also really like Rograt's uh, mix-up on his recovery. He's going to mm, eat that down smash, though, to lose smash. his stock. Ooh, and he actually got the drag down up there. But I was saying about the recovery was that he's angling. It's, it works like Pikachu's, right? It's got two angles to it. So what he's done is instead of going, you know, 
out and up or out and into the stage. Instead, he's going at a lower angle first, which allows him to avoid any type of ledge trap that uh, or edge guard that Piranha Plant has set up. Yeah, it's very standard for characters like the Pikachu, like the Greninja. You always want to make the move that goes to the stage be the last one. So there's the minimum chance of getting clipped while trying to recover. I like the attempt at the down B, but great movement from Riley. And then the ledge trap forward smash with Rage seals the deal. And it's actually Riley, despite being down the entire time, taking the game and earning another point. That was such a huge turnaround, too, because Rogra has the advantage, and he's just trying to push his advantage here. And that actually is really good edgeguard ut uh, utility that we didn't talk about, is that counter. But immediately, he just gets kind of lazy with his uh, recovery back to stage and bites a forward smash for it. Yeah, the, the down B attempt was really cheeky, right? It's like, if it hits, it looks really cool, and... You know, you can just stand in front of the ledge, but great awareness from Riley to get around it. And then it put Rograt stuck off stage, recovering, getting ledge trapped by Riley, which is somewhere Piranha Plant is very good. And we see it pay off perfectly, right? Riley finds the F smash and completes the comeback. And now we're going to a game three. Yeah. And uh, another thing, too, was just the fact that Greninja is such a light character in comparison to Piranha Plant. That Piranha Plant's survivability uh, really came into play there. The fact that he was able to fall out of that up smash and then, you know, weave around. This was actually, was, yeah, you see he goes for that back air to try and ledge trap. And then once again, reading the neutral get up seems to be uh, kind of the downfall of both of these players. They both tend to neutral get up and that's how mm -hmm. both uh, game one and two have ended. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to a game three, looking at the bands. It's Battlefield and Smashville band. Kind of interesting we're seeing a Battlefield band and not a Yoshi story band. Typically, we see those two bands together a lot of the time because they have that same platform layout. But we are going to be going to Kalos. And honestly, I think this might just come down to matchup inexperience for Riley. Uh, anyone who's seen a lot of Greninja would know that Greninjas really love the flat stages like FD and Kalos. So I feel like those are almost must bans against the character. I don't completely understand the thought process behind these banned stages, but nonetheless, we are going to be going to Kalos. It was left open, so we're going to be getting into it, and we are going to see Riley sticking to the Piranha Plant. Yeah, and I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If it won you the game, you might as well uh, try and ride it for game two. On Kalos, though, I, I still feel like this benefits Greninja because of those walls, because he can recover even easier now, because he's got so much space to work with. Yeah, and I said it, Greninja likes to play a very vertical game. He likes to jump up high and then fast fall a very safe aerial, and on Kalos, there's no platforms to get in the way of that, right? He can just do it as much as he wants. He has so much room to run around and throw shurikens because of how wide the stage is as well. It's it's a classic Greninja state. It's where he wants to take you. So I feel like it was definitely a mistake leaving it open. It's it's exactly where Rograt wants to go. And if you, you think about the, uh, the blast zone that most of these uh, characters kill off of, or both these characters kill off of, Piranha Plant, a lot of their kills come off the top. So yes. having this high ceiling is actually much more difficult now for... makes this job much more difficult now for Riley than Rogra. Yeah, no, I think this is a great, great stage pick for Rogra. And already out the gate, we see it paying off double the percent on Riley. That's on Rogra. And 120 is certainly going to be kill percent for something like a forward air or a sweet spot up smash on this stage. Yeah, and you see they're kind of back to the neutral. Ooh, that's a that's going to be some dangerous damage dealt now. Good grab by Riley. We really never saw him get a lot of grabs in that game, too. And now back trapped at ledge. Oh, the scoop on the up smash. Really, really great by Riley catching the shadow sneak with the up smash. And now it's Riley with rage keeping Rograt in disadvantage, looking to complete the run back. 
<laughs> good by Rockrap to get out of the way of that down B. That could have been a lot of damage, but already 51% of extra credit racked up, and the Shadow Sneak doesn't even kill. Here's the issue, though, with this stage that Greninja's fine against characters like Plant. Plant's survivability, the, the weight of this character, keeping Plant alive at such a high percent. He's 72% extra credit as Riley loses his stock, but the damage is already done. Oh, it's for sure done, especially with the kill power. We've seen Riley bring out. That was so close to being it right there. That could have been the stock. The forward smash not quite going to kill, but now at the ledge, this is such a tense ledge trap. The get up attack makes it past the shield though, but the spike ball takes the stock and out only 52% on Riley. He has to be feeling so comfortable with Rograt on his last stock. It would take multiple consecutive neutral wins for Rograt to tie things up. And plant thrives in this type of scenario. Plant is absolutely a character that loves to just camp with the lead. And so now the the difficulty for Rograt is how do you hold on to your percent and still get this kill? It's so hard. Oh, you but don't the tech is attack. there. Yeah, that's Kalos. You gotta be able to tech those if you're gonna be taking the opponent to Kalos. But unfortunately, it's still Rograt so far behind. At least he wants to take this stop to forward. They're not going to do it though. Piranha Plant too heavy, and he Piranha Plant still has the juice to take it back once again. Great drift by Riley to make it around the counter, really not finding value for Rograt. The Shadow Sneak gets the stock, but 97% on Rograt means any strong hit from Riley will close out the set here. Yeah, and any trade will do it too, and that's what Plant loves to do in these scenarios. The neutral B gonna close it out. Almost the JV coming through for Riley. And after a bad game one, the character switch comes in clutch, completes the reverse 2-0, and earns four points to two in Quinnipiac's favor and gets them off to a strong lead, defeating the Ra defeating Rograt, defeating the first Marist player. And I wonder if that side B was a misinput, but there were so many opportunities for both of these guys to really close out the set. And at the end of the day, it just felt like the raw kill power is what Riley needed and was able to, you know, use, you know, more of a trap based gameplay. Let if, you know, if Rograt is going to come to you and try and rack up all this damage, uh, plant is that type of character that plays defensive and is able to, you know, punish that type of play style. Absolutely. Uh, it's just Rograt wasn't quite able to make the ad adaptations he needed, whereas Riley was. Riley cleaned up his gameplay, found some really important kills and closed it out. But with that set out of the way, we are going to be moving to game two. We're going to take a very quick little break as we make sure we have everything set up properly and we'll be back in just a few minutes.
All right, hello, welcome back, everybody. We are bringing you game two between Soul Cake and Anagram. Soul Cake representing Quinnipiac University, going up against Anagram representing Marist College. Yeah, uh, another big game, as you saw mm -hmm. at the end of the, that uh, first set, Quinnipiac was able to take the lead gain a little bit of momentum and soul cake i believe is quinnipiac sonic player who he's yeah. had uh he's had kind of an up and down season he's had his moments of brilliance but also some moments where you felt like he could have done more so this is a pivotal game for quinnipiac if they want to try and extend their lead here it is absolutely critical Three, two, that this goes one, well go! For the Quinnipiac player, they need to cement a solid lead with how things close they are. It could go either way, and whichever team really just breaks out first, it's going to be huge. And out the gate, Soul Cake with some nice percent getting racked up onto Anagram. Yeah, this is a, a good start for Soul Cake and an interesting matchup to say the least between uh, Lucas and Sonic. And on a stage like Smashville, where not a lot of space between these characters, it feels like it's going to be a more, you know, fisticuffs type of matchup. Absolutely. Both these characters have really good kind of campier zoning games, but also can definitely go in and box each other. And when those zoning games cancel out, we're going to see a lot more boxing. Great, great down smash covering the up B from Sonic. That's going to be something we're going to see a lot over the course of this set, I believe, is the low up Bs from Sonic being punished with that down smash. And it means Anagram is going to take the early lead here. Yeah, good stuff. That down smash so powerful, multi-hit, and it can catch ooh, the frame traps on uh, Sonic's recovery. But the, here's the question again. We ask this with other Sonic players too. How is Soul Kick gonna find a, the uh, kill move? And right there, using the spring to <laughs> gimp the uh, recovery, you know, oh, catching the grapple, that. and then yeah, the down smash afterwards. That's crazy that that worked, but still, Soul Cake is out to such a disadvantage. It's so easy to get that down smash against Sonic. It's really all about reading the upbeat timing, and as long as your opponent isn't mixing it up too bad, it's really, really easy. It'll clip them under the ledge almost every time. And now, it's a full stock lead for Anagram here. And if you hold on to it, it would be massive. It would completely mitigate the lead that Quinnipiac built over set one. But, mm -hmm. I mean, this is pretty back and forth. Uh-oh, Soul Cake in disadvantage. Oh, no, he can't use the up B in time. He goes too low with that uh, homing attack, I think. Maybe it was a spin dash. But either way, it's going to be the void for Soul Cake as a two-stock comes in for Anagram, and uh, even without that SD, it still looked like a dominant game. Yeah, Anagram looked like he was all over this, and yeah, that's a spin dash that can't, uh, the lag of that move just, you know, yeah. betrays him on that recovery, and regardless, it just felt like Soul Cake, once he was in disadvantage, the stock was already gone. Absolutely. It was just, it was so well played by Anagram. Being able to hit your bread and butter in the matchup, being able to get the down smash at the ledge twice to close out two of the three stocks is just so incredibly important because if you can't do it, you're going to have such a hard time finding kills. But if you can do it, it means as soon as Sonic is offstage, he has to be shaking every time. Right, and it felt like Soul Cake didn't even do that bad in neutral, right? You saw he got a couple mm -hmm. spin dashes off, racked up some percent, but... You know, when Anagram is hanging around that 70-80% marker, the hits don't start to string together as cleanly anymore, and that is the challenge for Soul Cake. How do you work around that? How do you find the kill moves at that weird percent where your combos stop working? Oh, yeah, the neutral was certainly fine. The neutral was pretty even for both players. It's just the punish game, the ability to find the kills when it mattered was completely in Anagram's favor. And 
I mean, we talk about the kill power of both of these characters. It, it's all smash attacks for both of mm -hmm. these guys. They do have uh, a kill throw here or there, but it's absolutely about you know find it, trapping an opponent in you know frames or something along those lines and finding a smash attack to do so. Interesting counter pick. Yeah, Soul Cake likes uh, Lilat. He comes here a lot, I believe. Yeah, and. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I do. Th I do know that these platforms do benefit Sonic because mm -hmm. it's just so easy to get up to them and cover them, and combo off of them. But I also feel like Lucas's ability to grapple to, to ledge using uh, his Zare is actually uh, better on, with these slopes. Yeah, it's certainly very nice. Lucas is also a character who's kind of prone to getting pineapple, but I believe they put like little invisible slants under the ledges that try and prevent it. So I'm pretty sure you get kind of directed up toward the ledge, even though it looks concave. You should get stuck in there. You, that's not what ends up happening. Right. And uh, it feels like, you know, once again, we're back in neutral and it's just about finding these openings. Soul Cake. Good conversion there. Oh, he's greedy, though. That up B is really not going to do much. It sends you too high. At, at Lucas, all he has to do is fade down. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't see a back throw from Anagram there to try and play for uh, stage positioning. But either way, it's not going to be a huge punish. And percents are dead even. Stocks are even. And it's going to be whoever finds this first stock is going to be out to such a massive advantage. No throw coming out from Anagram. Just bubbles. Anagram has an odd tendency to jab and then grab, which is, it, ooh, good up smash, up uh, smash. good job connecting, but it's very odd because uh, Anagram's grab is a tether, so it yep. has range to it, ooh, good use of the back of there, that last hitbox uh, spiking, uh, and so great job positioning for it, but jabbing afterwards gives soul cake time to react and do an option out of it you, because you see that grab it takes a little bit of time for it to come out it does uh, but it's been working decently well for him so far but now at a 97 percent he is not feeling comfortable he's down 60 percent here and it just keeps getting a bigger and bigger lead for soul cake yeah, and ooh, that was dangerous. Soul Cake's starting to read some of these get-up options from Anagram. He's realizing edge guarding Anagram is not going to be easy to do, so he has to find a way to ledge trap him instead. Yeah, it's so scary trying to edge guard a Lucas off stage because if you mess up any time and you die for it because of that PK rocket. How does Soul Cake? Yeah, there we go. Soul Cake finds a way down, and you oh. see he's trying to pressure okay. off stage, but. Yeah, even yeah, the, the springs, springs are just uh, not it. I'd rather just stay at the ledge and try it for a ledge trap than try to fish for these really greedy spring gems. But either way, it's just going to be the Rage F kill taking the first or the second stock for Anagram. And now he has a little bit of chance for extra credit because Soul Cake is having such a hard time actually finding any kills. And this ledge trap could be huge, but Soul Cake makes it out. And we talked about it too earlier. You said it best, the, the punish game right now. Soul Cake's punish game is really not on point, whereas Anagram has really done a better job of connecting these kill moves. Yeah, it's Anagram finding the bigger combos, finding the kills, and 173 as a Lucas is a very rare sight. Soul Cake really needs to find a way to end the stock. The back air finally does it. Anagram overextending for the combo, but already 62% of deficit is feeling very bad when your character is so chip damage oriented. And the up smash secures it. A one stock for Anagram means he's going to net five points in Marist College's favor and bring the total score to seven to four. Yeah, great stuff from Anagram. I mean, that up smash is so good. It covers so much and does so much damage. Uh, but really, as we said, and as you you really hammered it home, just Soul Cake does not have an easy way to kill Lucas. He had to, you know, secure that, that first stock by, you know, covering a landing option from ledge. And it felt like Soul Cake really tried to land these edge guards, but edge guarding Lucas with Sonic 
is uh, it's so difficult as you saw i mean outside of you know spring gimps and back airs what other option does sonic really have and it felt like he just didn't make the adjustment to go for ledge traps where he found kills yeah it's just it's such a rough matchup if you're not playing it so cleanly on the side of the sonic the burden really is on him to make big things happen and we just didn't see it come through for soul cake unfortunately so it's going to be anagram taking the lead back in maris favor and setting up for set three trying to let sniffles who's coming up next for maris take that lead and run even further with it up up against him it's going to be mr purple for quinnipiac university in what is going to probably be the pivotal game three when we come back from break in just a few moments Okay, hello, welcome back everybody. Quick little break as we get into set three. Mr. Purples representing Quinnipiac on this mess, going up against Sniffles on the Terry in what is probably going to be a pretty explosive matchup as almost every Terry matchup tends to be. Yeah, Terry is a very volatile character where it feels like I mean, he's got so many combos that just rack up so much percent. Two hits of that easy combo racked up 20. It's, it's, you know, crazy the damage output that Terry can do. And he's also got Go, which will come online in another 10%. Yeah. And that has plenty of kill potential as well. So plenty of yeah, uh, utility for both of these characters. There's plenty of potential, but... Terry is a character who really needs to rely on comebacks. His neutral tools are relatively lacking. He has no disjoints. His moves are relatively slow. His projectiles aren't great. And Ness preys on that so hard. Ness is a character who destroys bad neutrals. Yeah, and uh, on top of that, if you look at the way that you almost saw it there, the way Sniffles is going to try and recover with that up B, it can easily get sniffed out by that uh, by that yo-yo. So it's going to be a very dangerous game for Sniffles. Yeah, you, you have to prep that up B by holding down first when you're trying to recover against an S. But the problem is if you're offstage holding down, you're going to be fast falling. So you need your timing to be very, very precise to make it work and that dash attack doesn't kill that's not a good sight for sniffles as mr purple keeps extending his speed finally the jab jab up he takes it for mr sniffles but already 95 percent of extra credit has been racked up yeah good conversion there you don't typically see terry's go for that up b but uh you can see it racks up you know 30 up. damage just as easily as any other of uh terry's b moves mm -hmm. And now this go meter is online with a big set of hits for Sniffles 
almost makes Mr. Purple scared, but a great back air cleans up the stock, gets to go back offline, and now at only 82%, Mr. Purple has so much time to work with, and he is not wasting any of it. Falling into so many projectiles. I mean, it gives or it gets Terry closer and closer to that go, but it really hurts and because now we talked about Ness's kill potential on Terry is so high. How does Terry work his way out of disadvantage? He doesn't, I guess, is going to be the answer. That back throw almost killing already. Only 120% on the Terry when it comes to the next one for sure will do it. And with two stocks remaining on Mr. Purple, he even has a safety net, but the dash attack, he doesn't need the net. He completes the two stock victory, earns two more points, brings the score back to four to six. And this is an absolutely back and forth match between these two teams. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I mean, that's why these teams are ranked at where they're at. You know, both of them absolutely. have had their, you know, good showings here and there and they're trying to prove that they're the best in the mac and so it's such an important uh third set and for mr purple to come out swinging in game two in such a you know commanding fashion quinnipiac this is exactly what you needed i agree quinnipiac they have their anchor still down the line they have baco coming in later but they need to give it to him with not a lot of deficit to work with. So Mr. Purple getting these points, looking to take the set over Mr. Sniffles, put Quinnipiac actually in the lead is a very, very good position. And typically whoever has the lead after set three, two sets is not a lot of time to make up the difference. So you're typically feeling very comfortable. Yeah. And especially if this kind of trend continues in this mm -hmm. set where it's another two stock, like that's six out of a possible eight points. Yeah. We saw in the last Kinesia set where uh, Deku Sky got seven out of possible eight and it completely shifted, you know, the later sets from the line. It was no longer a, oh, just win the set and you win. It was a, you have to win big. So this is a pivotal game for Sniffles. It is very, very crucial that Sniffles plays his absolute best here to keep his team in solid contention. And we see the bands come through. It's going to be Lila and it's going to be Yoshi's story. The counter pick is for Terry. And I'll be honest, I really don't even know what stage Terry wants to go to. I feel like this matchup just feels so bad for him. Yeah, the disadvantage that Terry gets put in really bites. And yeah. you have, you know, plenty of combo ability but it's that fact that you have to weave in. Uh, Terry really struggles with projectiles, so yeah. it, it just is so hard to get in. And so Kalos is the pick. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be shocked to see a character switch here because it feels like this is the type of stage that would also benefit Ness in terms of giving him space to work with. Yeah, I agree. You, Ness gets more space. You don't have platforms to mix up your approaches. It feels like a very interesting pick if he if Sniffles is sticking to the Terry, and he is. I'm going to be honest, I have not seen a lot of good Terry's play, so there's probably something Sniffles knows about this stage that I don't, but out the gate, I do not think it feels that good of a pick. Well, if he can get Ness off stage is going to be key because his uh, his go meter will cover that, uh, that, that neutral B. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm blanking on the name, but that will cover yeah. the top platform above ledge. Mm -hmm. And it will also two frame on ledge. So that's what I'm thinking uh, Sniffles is looking at. But that implies that you can get Ness off stage in the first place. Yeah. And that's going to be the difficulty because stage control on Kalos... Uh, it's it's very volatile. But out the gate, a really, really good combo for Sniffles, keeping Mr. Purple in disadvantage the entire time, building 100% onto him already, only taking 34 in return, and now Mr. Purple has to be scared because Terry is not lacking in kill power by any means. Ooh, Mr. Purple going for a roll read, trying to catch Sniffles rolling in, but... Has Ness off stage for a moment, but can't do anything with it. Good forwarder to get himself out of the corner. Gonna do it though. Even with the high ceiling of Kalos, that jab, jab, up, he takes the stock in 71% on Mr. Sniffles on Terry and falling behind to a Terry is so scary because 
he's going to get go meter and normally it's like a comeback mechanic but when you're already behind the terry it's just something that makes him snowball his lead even further this is a interesting kickflip there but uh you know back into neutral what i think sniffles is doing a lot better is that mr purple is trying to space out with these projectiles but just mm -hmm. The quick little dash back to weave around it, and again, he's a Street Fighter character, so he's always going to be facing his opponent, right? He never mm -hmm. has to threaten with back air, but ooh, that down air, uh, well spaced, or down B, I should say. Yeah. That combo will kill at roughly 120, I believe. Mm -hmm. You've got to go online, but the stock might be going away pretty soon. Mr. Purple doesn't quite find it, and now he has to be so, so scared here. It, this is a huge opening for Sniffles, and there it is. That's what I was talking about. When you're behind a Terry, that go meter goes from a comeback mechanic to a snowballing mechanic, and the back throw doesn't even kill Mr. Sniffles. L Sniffles looking to keep the lead going so, so strong. Even if he uses that stock, he will still be a full stock in the lead, a complete reversal of how game one was looking to go. And he found a way back at nearly 200% yeah. too. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but the fact that he got 10% there mm -hmm. after, you know, we talked about Terry's disadvantage. The fact that he was able to get back at all and get that percent was massive. Yeah, and look at the movement. Look at these dashes, this little, this fox trotting from Sniffles. He's playing confident right now. And the fox trap too, it also allows him to just kind of dash back away from these projectiles that Ness wants to throw out and wants to land that gave him such an advantage in game one. Completely true. And Sniffle looking for an opening. Mr. Purple returning to the slower playstop. I got him here, but a really unsafe uppy gives him a little bit of a punish. This is looking for something. Finds a little bit, but no follow up. Both of them try to play very cautious. Terry looking for another grab here, but weaving around these projectiles is the name of the matchup. And ooh, crossing up the shield there was actually massive. Another unsafe up B. Oh, and that air dodge off stage might just do it. Yeah, Mr. Purple can't make it back, and it's going to be a counter two stock response from Sniffles. And what a reversal, too. We were talking about how tough this matchup would be mm -hmm. for uh, Terry. And in the end here, the Kalos pick working out perfectly for him. Yeah, it worked out great. I think the lack of platforms might have just helped uh, force the Ness into playing a more spacing-based neutral game. Where, yeah, the Ness can control horizontal space with PK Fire a little bit, but overall... There's no, like, creative way to weave around Terry's hitboxes. You just have to approach him head on, and that's not how you want to fight against a Terry. So I can now see why the pick would work out. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but now we go back to the counter pick war, and Mr. Purple gets the counter pick, and so this feels like a very dangerous game for uh, uh, Sniffles. It does. I expect something like Pokemon Stadium 2 to be the pick. It's actually going back to FD, which is... Very interesting, considering you just lost a two-stock on Kalos. Uh, but I guess game one was FD, wasn't it? I don't even remember. No, no it was it was Smashville, but another oh, similar yeah, yeah. type Very of, similar type of stage. stage. Yeah. I think it's kind of weird that you lose on Kalos and then you go to FD. Uh, but maybe um, Mr. Purple just believes that it's the matchup, he needs to figure it out, and the stage doesn't matter all that much, and it's somewhere he's comfortable. Or maybe he thinks last game was just a fluke. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, we mentioned, uh, you know, with stages come di the different blast zones. You can think about the way that these characters want to kill a lot of Terry's uh, so kills. I got the gate. Yeah, you're... Uh, I was about to stop my point and mention this. This is... Uh, this is Nintendo's servers uh, acting up just a little I just bit. Played so two games between these players just fine, but uh, now it just it just doesn't want to work. Okay, looks like it's a little smoother now. Okay, it looks like we're going. Uh, yeah. Well, regardless, I mean, in terms of the matchup, you know, you look at the blast zones mm -hmm. of uh, 
this stage, and I feel like it absolutely benefits Ness in terms of where he wants to kill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my Great goodness. <laughs> oh, oh, and it caught him! Yeah. I, I thought, thought the, he was uh, gonna. Burn Knuckle clipped the Ness to cancel the PK Thunder, but I guess not. I thought he was gonna fall behind the Ness and the Uppy was gonna hit him instead of Ness, but in for instead, neither of those, he ends up getting hit by the PK Rocket. And uh, that move is so good. It does so much knockback and so much damage. Yeah, it's incredibly strong and it's exactly what Mr. Purple needed to get an early lead, but he's having trouble this extra credit only 40 percent given how early he took that stock is not a lot but here's a really big opening for more 77 now is something mr purple can certainly be happy with oh no oh no well uh it looks like c we dc'd okay no. we're gonna try and let the players play it out oh it's a straight up no contest oh I think we're just gonna fully remake the game. There was one stock taken, but I mean, they were I'm playing the sure. whole game in lag anyway. Yeah, we will get an official ruling on this. Uh, Cause there was a stock taken, but yeah, it, you know. It's hard when, to when replicate is... percents. We'll ah. have to see what happens. I'm just yeah, gonna, that's, I, that's tragic. DCs are just tragic. Yeah, it's so awkward. We're going to take a quick little break while we get this all sorted out. We'll be back in just a few moments once we know what we're doing. So stay tuned. It shouldn't take you long.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We had one of the players disconnect, so we are going to replay the game, but because, um, yeah, because the match had already progressed, we are going to have uh, Sniffles, Estia stock, and then we're going to play it out like normal. We're not going to bother replicating percents. Uh, it's a little bit weird, but it's, it's the best we can do here. So we're just going to run with it as is. Uh, we didn't want to like cheat Mr. Purple, obviously, but we are completely back in the match now. So out the gate, we see Mr. Purple and Sniffles going pretty even. Yeah, and uh, ooh, good catch there on the up tilt. Not able to really convert anything off it. But the one thing about FD is the fact that there are no other platforms means that catching landing, <coughs> excuse me, catching landings is so important. Yeah, for sure. And Ness is such a good character at trying to catch landings. It's him off stage. Ooh, here comes that edge guard. Good drift there from Terry to get around that up B. Yeah, really, really good drift. But it's not quite enough that he needs to get. The back throw closes out the stock and now Mr. Purple looking for a three stock three to one here. Can he find that oob? And once again, uh you know who's it? Sniffles is really liking that uh jab to up B uh to get these kill confirms and so it's worked out but down still a full stock. He's got his work cut out for him. Yeah, it's a long way to go if Sniffles wants to make any kind of a comeback happen, especially if he keeps eating these forward airs. And there was almost another PK rocket. Oh my god. This is getting real dangerous for both these guys. You know, both doing some uh, very committal options on shield. Yeah, it's so ends here as Mr. Purple wants every single point to matter with how close this match has been. If he loses this stock, it's not the end of the world, but it's it's a pretty big deal. He really needs every single point he can get, but Sniffles looking to close it out here finds the up and now 65% as Terry. There's your certainly comeback potential right now. Yeah, and this is a huge uh, point we talked about you know, in terms of points, if Maris gets this, or if, if Sniffles can make this comeback happen, suddenly Maris leads Skyrockets. Absolutely. If Sniffles can make a comeback, Maris is already ahead by three points, and if they can get even more for them and close out the set, because remember, Mr. Purple uh, lost game two, right? So this is set point. This is game three right now very tense now both of them kind of hunting for an opening one more oh side b not going to come up with anything terry's got the oh, ghost sauce. oh is. my goodness go is incredibly powerful it's going to close it out and it's going to close it out in style as sniffles secures the victory and snowballs quinnipiax lead by another three points bringing the total 12 to 6 Maris or sorry Maris lead gets snowballed Maris now double Quinnipiac score and going into the last two sets a six point lead is very important I'm just astonished by you know the the fact that he had not thrown out that uh empowered side beat all game the Buster Wolf that's the yes. that's the name of it he had not thrown out Buster Wolf practically all set and the knowledge and awareness to realize, you know, that that side B was, uh, you know, not going to be safe to space around it and then use the Buster Wolf command grab to close out the set. And the other thing, too, is you talk, you're talking about uh, Sniffles' ability to, you know, uh, convert off of jabs into those upbeats. But here's that command grab we were talking about, the spacing. Look how much space that command grab covers and how much knockback it does. Ness, such a light character, is, you know, gonna get burned for it. Yeah, it's it's so rough against Terry. That comeback potential from the go meter is so brutal. Look at this final stock. It's insane. And he's, that, that's gonna be how it goes. 
Yeah, he's trying to throw out a, a side B there to try and cover more space because he knows that was that was the matchup all all day long was, you know, how does Terry weave in and out of these projectiles that Ness throws out? And eventually, you know, he uses it, we talk about mix ups. That's mm-hmm. the mix up that he had not used all set. So, you know, congrats to Sniffles for, you know, this was a clutch moment for Maris to give them this six point lead is massive with only mm-hmm. two sets to go. Quinnipiac's two players have their, their work cut out for them. Yeah, we'll have to be able to see if Random Man can clutch it out because if Random Man wins his upcoming set, he guarantees victory for Marist College. On the other hand, Billy Shilly for Quinnipiac University is going to try to stop that from happening. He's going to try and take the set for himself, even things back up, and you'll have to find out what happens in just a few minutes as we cut to another short break to get the players in the lobby. Hello, everybody. We have Marist College's Rando Man going up against Billy Shilly from Quinnipiac University. Pichu against Pac Man. It's uh, Rando Man on the Pac Man, by the way, and Billy Shilly on the Pikachu in what is a very weird matchup. Yeah, uh, this is a very intriguing matchup. I saw a lot of something similar to this at Canisius because two of our players were uh, Pikachu and Mm Pac-Man. So the way this matchup tends to kind of work is that uh, Pikachu just, or Pichu in this case, tends to just kind of find a way to, to space out and weave around the hydrant. It's very difficult for Pikachu to, or Pichu to deal with the hydrant in the first place. So they have to play a bit more campy than rush down because of things like that. The water pushing you away messes up a lot of your combos. So Pac-Man wants the hydrant on stage for the majority of the game. Yeah, one thing Pichu does have though is that those thunder jolts will actually go over the hydrant. They will climb up and over it. So uh, it's not as much of a wall in this matchup as it is in a lot of other ones. Yeah, and ooh, 
that was a good grab there. Uh, I believe the water actually pushed me to it, and the bell did not catch the up B. So now, uh, Random may trying to find a way back to stage. Great clip from the Thunder Jolt, but Pac-Man's recovery is too good. Barely going to eat much of a punish there. No kill throw on the P2 either, and living to 170 against the P2 is a very rare sight to see. This character has immense kill power at the cost of safety. P2, the lightest character in the game, and damages herself as well. Yeah, but uh, there were so many clean conversions. There's a, an up smash, though, from Rando Main. That up smash on Pac-Man, surprisingly good. It's got a little bit of a scoop hitbox to it, too. With a uh, bell misses. Yeah, that was actually huge because now he's got to charge up again and Pikachu, or sorry, Pichu, not going to give him the space. Yeah, and every time we're going to see this exact thing happen, right? It's going to be random in, falling behind in percent, getting comboed, but Pichu needs to put random in to like 130 to get the kill, whereas random in needs to put um, Billy Shilly to like 80 to get a kill, right? So. The percent will lie to you in this matchup very hard, yeah. especially once you start factoring in rage. Yeah, absolutely. And it, again, oh, it's about the down smash though. Yeah, that was huge because now you're up, you know, fifty percent, mm -hmm. and that down smash, it's deceptively good. Like it covers way more space than you think it actually does. Yeah. And I talked about it before with Shulk using Buster Monado from ahead, right? Whenever you do anything to give yourself <laughs> extra. Oh my god. That was a zero to death. Oh my god. He's dead. Alright. Well, that's an insane showing from from uh, Billy Shilly on this Pichu over Random Man, earning two more points. Back for Quinnipiac fairly dominantly. And Random Man just thinks he's safe, yeah. right? Yeah, all, he does. All that was, all that was, was like, okay, I'm at mm -hmm. still like 70%. This is yeah. probably fine, especially since Pac-Man has so much survivability uh, as Pichu off stage, right? You think about how long Random Man was off stage for in this set. You know, look how low he dips. He's in the bubble for so long, it felt like, and yet Pichu just the agency right look at how well pichu strings together moves and then right there that single hit of fair yeah. dragging him back down was yeah. massive because it led to this forward tilt and then he's in hit stun so pichu with the with her speed is able to get over and punch him straight down into the blast zone yeah an absolutely insane dare combo crazy awareness to even know you can go for that from billy shilly and what i was saying before is that like when you fall behind to a Pikachu, right, or to a Pichu, it's just like Shulk, right, uh, in that they don't care about their percent anymore, right? Like, the Pichu right. is going to combo the mess out of you, and it doesn't matter anymore if the Pichu is hurting themselves because they're comboing you, they're getting extra credit, and then any percent they take, it's, like, already forfeit. It doesn't matter anymore because they already have the stock lead. So it just feels so bad to fall behind to them. And even though Pichu damages themselves when throwing out electric moves, it's not like they're, you know, racking up percent on themselves. The damaging yeah. themselves only doesn't, it doesn't even do a full percent. So they can feel free to throw out moves, you know, however they please. And it's just such a clean character in terms of how many, you know, multi-hits they can string together and how many different hitboxes they can throw out. It's really, really crazy. This character was one of the best in the game when this game first came out. And it's uh, coming from Melee. It's so funny to talk about how, like, Pichu has been nerfed <laughs> so many times because it was such a dominant character. But it's true. They've had to increase the self-damage percent. They've had to lower knockback on multiple moves. They've had to lower the combo potential. It's just, it's insane how many times this character still had to be nerfed. And it's still such a strong, high-tier pick. Yeah, it, it, that's just a... I, I mean, you saw there, like, why this character is so good. Pac-Man can live forever off stage. He, he's mm -hmm. deceptively heavy. He's campy. You know, he's he's got all these u utility to uh, really wall out a character who's quick and fast like Pichu. And yet, one combo. 
One. That's all it took. One simple little, you know, uh, falling forward air into forward tilt set up that 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 drop zone dare. Yeah, it's Pichu is such an explosive character. I miss seeing Pichu so much. It's one of my favorite characters to see in the whole game. Yeah, it, definitely an explosive character, and uh, you see stage bands coming through. Kalos off the board, along with Lilat. Lilat makes sense. A lot of uh, Pichu and Pikachus love that love stage. stage. This also makes sense, although I feel like Pac-Man also kind of likes Kalos, uh, again, for the survivability, but uh, I'm kind of curious to see where we go. I feel like Pac-Man still likes to have space to work with, so wouldn't go to a stage like a Battlefield or a Yoshi's. Mm -hmm. But the rest of these stages still feel like they benefit uh, Pichu. I mean, you know, running it back to FD seems dangerous, but it yeah. also, you know, the, that match I had its back and going forth to moments. Stadium too, right? Probably. Maybe Town but and this... City I could see? Maybe. Yeah. I feel like Pichu didn't really use Thunder a whole lot in that match, mm -hmm. so you know, putting those platforms in the way kind of mitigates that. But this match was so back and forth until that one... And that's the power of a zero to death, right? That's just one stock gone in the blink of an eye. Yeah, it's... Pichu is just such an incredible character with so much kill power. But it's the epitome of glass cannon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, this character... Uh, you know, Glass Cannon sums it up perfectly. You can output so much damage, but as you said, Pichu, lightest character in the game. I wonder if Random Main will try and take advantage of Pichu's lightweight and go to a stage where you can kill earlier, like a uh, like a Smashville or a Yoshi's story instead. I feel like you'd still want to avoid triplats, but you know, maybe the, the play here is to go for, you know, you're gonna die early, you know. Let's let's let you know that, that that's gonna benefit the heavier character. Yeah, I have word that it's going to be town and city coming in as the pick, which makes perfect sense. Uh, I said it. Pichu is a character who likes to abuse triplats because of the incredible combo potential, and town and city gives you the safety and variety of approach options, as well as the potential to have that ceiling over your head. Um for Town and City, but it doesn't really give Pichu that insane platform combo potential, so it's a really good mix of both. Yeah, and, uh, at, yeah, we weren't gonna see a character switch after game one. It was, mm. it was so back and forth until one moment, so, uh, we'll just have to see the in-game adjustments, uh, from both of these players. I'm kind of curious to see, you know, how, uh, Randomain uses these platforms. Yeah, immediately goes to the top platform and tries to charge up for Bell. Yeah, Pichu has a pretty hard time getting up there easily. Uh, it's very cool and you have to expend your double jump and then even if you're up there without your double jump, your combo gets stuck so you have to land and then that takes time. So it's rough, but right now it's still a nice early combo, good early pressure for Billy Shelly over Randomain. And uh, you can kind of tell, fight. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm blanking great on pair. Billy Shilly. Billy Shilly, yeah. Yeah, great pair there. Uh, despite you know, uh, Random Main's ability to kind of wall out Billy Shilly, just kind of going in without fear. Yeah, Billy Shilly, playing how you need to play Pichu, right? You need to be aggressive. <laughs> great leg trap. Oh my god, Billy Shilly has been blowing my mind with this Pichu gameplay. I haven't seen this character in so long, and it's just, it's so crazy how you have to play this character to have success. You need to have those hard reads. You need to predict your opponent. It's such high risk and such high reward. It's so exciting. And there is the high risk as Pichu dies from across the stage of 80. Yeah, I mean, on the other, oh my goodness, yeah. Really uh, Billy Shilly's reads are on point right now. He has got Rando main down, and 
you would think that, you know, Rando Main is one of the more consistent players in this Maris roster, and yet, Billy Shilly, we have not seen him really use this Pichu all season. Where has it been? Yeah, Billy Shilly has so many tools at his disposal, and he's using a lot of them so well, but right now things are staying a lot more even. Random in, keeping things much cleaner, still down a little bit, but once again, this is a matchup where percent really can lie to you. That back here is so good. Multi-hit means it's going to rack up a ton of damage, and it's got plenty of knockback. Trump. What a ledge trump! Trumping is an option you very rarely see in this game because you can instantly roll up. You can buffer a ledge option to avoid getting trumped, but Random Man not ready for it, not expecting it. Billy Shilly fighting the trump back air is huge. Yeah, and now on the last stock, I mean, this is big for Quinnipiac. If they can secure this stock with, if Billy Shilly can hold on to us, oh, the jab reset, that's it's it. so strong. Oh my god, Billy Shilly's insane. Billy Shilly be popping off! And, and now that's it's huge. dead tied. Yeah. And so it's gonna come down to the final set between these yeah. two. It all comes down to Baco versus Abso. And I think that has to feel really good for Quinnipiac. Marist's Abso has been one of their worst performers, if I remember correctly. I think he's typically... He's a good player, but he's definitely not the carry for the team. Whereas Baco is the big player that I've seen from Quinnipiac University. So I think the Quinnipiac lineup right now is incredibly happy with Billy Shilly's performance, and they are sitting tight with all of their faith in Baco. Yeah, and I mean, we hype up Baco because he has been put as an anchor for this team so many times. He's been tasked with, you know, clutching out these game five sets. And for Quinnipiac, he has done it over and over and over again. He is no stranger to these scenarios. But credit where credit's due, Billy Shilly with two fantastic, fantastic games. I mean, not only the zero yeah. to death, but the fact that he had all of those reads. They were, he was just, you would think in this type of matchup, Pac-Man would kind of, you know, start to smother Pichu a little bit. Not mm -hmm. only is Pichu damaging himself, but, you know, he's got all these projectiles that he can throw to try and wall out this, this tiny rat. But instead, Pichu just, you know, one hit was all Billy Shilly needed to completely change the momentum of this set. Yeah, Billy Shilly, the games were just so close until they weren't, you know? Like, game one and game two were both like, you know, both players, two stocks, relatively even percents, random in a little bit higher. And then all of a sudden, Billy Shilly just finds some insane combo and just wins instantly. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. well done to Billy Shilly. And, and for random main, you know, you kind of got to be shaking your head going, you know, what did I do wrong? And so it's, it's definitely something to go back and review the VODs for. Yeah, it's for sure interesting, but we have Baco and Abso getting ready to go head to head with each other. Already here, banning out stages. We're choosing between Final Destination and uh, Town and City. And if I'm the guy playing Shulk picking the stage, I'm probably gonna take you to FD. And if I'm the guy playing against Shulk, I do not want to go to FD against Shulk. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I guess we'll see <laughs> who's picking based on that. I yeah. mean, we we know that Shulks love FD. It is yeah. it's their home stage in this Shulk game. Shulk really is fast with a giant sword that covers all of your aerial options and all of your grounded options at the same time. So if you don't have platforms to jump onto to get around it, he's just going to oppress you. Yeah. It's, it's very pivotal. I am blanking on who Abso plays. I know Marist has a snake, but that might have been Zucchini, so I uh, I, I don't, don't remember. remember. It's either Snake or Robin, I think. Yeah. I feel uh, like they, Marist has a Robin, and we haven't seen a Robin from their lineup yet. Yeah, and we've seen... You've seen Baco play against other Robins and have mm -hmm. some success as well, it so... Was good, it, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is, you know, we, we're hyping up Baco a lot, but he has <laughs> delivered 
on so many yeah. occasions for Quinnipiac <laughs> that it, he is it, it, it's, he's worth the hype. <laughs> he is for sure worth the hype. Baco is character I have a lot, or player I have a lot of experience playing against, and uh, he definitely does not hold back. He goes in the whole time. He plays Shulk very aggressively. He always wants to be the one setting the tempo and setting the pace. And against a slower character that I'm pretty sure Abso plays, uh, it's going to be very, very good to be constantly applying that pressure. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see, you know, if we do end up at FD, as you said, this is like Shulk's home field because, you know, he's able to catch just so many landings and oppress you. Uh, one thing we saw from, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the other Shulk that we saw earlier in the stream. Knight, 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 Knight. Knight. Knight was very good at, you know, uh, closing out stocks by going off stage, going for edge guards. And it feels like Baco doesn't do that as much. He is much more about stage control and owning neutral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. He just loves to make you walk into his forward airs and his neutral airs. That's what he wants, and it's it works really well when you're playing Shulk. We are going to be going to Town and City. That is the pick. It, I was right. It was the guy who's not playing Shulk who picked <laughs> Town and City. Uh, really, really crazy. And it's Pokemon Trainer with the hashtag free melee. Yo, hashtag free melee, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's going well, to be Abso on the Pokemon Trainer, I misremembered, you misremembered, that's where we're at. But, right. we're getting into it, last game of the night for us on this stream. Yeah, and uh, this is going to be interesting because, if I remember right, this is the Pokemon Trainer that really, uh, their use of Squirtle was underused, mm -hmm. so I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, if they've improved, yeah. you know, how, how much damage they can actually rack up with Squirtle. Especially in this matchup, Squirtle is so, so important. He's probably your only character that can really match Shulk's mobility and get in between these sword hits and really pressure him. So you need to get that early percent with the Squirtle, but so far, it does not look like Abso is able to make it work as he's down the early deficit and forced onto Ivysaur, who's gonna try and play the disjoint game with Shulk, but Shulk just wins. He has the bigger sword. Good job getting back to Sage, and immediately, uh, excuse me, immediately you see Baco switch to Shield Art because he knows he's put in disadvantage. He doesn't want to eat too much percent. Just throw that art on, and you'll, you know, tank a little bit of it. Yeah, soften the blow. Great backer, almost kills, and the drop zone fair. This is this is Baco gameplay. The fairs off stage are what every Shulk loves to loves to fish for. Ooh, I feel like Abso wanted a back air. Good job getting back to stage. Gives up the uh, ledge trap capability there, but if he can own the stage against Baco, this Charizard can go to work. Mm -hmm. And the jump Monado is so, so scary. The 165 on this Charizard, it's hard to kill, but it's going to happen soon. The up he takes it and he clips back onto the ledge. Very, very good from Baco. And now 102 means he's in threat of death so he goes into shield but he's not under that much threat and now here we see buster when you're already in kill percent and you want to rack up percent onto your opponent's next stock buster is exactly what you want to pull out already 53 onto this charizard and i want to note that he did the simple combo Ooh, good up b to clean up that first stock but he did a simple combo of down throw to forward tilt and it did 40. That's yeah. how much damage Buster does. Buster is absolutely insane. And now a 70% lead gives Baco so much freedom to really just keep Abso at the edge. We, I feel like we've seen Baco die, but the entire game has just been Abso at the ledge getting ledge trapped. Yeah, and his ability to find a way out of the corner. Ooh, yeah. Caught him. Oh, but the... Ooh, and Backslash gonna get that extra little hit, and the back air gonna do it. Yeah, so one of the things about uh, Abso's use here, of, he hasn't really used Squirtle, but it's mostly because of the percent that he's at, and he's been able to string together a couple hits. Oh my goodness, the frame trap. Yeah, that was so, so good by Abso, but now the Buster is going to rack on so, so much percent onto Abso, no response 
from this Charizard either means it's going to be a huge percent lead for Bako on this last stock. That's what Charizard uses in Automa. Oh, my, God, oh no my goodness. That's crazy. Hulk just poses on you afterwards for it. That's a little yeah. salt on the wound by Bako, but I... I was gonna mention how Abso had an odd use of uh, Charizard's flamethrower, his neutral B. He tried to use it to try and catch out Shulk's uh, aerial mobility, you know, things like the up B. But this is Bako, you know, just controlling the stage. And then every time recovering hot, yeah, right mm -hmm. there you see Bako With dips low. Perfect and Perfect spacing. Yeah, it, it's, you would think that the fact that you can angle that down mm -hmm. to it, you would think that it would at least like clash or something but no instead he's able to scoop underneath it and like you said i think the thing that bako does really well is the sharking you know just mm -hmm. making sure that really abso had nowhere to land absolutely and like even that back air like he's just so good at catching your movement out while you're trying to get around and when you're playing Shulk, you have such strong moves that if you get your movement caught, it's typically going to be the end for you. Yeah. And I would have, I say that I would have liked to see more Squirtle, but the thing is, yeah, here, look at the frame trap. That's so Reading good. that air dodge, it's so clean because he knows Bako's out of options. It's air dodge or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And so he just eats that, uh, that up smash. Great stuff to him. That counter was actually so smart, too, because he knows that Abso has to find a way back into the game. He has to find some sort of hit to get a combo started. And so he gets greedy and goes for that down air, and, and Bako just knows it, throws out that counter, and uh, secures game one. Yeah. Really, really well played for him. And now it's match point on the table for Bako here. All he needs to do is win one more game against Abso, and he'll be feeling great. But I think that game felt a little bit too close for Bako's taste. Abso was definitely running it back a bit at the end. It was only a one-stock victory, and there was plenty of chance for Abso to make it happen. And especially now that we're going to a counter pick in Abso's favor, we could really have a close set on our hands. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me, but uh, the key here is the adjustments, right? And you said it, really, too. In, in Game 1, it felt like Abso was just backed into the corner the whole time. You have to wonder, how is Abso really going to gain stage control? And how is he going to, you know, how is he going to utilize it once he gets it? Because if he doesn't get stage control, it's going to be just a repeat of Game 1. I think we're probably going to see, yeah, Pokemon Stadium 2 as the pick. He wants a big stage where it takes longer for Shulk to run across. Of course, he can pull out that speed in auto, but that's only there every so often. And now, the bigger the stage, the smaller the sword is relative, right? So you have a lot more room to work with, and it's a lot harder for Shulk to absolutely suffocate you at the ledge. On top of that, you have time to uh, plan out your movement a bit more with Pokemon Trainer. You can switch to Pokemon if he's on the opposite side of the stage. Mm -hmm. You have Ivysaur's uh, one real ranged ability that's pressing. You have Charizard Neutral B, but it's not that great of a projectile. It really didn't work in game one. So, oh, well, it doesn't even matter if Bako is just going to rush in right off go. <laughs> yeah, he... Show players love opening with just speed immediately getting straight into the opponent's face, and it usually ends up working out pretty well. Yeah, already 34% built up, and the immediate switch, and now, how does Abso find a way down? Gets away, that backslash caught him earlier for some percent, but not going to find the hit there. And not quite going to get it, but already 75% on Abso. 56, though, answered on Tobacco as well, as the percent stay relatively even, no punish on that cross-up Nair either. And an early Smash Monado. I think this is a jumping the gun a little bit. Bako's not going to find any value out of it. Yeah, maybe jumping the gun a little. It, he is at a kill percent, 90 especially. That's that's super dangerous. Oh, that forward smash got... Well, Bako, I think, or Bako getting a little greedy, Great but the quick, really yeah, cool. 
Yeah, that was huge because that would have sent him into disadvantage and nearly catching the tether. This is very tense. You know what hasn't worked once for Baco so far this set? Is the drop zone fair. All of his kills have come from something else, and I'm pretty sure Baco is feeling pretty uncomfortable about it too. Because that is the Shulk bread and butter option. That's what they love going for. And when it doesn't work, it feels really bad. That's completely on damage. Yeah, and the dash attack, not going to do it either. He's going to shield. Shield actually makes Shulk one of the heaviest characters it in the does. game, I believe. Mm -hmm. Makes him incredibly heavy. I think it's like Bowser and then Shield Shulk. That back throw not going to do it. Once yet, again, the Smash Monado not getting value, but Baco already so far ahead. This game is really slipping away from Abso. Remember, Abso needs to win here if Maris wants to win. He is their Look last the last percent. Look at the it's percent so he gets. Yeah, and now not Smash Monado not even needed. Back. This Charizard is just going to be inside of kill percent the forward tilt takes it. And Baco at 160 on his first stock still in shield means it's going to be hard to close out as well. And we talked back about... The Ooh, yeah, good stuff there. Oh my god, 46, and he's only got together... Oh no. Oh no. Don't let it happen over. to you, Abso. No Don't let it happen to you. He's getting greedy too. He knows. Oh, he knows. It's over. Man, a three stop for Baco. After game one, where it looked so close, I really thought Abso could pull it back. He could make it happen, but he can't. Abso plays it, or Baco plays it so clean in game two, and he secures the victory for Quinnipiac. The final score. 18 to 12 and Quinnipiac takes another win for themselves when it really counts. Yeah, and that's huge too because now depending on how St. Peter's did uh, on stream 2 of uh, EGF SSBU mm -hmm. if S or if St. Peter's lost that match, Quinnipiac takes the number 2 seed in uh, the MAC conference. So this was a huge win for well. Quinnipiac. Bad news for Quinnipiac. St. Peter's won 28 to 0. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Well, either way, they <laughs> wrap up the third seed. Yeah. So, I mean, really great for uh, for them. Yeah, I, Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac definitely deserves it. Their lineup is strong. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and Baco played great. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the scenario that we were we've always talked about. You know, Baco is constantly the anchor for this team, and when he's tas tasked with Clutching out a set, he finds ways to just show up and in such a massive fashion too. This is now Absolutely. multiple times that it feels like the the set's going to be close, and then you know on a, on a pivotal game he just three stocks. That's multiple times he's done that now. Yeah, it's it happens way too often. He can't keep getting away with it. You know? He can't but, uh, keep getting away. With it. <laughs> that is going to be it. For us tonight, we were scheduled to run Hawaii versus William and Mary, but due to time issues, we are running that on our second stream right now. EGF SSBU, go check it out if you want to see more action. As for us, we are going to be signing off. I have been Matthew Toxic Gerbil Merrick. If you've enjoyed being here with me, you can find me on Twitter at Toxic underscore Gerbil. And if uh, you uh, like my you know, commentary, follow me at Soyce and J Sport down below. We're also being that's, produced that's by <laughs> House of 3000. You can find him on Twitter at House of 3000. He's been doing all the music, all the transitions. He's been the one bringing you the replays. So I would strongly suggest checking him out as well. And as always, if you enjoy the content, if you want to support us at EGF, hit that follow button in Twitch. Make sure you don't miss any of these matches. We've got playoffs coming in the future. This was the last match of the regular season, but we have the whole postseason to go through. So make sure you keep yourself updated on that and find out who wins and who loses when it all really matters. And we are going to be signing off. So goodbye, everybody, and good night. <laughs>